Hey, this is the 80 Slasher Librarian, just letting you guys know if you enjoy the content here on the channel and want to support the channel, click on the Patreon link in the description below. As I'm not allowed to monetize the channel here on YouTube, I depend on you guys to keep this channel going and growing by becoming patrons of the channel and sponsoring at the Patreon page. There's great rewards for doing so in tiers as low as 2 to $5 per month. Hey everybody, it's CJ Graham, Jason, Friday the 13th, Part 6, Hell Cop and Highway to Hell. Hey, I just want to make sure you guys know you're listening to the 80s slasher librarian. Hi, this is Kane Hodder. Better known as Jason from Friday the 13th, Victor Crowley from Hatchet. I've also played BTK, Ed Gein. Let's just say I've murdered a lot of people. In fact, I've murdered more people on film than any actor in history. So just keep that in mind. You are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. Keep listening, or I'll kill you. Just cause you're playing cool Don't think you got this fool tonight Friday the 13th, Part 4, The Final Chapter, a fan novelization by Landon Turner, based on the screenplay by Barney Cohen. Prologue. It was 1984 in the town of Crystal Lake, New Jersey, a small, bucolic New England-style town just on the edge of Pinehurst County. Crystal Lake was the sort of town where you could walk alone down in the streets in the late hours of the night and not be afraid. The sort of town where you could leave your doors unlocked and never fear the sort of things that happened in the bigger cities. The sort of town where you could turn on the 10 o'clock news and cringe at all the terrifying stories and then sigh with relief as you realize that what you were hearing about had happened over a thousand miles away. It was just that sort of small, sleepy town that everyone dreamed about. Sure, you had the few ambitious folks who had their hearts set on the toils of a big city like Manhattan or Chicago, but deep down in their hearts, some of them would long to eventually settle down in a picturesque frame house on a quiet, tree-lined residential street somewhere in a North American suburb. Crystal Lake was that sort of town. Until the summer of 1984 came. What happened that summer rocked the small town and everyone living in it. Nobody wanted to believe it. They wanted to put it aside and erase it from the town's history. They wanted to pretend that it never even happened. Unfortunately, it wasn't the first time that tragedy befell that small town. The horror started in 1957 at a local summer camp for kids, Camp Crystal Lake. Camp Crystal Lake was an idyllic summer getaway for parents to get their kids out of their hair for cheap. It was owned by the Christie family and on a shoestring budget and staff. All you had to do was hire a few teenagers to arrive early, get the place in shape, and have a relaxing weekend in the woods for a few bucks an hour. Picture a few cozy log cabins on the shore of a serene lake surrounded by pine trees in the northeastern wilderness, a whitewashed dock sticking out into the water beside a row of canoes. It was just off the highway down a winding dirt road on the outskirts of town. The peace of solitude and freedom from their youngsters attracted the adults. The mischievous summer hijinks attracted the teenage counselors, and the thrilling outdoor experience attracted mostly inner-city children. The serenity of the campgrounds would be shattered that summer when one of the campers drowned in the lake. The Voorhees boy, Jason Voorhees. It was a name that the residents of Crystal Lake had come to know. Some were afraid to utter it out loud. Jason was an odd child, very quiet, and he never played with the other children. Depending on who you talked to in town, he had been mentally impaired and somewhat deformed from a birth defect. The drowning almost got Camp Crystal Lake shut down. No one cared enough about the Voorhees boy to go to such drastic measures. But, actually, someone did. 
Someone cared about Jason a little too much. That someone was his own mother, Pamela Voorhees, who worked as a cook at the camp. Some said that she went mad. Others said that she was just a mother doing what she thought was best for her son. Some locals said she had watched her son screaming for help from the mess hall, his tiny body thrashing around in the murky water of the lake helplessly, and no one had even tried to help him. None of the counselors had heard his cries, and the counselors who were supposed to have been watching Jason had been off fooling around. It was business as usual the rest of the summer, and the usual variation of the story was that every single day, Pamela thought about her son's lifeless corpse, rotting away at the bottom of that lake. The more she made meals for all the little children, the more she began to miss Jason. In some variations of the legend from the locals in town, Pamela's mind had started to lose its grips with reality. She would hear Jason calling out to her from the lake, and his puny, helpless voice would reach her through the wind, and she'd stand at the edge of Crystal Lake and call back out to him. His voice was telling her to seek vengeance for him, to kill them all. She hadn't wanted to listen at first, but the more that she heard her son's helpless cries, the more she began to succumb to his wishes. So when Camp Crystal Lake went into business the next summer, so did Pamela. She waited for the darkest night to come, the darkest, quietest night. On Friday the 13th, her son's birthday, and she took a knife from the kitchen, and she watched two camp counselors fondling each other on the second floor of an old barn. The same two counselors who should have been watching Jason when he drowned. With each kiss that they gave each other, and each caress, and each passionate moan, Pamela grew hotter with rage. She had felt it well up inside of her until it was unbearable, and finally she couldn't handle it anymore. She hacked away at their bodies until their screams stopped, and as soon as their agonizing cries ceased, so did the rage inside of her a temporary alleviation to the madness and the suffering she had been through ever since her sweet Jason was left to die. Pamela disappeared into the night, leaving a grisly scene for the rest of the camp to discover. After the murders of the two camp counselors in the summer of 58, the camp was officially shut down, and the locals deemed the place Camp Blood. The campgrounds were opened again in the early 60s, but someone burned down the cabins and later poisoned the lake. Mrs. Voorhees wouldn't stop until it was closed down for good. She almost got her wish because for the next 20 or so years, the camp lay dormant, rotting away until it was only a shell of what it once was. A man by the name of Steve Christie made the fatal mistake of opening the camp again in the summer of 79. He signed a few papers, hired a few counselors, and after some negotiating and patience and a little luck, the campgrounds that had once belonged to his father belonged to him. It had only been open a month. The kids were arriving in two short weeks. Disaster would strike again at Camp Crystal Lake. The group of counselors that Steve had hired for the summer were brutally slaughtered in one night. Pamela also left her calling card. It was Friday the 13th. Old Man Christie didn't survive her bloody rampage either. The officials found him hanging upside down from a tree, like an animal in a slaughterhouse, the blade of a hunting knife driven through his heart. Only one of his counselors survived that night. 19-year-old Alice Hardy fought Pamela to the death, finally gaining the upper hand and decapitating her with her own machete. Alice was severely traumatized, and who could blame her? She had seen all of her new friends butchered in one night, and had seen Pamela Voorhees coming at her with a machete, swinging at her, calling out her son's name. Alice saw something else that night, though, something in the water. She swore that she saw him in the water, Jason Voorhees. She had screamed hysterically at the police officers when they arrived, tried to make them listen, tried to make them understand, but their tiny minds couldn't wrap around the idea that Jason Voorhees was alive. They couldn't comprehend that a boy who drowned 20 years prior could actually be alive. But Alice swore she had saw him. She saw him rise up from the murky depths of the lake and grab her his skin so cold and grimy, his eyes bugging from his skull, the putrid smell of decaying flesh pervading her nostrils. Nobody believed her, and when a team of divers scoured the lake, they didn't find any sign of a boy. After all, it was absurd. Jason Voorhees was dead. He had drowned 20 years ago. There was no way he could have been alive. If Jason were alive, he would have been full-grown. It seemed to the police that there really was no Jason, and the Crystal Lake slangs had come to an end. It wasn't until a few months later that the police force in Crystal Lake would realize how wrong they were. <coughs> Alice.
Alice went missing that fall, the fall after that awful summer at Camp Blood, as it came to be called. They never found her body. All they found was an empty one-bedroom apartment. Blood was all over the walls, the floor, and the bedsheets, everywhere. Almost like some kind of a sign, a warning, a preview of years to come. Could it have been Jason, back from the dead, to finish what he started? The locals seemed to think so. Everyone in town knew that it was Jason. They said that Jason never truly drowned in that lake. He survived and sought shelter in the wilderness, feeding off of the land, they would say. They say that he became some sort of monster, some sort of demented creature that could barely be thought of as human. The locals also said that Jason saw his mother beheaded that night. He saw his mother being murdered. True, it was in self-defense, but Jason didn't know. His mind had already become unhinged. All he had now in his mind was an unstoppable lust to annihilate the girl who killed his mother. The locals say Jason killed Alice. They say that he waited a few months, growing stronger, the rage pent up inside of him ready to burst, waiting patiently until the time was right. And he tracked Alice down to the tiny apartment that she had rented in Crystal Lake. And he murdered her. What he did with the body also varied with whoever you talked to in town. Some say he brought her back to the old abandoned Camp Crystal Lake and hid her inside one of the cabins. Some say that he ate her remains like a wild animal. Whatever way the story ended, the locals all believed in the same legend. The terrifying legend of Jason Voorhees, avenging his mother's death, patrolling Camp Crystal Lake, ready to slaughter any helpless victim who crossed his path. Was he still out there? Was there any truth to the legend? Could Jason really be alive? Could he have survived his drowning back in 57? And could he have witnessed his own mother's death 20 years later? Five years had passed since Alice went missing. No more bodies, no more bloodshed. The town of Crystal Lake had returned to its peaceful self. The terror and the paranoia that plagued the town for 20 years was over. Mrs. Voorhees was dead. No more murders. But there were still very important questions to be answered. Was Jason alive? Did he survive his drowning? Was the legend real? One girl knew the answer to that question. Nineteen-year-old Chris Higgins knew all too well that the legend of Jason was too horrifyingly real. Jason was alive. He had gone on a two-day killing spree across Crystal Lake, first at a local counselor training center on the shore of the same lake he had allegedly died in. His next stop had been Higgins Haven, where Chris and her friends mistakenly decided to spend their summer vacation. Chris had watched the property on Crystal Lake, where she had spent the majority of her childhood, turned into the scene of a massacre. Her friends had also all been savagely murdered. Debbie, a knife through her throat, and Rick, his head crushed by the monster's bare hands, and his body thrown through the living room window at her, covered in blood. Now she was staring headlong at the masked killer as he cornered her in her family's barn. She scrabbled backwards across the hay-covered floor, shaking her head, screaming hysterically and hyperventilating. His demented eyes bored into hers through the eye holes of the hockey mask he had taken from the body of one of her slaughtered friends. She saw the gleaming machete, streaked with crimson, streaked with her friend's blood in his hand. No! She shrieked, grasping around her for a weapon, searching for an escape. But she was cornered and helpless. Her parents' barn had now become a cage, trapping her with a mad killer. He advanced towards Chris, his imposing figure towering over her, dried blood caked around the wound where she had stabbed him earlier that night. She had tried stabbing him, hitting him, even hanging him from the barn loft, but nothing could stop this killing machine. She was going to die in her family's barn for the police to find along with all of her friends, poor Andy and Debbie. Dear God, he had killed them all, and now he was going to kill her. When it seemed that all hope was lost, a figure suddenly lunged out of one of the stalls, throwing his shoulder into the crazed killer's midsection. Jason staggered backwards, hardly faced by the blow. It was a young black man, dazed and bloody from an oozing gash on his forehead. He wasn't even anyone that Chris even recognized, just another one of his victims that Jason had neglected to finish off. The young man threw himself at Jason again, but Jason took him down with one swing of his machete, and the man's arm was lopped off at the elbow. 
Blood spurted from the bloody stump as Chris screamed in sheer horror. The man let out an agonizing scream, incredulous at the blood spewing from the stump where his arm had been. Jason took another swing with his machete, slashing the young man across his midsection and bringing him down to the ground. Thwack! 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 Jason hacked at him mercilessly with the machete until his pain groans finally ceased. And just as he turned around to finish Chris off, an axe was swung at his forehead. He let out an animalistic growl of agony as the steel blade cut through the hard plastic of the hockey mask and sliced into his skull. Chris released her grip on the axe handle, shocked at what she had done. She was relieved, however, that he was soon going to die. But somehow she was astounded that she had actually been the one to kill him. But her relief was short-lived because he wasn't dead. Jason came at her again, his arms outstretched, his gnarled, bony fingers grabbing at her in a blind, desperate attempt to end her life as he felt his body going numb. No! No! Chris shrieked, stumbling backwards into the clutter at the back of the barn. He couldn't be alive. He just couldn't be alive. There was no way in hell that this monster could be alive after an axe was sent hurtling into his skull, could he? Chris's hyperventilating slowly began to slow down as Jason finally staggered and collapsed onto the floor of the barn like a fallen tree. Chris Higgins' night of terror was over. But the Crystal Lake Massacre had just begun. <laughs> Chapter 1. Murders in the Morgue What the hell is going on? thought 48-year-old Tracy Jarvis as she quietly crept down the staircase into the living room. She glanced behind her, making sure that the ruckus hadn't stirred her two kids sound asleep in their beds. The whirring of helicopter blades had jolted her awake, and glancing out her bedroom window, she had seen red and blue flashing lights flying down the country road past her cabin on Crystal Lake. Something big had to be going on. Nothing like this typically happened in Crystal Lake. The only other time that something like this had happened that Mrs. Jarvis could remember was five years ago when that Voorhees woman hacked up all those kids at the campgrounds. She remembered that like it was yesterday. It had been all over the news. The town of Crystal Lake, which had always been a quiet and safe community, was crawling with reporters for months and months afterwards. Every time she drove into town to go to the grocery store, there were people huddled in groups or of twos or threes at the checkout line, whispering excitedly about the murders, all talking about Camp Blood and how it was all the fault of the family who reopened the death trap in the first place. When she had lived in the city, she had never seen anything like that. Everyone that lived in the city mostly kept to their own. Mrs. Jarvis almost liked it better that way. Not that she didn't admire the way that everyone in Crystal Lake seemed to know each other and the quaint and quirky atmosphere. It was just the fact that she felt a little left out. When she first got here, she never got a warm welcome and the locals seemed to be able to detect the urban aura that she had around her because all she got were dirty looks and groups of people whispering about her. At least in the city, it wasn't just her that was left out. Everyone kept to their own, never singling out any other person. Everyone minded their own business. She wondered why she even decided to move out to the country. Then she remembered why. There was a shooting right down the street from the Jarvis apartment, and with that, Mrs. Jarvis took her two kids and left. There was no way she was keeping her kids around that sort of thing. They could grow up traumatized, start getting bad grades in school, get into drugs and other awful things that the kids got into nowadays. The proverbial straw that broke the camel's back was when she found out her husband was in love with someone else, with his young, sexy co-worker. They had been married for almost 20 years. They had two kids together. How could he just throw it away like that? 20 years of marriage. Trisha's first steps. Tommy's first words. All of it evidently meant nothing. What really bothered her was that she hadn't noticed the signs. The distant look in his eye. The weak smiling. The forced conversations. Her woman's intuition had failed her. Or maybe she just wasn't listening. She felt like it was something she had done, but then again, feelings sometimes just go away. And you can't control how you feel towards someone. How could she blame him? They were both getting middle-aged and were going through their own personal crises, while at the same time raising two teenagers. Falling out of love happens. People leave. People can start to feel differently about things. Yes, she was hurt, but she knew what she had to do. The only thing she could do was leave. 
Besides, the marriage wasn't doing so well before he set her down at the kitchen table and slapped the divorce papers down in front of her. They all knew it. Trish and Tommy both knew it. They all knew that they were just staying together for the sake of the kids. It was all they could do. She worried about her children enough as it was, with growing up in the city and being exposed to God knows what, but it would be even harder on them without a father. So she stayed with him as long as she could. But eventually, things just get too hard to manage, and so you have to leave. But why did she have to pick a hick town like Crystal Lake? And now, all these murders? She left the city to get away from that sort of thing, and only a few months after they moved in, the Voorhees woman went insane and killed a bunch of kids at a campground just a few miles up the dirt road from where they were nestled on the shore of the lake. And now this? God, what was next? She shot another nervous glance out the big picture window, blew a strand of wispy blonde hair out of her face, and then crossed the living room to the television set and turned it on. A male newscaster was seated at his desk, staring solemnly into the camera, reading off of a teleprompter. The Crystal Lake Massacre is indeed not entirely over, as authorities have recently found more mutilated bodies left behind by the masked maniac who has left a trail of corpses all over the 20-acre campground and the surrounding area. A lone survivor, a young girl whose name has not yet been released, managed to put a stop to the murderer's crime spree and the man who has terrorized this small community for the last two days is now believed to be dead. My God, Mrs. Jarvis thought to herself. An image of a large two-story log cabin in the middle of an isolated clearing was superimposed onto the screen, where gurneys piled high with blood-soaked corpses were being wheeled down the front steps. Police cars and ambulances were scattered across the front yard of the house. The camera panned over to a large red barn where another body was being wheeled out into the back of an ambulance. A police helicopter hovered over the scene, shining a giant spotlight around the perimeter of the property, searching for more bodies. Jesus, she muttered to herself, more murders and another young girl left traumatized. She couldn't imagine what the poor thing had been through. To see all of her friends getting killed and then to watch helplessly as her life turns into a nightmare before her eyes. My God, who was it this time? Who did this to her? Pamela Voorhees? But the Voorhees woman was dead, wasn't she? She had to be. Mrs. Jarvis had heard something about her head being lopped off. She grimaced, thinking about it. No, this was someone else. The newscaster had described a man. Another maniac, just like the Voorhees woman. Jesus! There has to be something in the water here, she thought. She felt a chill run up her arm and she moved to the front door to make sure it was locked. She didn't exactly know why she was insisting on the door being locked. The newscaster said that the guy was dead, after all. But something was bothering her. A pang of dread hit her in the gut, and she instinctively checked anyway. She turned her attention back to the television, where paramedics were loading another body into the back of an ambulance. The newscaster appeared on screen again. Sources have informed us that the man responsible for the killings is being taken to the Wessex County Medical Center, where further examination is to be made. Wessex County was only the neighboring county. It wasn't very far from the lake. Mrs. Jarvis stared grimly out into the night. She couldn't help but feel paranoid with all the murders happening. She felt another shiver up her spine as she tried to block the ghastly images from her mind. Crystal Lake was going to become the murder capital of the United States pretty soon, Mrs. Jarvis thought, sitting on the sofa. She jerked her head towards the door. Was that a noise? Was it? No, no, it had to be the wind or something. Mrs. Jarvis silently scolded herself. She was just scaring herself silly. After all, it was foolish to sit at home and be afraid of a dead man. It was foolish, right? He was dead. The maniac was dead. It was a dark and wet night, still soaked from the drizzling rain and the thunderstorm that had been brewing on and off for the last two hours. Storm clouds rolled across the night sky, not managing to obscure the silvery outline of the full moon. It had been a rainy summer, even for the northeast. The trees swayed gently in the night breeze. It was all peaceful and quiet, save for the circling police helicopters bright searchlights and about a dozen police cars and ambulances scattered around an isolated farmhouse and redwood barn nestled in a clearing by the lake. 
The two bright headlight beams and flashing sirens cut through the darkness, illuminating a wooden sign that read Higgins Haven in scrawled letters. Wessex County Medical Center was emblazoned on the side of the medical transport vehicle that was driving tediously down the uneven, partially flooded dirt road. The trees cleared, and near a small stand of trees, the two-story farmhouse stood on the shore of the lake, the red and white lights shimmering on the glassy, smooth surface. The headlights of the ambulance hit the police officer directing traffic in the face, and he waved his arms in the air, signaling for the caravan to stop. The passenger, a tired-looking male paramedic in his forties, rolled down his window. The traffic cop approached, slossing through a mud puddle and squinting through the sprinkling rain. "'What do you need and where do you need it?' the male medic asked. The cop pointed towards the open barn doors. "'We got a body over there in the barn. It's been a busy night. We got ten bodies. You got the last one,' the cop said. It was clear in the tone of his voice that he had seen more than enough carnage for the night and was thankful to have been given the mundane task of directing traffic. Stress was written all over his face. "'What's wrong with him?' the medic asked. "'He's dead,' the cop said grimly. "'Yeah, they're all dead.' He looked like he had seen a ghost. The paramedic turned to the driver of the ambulance, a young, slim black woman in her late twenties. "'Some emergency, they're all dead,' he said. She made a wry face and drove through the wooden gate into the property veering the ambulance sharply towards the front of the barn and parking. The two medics stepped out onto the muddy ground and ran through the rain towards the back doors of the ambulance. They both heaved the heavy doors open and lifted a gurney out of the back compartment and began rolling it inside the barn. The young black medic scrunched up her nose in disgust as the smell of fresh hay and manure mingled with the stench of death. She stopped short and stared down in disbelief at the enormous man sprawled across the barn floor an axe protruding from his skull. A hockey mask was pulled over his face. The blade of the axe had broken through the thin plastic and embedded itself in his forehead. The tall, portly mustache police chief, his uniform obscured by the thick sheen of a rain poncho, was hovering over the body. Next to him, a forensic technician was snapping photos with his camera, and another technician was dusting for fingerprints. "'Is this the guy who's been leaving the wet stuff?' the male medic asked. Yep, he got seven kids and three bikers, but this time they got him, the police chief said, staring down grimly at the axe firmly lodged in the masked man's cranium. The female medic watched as the body of a young biker chick clad in leather was being rolled out of the barn on a gurney, her dead eyes gazing up at the ceiling, five bloody puncture wounds forming a second mouth across her throat. The medic shivered down to her soul. She had never seen anything like this in her entire life. My God, she thought, this was him? She stared down at the body of the masked man in a mix of horrified fascination and bewilderment. His skin was deformed and graying, his nails black and broken, his hands covered in blood. The olive green tattered work suit and slacks he was wearing were also caked with dried blood. He really killed them all, she thought to herself. Those poor kids. The thought of what they had experienced in their last hours was getting to her. The man didn't even look human. She silently prayed to herself that she wouldn't have to see what was underneath that mask. She couldn't believe people actually went out and put on masks and just started killing innocent people. But it was right before her eyes. She had already seen what he had done at the counselor training center on the opposite side of the lake. A kid in a wheelchair with a machete driven through his skull. Two kids impelled on a spear. The sick shit you see in those cheap slasher flicks. He must have been absolutely insane. She couldn't even begin to process it. She was completely tuning out the inane dialogue between the police chief and the ambulance driver. She couldn't tear her eyes away from him. All right, let's belt him, said the male medic, snapping his female companion out of her trance. One of the crime scene investigators reached down with gloved hands and yanked the axe free from the man's skull with a sickening pop. The female medic struggled to stifle her own grimacing. She was already being leered at, by all those homicide detectives, and she didn't want them chortling to themselves about her being a rookie. The investigator slid the blood-stained axe down into a clear evidence baggie and sealed it. It took four men to heave Jason Voorhees' lifeless body onto the stretcher. The female medic then placed the sheet over him hurriedly, as if she were ripping off a band-aid, and stepped away as the male medic strapped him in. 
The woman took one side of the metal stretcher and started to walk with her partner out of the barn. As they began to roll him out of the barn, Jason's grimy, blood-caked hand slipped out from underneath the sheets, and his fingertips brushed the female medic's thigh. She leapt out of her skin, letting out a startled yelp. Several of the men laughed. "'What's the matter with you?' the male medic asked, grinning from ear to ear. "'He's dead!' Christ, this place is a pile of shit, said 38-year-old Axel Burns, watching a light fixture flicker and buzz out. It was no secret that the Wessex County Medical Center morgue wasn't the best-kept facility. The hallways were narrow and dimly lit. The wallpaper was peeling. Most of the bulbs in the overhead ceiling lights had blown years ago. There had been some seedy going-ons with upper-level management at the hospital, and Axel got to hear the juicy bits from one of his security guard buddies. It turned out that one of the corporate representatives was dealing coke, and then some more shit happened, and long story short, nobody gave a fuck about the morgue. It was all he could do to alleviate his boredom, but gossip about just what juicy happenings were going on at this place of employment. They were always understaffed. Axel had to work nights and clean up the leftovers from the day shift. Bodies were constantly getting switched, lost, and there were constant complaints against Axel for what they said was unprofessionalism. He didn't know that you had to be professional to work in a dump like this. He was a morgue attendant, not a doctor. He wasn't even the one that helped with autopsies. He just made sure bodies came in and out and got where they needed to go. He ran his thumb along the wall and grimaced as he stared at the filth that came off onto his rubber glove. I've worked in this shithole for way too long, he thought to himself. Being a morgue attendant sounded sort of exciting when he had read about it in the classifieds about five years ago. Sounded easy, too. He tried taking a job working with people, but he quickly discovered he didn't have the patience. So why not take a job where the only people you'd really have to work with are dead as a doornail? And it was a fairly easy job, even if he did work the night shift. The first few weeks it had been a piece of cake. But five long years of taking corpses into the cold room, sticking them in the freezer like a slab of meat, signing paperwork after paperwork, and doing coffee runs wasn't what Axel had imagined. He bit into his tomato and mayo sandwich, licked his fingers, and reached over to turn on the tiny television set that he had set up to stimulate himself for the mind-numbing lull of the night shift. He sat down on the edge of a folded gurney and took another bite. He hit the channel button on the remote, and a group of women in tight black leotards doing aerobics flashed onto the screen. Some sort of late-night raunchy workout tape. Alex grinned. The girl in the middle had a huge rack, and Axel felt himself getting a stiffy. "'Hi, girls,' he said to himself, staring lewdly at the screen. "'Could you blame a guy? Nothing to do around this dump but get your rocks off,' he thought." Just as he caught a glimpse down the front of the blonde chick's leotard, he heard the doors leading to the morgue bang open. He groaned in annoyance. Great, another body. Another one of those kids that got killed up at Crystal Lake, he thought. Axel walked out into the dimly lit hallway. The body was coming towards him, a huge mass on a gurney covered with a white sheet that was being pushed by a tough-looking medic and a young black woman, her naturally frizzy hair wet from the rain with a grim expression. Axel waited as they rolled the stretcher towards him and handed him a clipboard. Axel laid his sandwich down on the body and took the clipboard, hastily and illegibly scribbling his signature at the bottom of the page. The male medic gave him a frown. "'This is your last?' the medic asked. "'Nah, I got one more in there,' Axel said, pointing to the coal room. "'She's a real cute girl.' "'Was,' the medic corrected him. Axel shrugged and glanced back at the cold room. Eh, she still is. The medic's jaw tightened. The young black woman's tightly pursed lips screwed into a disapproving grimace. All you gotta do is go over there and, uh... Axel made an obscene gesture, a grin spreading across his face. The female medic let out a cry of disgust and yanked the clipboard out of Axel's hand. Nice talk, real nice talk, the male medic said, mortified. I get the top copy. Axel held his hands up in the air defensively, ripped off the first page of the clipboard and handed it to the medic, and they both made their way back down the hallway, shaking their heads. What? Axel thought. Does nobody have a sense of humor anymore? He pulled back the sheets on the stretcher and he grimaced, 
a blood-stained hockey mask stared back at him. This must be the guy who killed all those kids, he thought. Why did people keep going up to those goddamn campgrounds? Hadn't they learned by now? That place was a death trap. Five years ago, he remembered another series of murders at the old camp. He had heard the girl who survived went missing a few months later. Then again, he probably knew most of it was just an exaggerated legend spread by the locals, and Axel certainly made his contribution. After all, he got to see the injuries working in the morgue during these last murders. The guy really did a number on him. You had to be crazy to do something like that to a human being, he thought. Bodies literally found hanging from blood-stained bedsheets like sick pieces of artwork. A guy split in half down the middle like something out of a splatter film. Another girl with a spear lodged in her eye. And now, he had to be in the same room with the dead psychopath all night. Just great. Axel threw the sheet back over the body and pushed it into the cold room. <laughs> Nurse Robbie Morgan hated going down to the basement. She didn't know why exactly. Maybe it was the fact that the basement was where the morgue was. And where there's a morgue, there are dead bodies, and despite her job, she hated the thought of death. She grimaced just at the thought of dying. She imagined the pain that those poor kids at Crystal Lake went through. How awful it must be to be murdered. The realization right before it happens. The adrenaline pumping through your veins. The sheer shock and agony as the knife plunges into your body. As hands wrap around your throat. As you stare into the deranged eyes of your killer. Nothing you can say or do to stop it from happening. She shuddered. It had been a hell of a night at Wessex County Medical Center. The night shift was never this hectic. They were the only medical facility big enough to hold all of the bodies within 30 miles of Crystal Lake. They had still been recuperating from the night before when another group of kids, mostly college age, were murdered by apparently the same psycho. Nurse Morgan liked the job that she had, but sometimes it took an emotional toll on her. She had seen far too many sobbing parents tonight, too many mangled bodies being wheeled around on gurneys. It was all too much for her to take in at once. She could stomach the gore, but it was the reactions of the family members that really got to her. There was something about seeing the look of sheer despair on a parent's face at the prospect of never seeing their child again that chilled her to the bone. She just had to choose this as her profession, right? In this town, during a killing spree. Just my fucking luck, she thought. It made her almost not want to be a parent. She would constantly be worried about where their child was at every second of every day, just out of sheer fear of becoming a bereaved parent. Yeah, fucking parenting. She'd just keep using condoms and taking the pill. Besides, she was a young woman in med school. She didn't have time for kids. She didn't have much time to breathe, now that she was thinking about it. Could I really do this for the next three years, possibly more, she thought. Could she bear seeing the horrified faces of grieving mothers and fathers, and watch women faint in their family members' arms after learning their child was horribly murdered? But what can I do, she thought, throw in the towel, call it quits. She did have bills to pay. No, not now. She was already in her third semester, working to be a registered nurse, and so much money and time was already invested. But if one more thing went wrong tonight, she might just finally do it. She was at her wit's end, back and forth from her station to patients' rooms, constantly hearing code blue or code red being called over the intercom system. Then she would have to run upstairs to hold down a patient in cardiac arrest or run downstairs to meet with the doctor to take crying parents to identify their child's mangled bodies. She felt like she was going to break any second. At the end of the day, she had to remember why she had wanted to be a nurse in the first place. To help people. To be that friendly face that a grieving parent needs to see. To be the help in that kind of situation. But tonight was almost too much. She stopped to catch her breath and clear her thoughts in the stairwell. God, I need a smoke break, she thought. She probably looked like hell. No time to worry about that now. She had to go down to inventory. She collected herself for a moment and then climbed the rest of the stairs down to the morgue and walked down the narrow hallway. A single light flickered unsteadily up ahead. The rest of the hallway was shrouded in shadows. The walls creaked and the pipes in the wall groaned. She turned the corner, coming to a stop at the reception desk. Where the hell was everyone? They had bodies coming in one after the other and the morgue looked like a ghost town. She shrugged, glancing down at the clipboard. She jumped 
as two hands suddenly clamped down on her shoulders. She whirled around to face the morgue attendant, Axel, staring at her with lustful eyes. Oh, perfect, she thought. It's the other reason I hate going to the basement. I'm free, doll, Axel said. Yeah, at a bargain, and twice the price, Nurse Morgan snapped, turning her back to him. Hey, what's the matter? Axel questioned, placing his hand on the small of her back. Nurse Morgan let out a heavy sigh. I have a headache, Axel. For you, I always have a headache. I can fix that, Axel said, stroking her hair. Why don't you come in the cold room with me? I'm closing up for the night. What do you say? Axel, I'm not faking any more orgasms for you. Nurse Morgan quipped, pretending to write something down on her clipboard, hoping he would take the hint and leave her alone. You got the curse, Axel asked. If I do, you're it, Nurse Morgan said, forcing a smile. She pushed past him back down the hallway towards the staircase, forgetting what she came down there to do in the first place. Since the day she started working at Wessex County Medical Center, Axel had been giving her dirty looks and using every dim-witted, cliché pickup line in the book. What a pig, Nurse Morgan thought to herself. What happened to common courtesy? Chivalry really was dead. She had always thought that when you liked someone, you actually went up and talked to them like a civilized human being not spew out sexual innuendos and blatantly look down their blouse. She couldn't believe how outright disgusting he was. How had someone not reported his sleazy ass? How has he not been fired already? She hated him. Hated him with a passion. There was no way in hell she was going to meet him in the cold room. Nurse Morgan stepped through the double doors into the cold room and stopped short. The room was pitch black dark. The light from a tiny television set illuminated a huge mass underneath a white sheet lying on a gurney. Was that him? The guy who killed all those kids? My God, she thought. Nurse Morgan craned her neck to see what was on the TV, and she smirked. Of course, she thought wryly. It was a woman's workout video, and the women might as well have been naked in their skimpy black leotards. Nurse Morgan shook her head and glanced around the room. Where the hell was he? Axel! Axel! She called. No answer. The only sound was the soft music coming from the workout video and the humming from the freezers in the back. Axel! She turned back to the television, grimacing in disgust at the workout tape. All three women were bent over in exaggerated sexual positions, moving from side to side, their assets in full view. Unbelievable, she thought to herself. How could anyone watch this shit? It was so demeaning to women. Who was she kidding? This was Axel she was talking about. She reached down to turn the channel when two hands wrapped around her waist and she let out a shrill cry. Axel stood there, a dumb grin on his face. So glad you could come, he said, trying to kiss her on the hand. Nurse Morgan angrily pulled her hand away. God, Axel, you are the Super Bowl of self-abuse she exclaimed. I just want to watch the news. Nurse Morgan leaned down and turned the channel on the tiny television set, and a news broadcast flashed onto the screen. And now back to the tragic story of the mass slayings at Crystal Lake, the voice said. Nurse Morgan sat down on the edge of the folded gurney and stared intently at the screen. Axel plopped down next to her glumly. He looked over at her, his big brown eyes racked with guilt. He put on his best puppy dog eyes and scooted closer. Nurse Morgan glanced over at him and scoffed. And so begins another chapter of the story that most residents of Crystal Lake had prayed was over. A trail of mangled bodies has led authorities to conclude that... The announcer's voice was interrupted by a pulsing disco beat, and the ladies in the black leotards popped back onto the screen. Nurse Morgan looked at the remote in Axel's hand and frowned. As she opened her mouth to speak, she felt Axel's lips brush her neck. He nuzzled her hair, and his hand began to move up her back towards the zipper of her crisp white nurse's top. I came to watch the news, she said firmly, pushing him away. She leaned forward and switched the channel back to the news station. Authorities are still awaiting the identification of the perpetrator's body, which is currently being held at the Wessex County Medical Center morgue. Nurse Morgan glanced back nervously at the body on the gurney behind her. 
That's you they're talking about, Axel said, patting the huge mass behind him. Nurse Morgan's eyes widened, and she swatted at him. I don't believe you. Then shut my mouth, Axel said coyly, wrapping his arms around her and sliding her over to him. His lips pressed against hers, and his hand slipped inside of her uniform. Reluctantly, she kissed him back, running her hands through his hair. She finally succumbed, and she gently pushed him back onto the gurney. She straddled him, her hands sliding inside his lab coat, as his hands did the same with her nurse's top. She kissed him passionately. His hand found the zipper in the back, unzipped it, and he began fumbling with the clasp of her bra. In the midst of the hormone-induced rendezvous, they had no inkling of knowledge about the other presence in the room, a presence of stewing anger and deep hatred. They didn't see the large mass on the gurney behind them move ever so slightly, its chest rising and falling. Just as her bra was coming off in his hand, the white sheet behind them moved ever so slightly. A hand fell out from underneath the sheet. A scarred, deformed hand. The nails were blackened and filthy. It brushed Nurse Morgan's bare thigh. She shrieked and sprang to her feet, bringing Axel up with her. Jesus! Christmas! Holy Jesus! God damn it! Holy Jesus! Jumping Christmas shit! Axel cursed loudly, staring down at the unsightly hand dangling from underneath the white sheet. Nurse Morgan shrunk back into the corner, her chest heaving and her heart pounding. Her fear quickly turned into anger, and she pointed a finger at Axel. You better get that sucker in the icebox. I must be going nuts. I must... She stopped her furious diatribe when she noticed Axel's eyes directed at her unzipped blouse. She zipped it back up angrily, staring daggers at him. Good night, Axel, she said, making a beeline for the doors. Where are you going? Axel protested. I'm going crazy, she screamed back at him, and she disappeared down the hallway. I'm an idiot, Nurse Morgan scolded herself. Why did she always have to give in to him? They had fooled around a few times before, and she immediately regretted it every time. Axel Burns was nothing but a quick fix, someone you did it with once and never thought about it or talked about it ever again. She was single, so it wasn't like she was doing anything she shouldn't be, but it still felt so wrong. She was leading the bastard on. There was no way in hell she was getting in a relationship with him. Maybe a quick make-out session to break the tension at work, but that was it. Axel was one of those guys that sits at every seedy dive bar and leers at you over a glass of beer, making kissy faces and being an overall creep. The guy that gets kicked out before the night is over because he won't stop harassing the women, or because he won't go home when the lights are being turned on and everyone is being sent out. This was the last time, she told herself, the absolute last time this was happening. She couldn't do it anymore. It wasn't fair to Axel, even if he was a complete idiot. She shoved open the door to hospital inventory and leaned against the shelf, regaining her composure. What was wrong with her? Was it the stress, the murders? That had to be it. That had to be it. With the sudden late-night rush of bodies, the stress was getting to her. She shouldn't have gone down there in the first place, but then again, she had hoped that she could just go in and have a place to relax and watch the news, without any of the people she worked with. And maybe, if Axel wasn't such a pervert, they could have just talked and had some coffee, and it could have made for a pleasant experience in the midst of the chaos. She surmised that's what she deserved for giving him that much credit. She looked at her watch. It was almost midnight. Her shift was almost over, and she hadn't done a bit of inventory like she was supposed to do every night. Damn you, Axel, she muttered under her breath. Guys are just pigs, she thought. She flipped through a few pages in her clipboard, scanning the inventory list and then glancing up at the rows of shelves stocked with tiny glass vials in front of her. Jesus, Axel, she wondered. What made you like that? Just because your father was a slime ball doesn't mean you have to follow in his footsteps. Have some respect for yourself. Her thoughts began to trail off. She walked down the last aisle of shelves, standing on her toes to reach the top shelf. And just as her fingers grasped at the tiny jar above her head, the thought of Axel's sleazy hands crossed her mind again, and she didn't notice another vial sitting a little too close to the edge. Her clipboard bumped it as she stumbled forward, and it fell and shattered, spilling the biohazardous fluid on the floor. Shit! Shit! She swore through clenched teeth. What else could go wrong? It had to be the curse of Crystal Lake, she thought miserably, and the curse is Axel fucking Burns.
Axel lifted up the sheet and stared in disgust at the masked man lying on the slab. Jesus, he thought. No wonder he wore that mask around. He dropped the sheet, rolled the masked man's corpse into the freezer, and slammed the door shut, not bothering to latch it. God, that bastard was heavy, Axel thought. Who'd have thought he'd be looking over a mass murderer? At least his job was a little bit more exciting now. He grabbed his cup of coffee off of the counter and sat back down on the folded gurney, his eyes glued to the TV screen, where the chicks and leotards were still bouncing and gyrating to the pulse of the synth beat. He grinned. Hi, girls. Thanks for waiting, he said, softly chewing his bottom lip. He gave the blonde in the middle a dirty look. She'd act right, thought Axel. She'd be willing to do anything to him. She wouldn't leave him horny and run off like a crazy person. Look at yourself, he chided himself, sitting here staring perversely at these total strangers. You didn't even know their names. What else could he do but stare at them? That's all there was to do in this dump. That's all he ever did anyways. Stare at chicks, stare at complete strangers, even the dead ones. He'd never had a steady relationship, never even been married. There was no way he was getting tied down to one broad. Women were far too complicated to be around for that long. He didn't know what the hell had just happened with Nurse Morgan. Usually she would have happily complied to fooling around before closing up. Not this time. What the hell was her problem? What had he done wrong? She was acting like she had never seen a dead guy before. That was the problem with broads, acting on their emotions and always blowing things out of proportion. You work as a nurse, in a hospital, he thought, and you get spooked by a body? Women, Axel scoffed under his breath. They needed to lighten up and learn to just have some fun. What else was there to do besides screw around at this job? He had so much downtime, that was the only thing to do besides sit in front of the TV, drink coffee, and get your rocks off. He took another sip of his coffee and cursed under his breath as a huge drop splattered onto his white lab coat. Damn it, he said, and reached to set his coffee on top of the TV. He didn't notice that the icebox behind him was empty, and the door was standing wide open. He didn't notice that a surgical hacksaw was missing from the table. As he sat back on the folded gurney, an immensely powerful hand clamped down his forehead, yanking him backwards. Axel had no time to scream or fight back. He didn't have time to process that he was actually being murdered. He saw the blade of the hacksaw move past him in a blur, and he felt a searing white-hot pain stronger than anything he had ever felt before. Warm blood began to flow down the front of his lab coat, and he realized that his throat had been slashed. The blade had sliced through his carotid artery, resulting in a brilliant geyser of blood that sprayed all over the television screen in front of him. Blood began to gurgle up in his throat, pouring from his mouth as he choked and gagged for air. White streaks of pain flashed in front of his eyes, and he felt his entire body going numb as he choked on his own blood bubbling up and cascading from his severed neck. Just as his life was being drained out of him, two hands grabbed him on either side of his head and twisted 180 degrees. He didn't feel a thing. There was the sickening sound of his neck snapping, and the last thing Axel saw before life became nothing but a blur was a man wearing a hockey mask standing over him, admiring his handiwork. Chapter 2 Nurse Morgan didn't hear the door to the inventory room slowly swing open and the slow, laborious breathing, steady at first and then growing with intensity. She swept up the last few pieces of broken glass into the plastic biohazard bag, shaking her head miserably. What a night, she thought sourly. What a hell of a night. She knew what she was doing the minute she got home. Get a hot shower, take some sleeping pills, and hit the sack. She could still feel Axel's hands all over her. He was a total pig. Why did she keep falling for him? 
He was inconsiderate. He was rude. He was crude. He was everything that girls hated in a guy. But yet, she still found herself sneaking down to the morgue every now and then to see him. And that wasn't even the worst of it. He'd get inside your mind. Now, she was dropping things everywhere and being a total klutz. What a sleaze. Her thoughts were interrupted by footsteps behind her. Get lost, Axel. I'm busy, she yelled over her shoulder, not bothering to turn around. I've had more than enough of you for one night. The footsteps kept coming closer and closer. The breathing grew louder. A huge shadow fell over her. Nurse Morgan felt her face growing hot with anger. Read my lips. Leave me alone, she shrieked and spun around. A hockey mask was staring right back at her. Before she could react, Jason Voorhees' powerful hand clamped around her neck and slammed her back against the wall. She let out a blood-curdling shriek as Jason lifted her into the air, her feet dangling in mid-air, his grimy hand in a vice-like grip around her throat. She reached out, clawing and scratching at her assailant, seeing the utter hatred in his eyes through the two holes in the blood-stained hockey mask. It was him, the guy who killed all the kids at Crystal Lake, and he was killing her. She barely had time to process the realization. All she could do was continue to scream hysterically at the top of her lungs and try with every ounce of her strength to pry the maniac's hands from her throat. It was all in vain. There was a suddenly a flash of silver and a scalpel was plunged into her midsection. She let out a guttural gurgling noise, blood bubbling up in her throat, and her vision faded to red and then to black. All she could hear next was the sound of her own flesh ripping as the scalpel sliced down through her torso. For a split second, she felt the most agonizing pain she had ever felt, and then everything went dark. Her limp body collapsed in a pool of blood and entrails, and Jason let the scalpel fall from his hand. He felt the seething rage inside of him slowly subside, but it would soon come back. It always did. Whenever he killed, he felt the rage dissipate, and an unbelievable sensation of satisfaction washed over him. But it was only a matter of minutes before he felt it again. Whenever he saw young people doing filthy things to each other, it brought the feeling back, each time stronger than the last. He had heard them on the gurney in front of him climbing all over each other, kissing, moaning with passion, and all he could feel was an overwhelming lust to eradicate them both, to watch their blood flow between his fingers, to feel a blade slice into their flesh, to watch all of the life drain from their worthless bodies. They were all the same, just like the blonde girl, the one who took his mother's life. He felt the same insatiable fury when he had killed all of them. He didn't feel the bloody gash above his left eye where she had struck him with the axe. He hardly felt anything when it happened. All he felt was the anger and hatred towards her, towards them, towards all the young careless people who ran around and did filthy obscene things to each other in the dark. The ones who weren't watching him, the ones who had killed the only one who loved him, drove her crazy mad with grief and then killed her right in front of him. For twenty long years, he survived lost in the woods, unable to find his mother feeding off the wilderness, and then, after what seemed like forever to his unhinged mind, he watched from the shadows of the trees as his mother was killed on the shore of the lake, watched her head be sliced clean from her body and roll off into the water. He didn't understand. He couldn't understand. All he could understand was that they hurt him, and hurt his mother. They let him die. Nobody had cared. He remembered twenty long years ago as if it had happened yesterday, a vivid fragment of blurred and distant memories. His whole life had been a blur, trapped in his silent world, living on his own out in the woods of Crystal Lake. But now, he saw what the world was like and he despised it. They hadn't been watching him, they only cared about pleasuring themselves, like his mother had always said. He remembered his mother had brought him to the edge of a field where the counselors had been hanging out one night and told him how the youth were all engaged in drugs and making love and how disgusting it was and that they would all pay for their sins, and she was right. Every time he saw them out here, every time he saw young people at Camp Crystal Lake, they were all acting the same, just like his mother had said. Getting nude and running into the woods to touch each other and pleasure each other, heedless of any worries or cares, they all had to pay. Wherever they went, they spread obscenities in their disgusting ways. Time and time again, he would spy on the counselors back at Camp Crystal Lake, and just as his mother had said, they would all be engaging in drugs and making love like feral animals. 
like the disgusting, abhorrent, worthless pieces of flesh that his mother had told him that they were. He remembered how all the kids had ostracized him, ostracized him until he was walking out alone by the lake while the other kids were playing soccer, and had fallen in, and no one had heard him scream. The counselors hadn't heard him scream. No one had heard his screams. The rage grew. He had woken up, not remembering how long he had been underwater. The only thing that had helped him survive was the thought of his mother. He remembered floating with the current until after what seemed like forever, and then he found himself somewhere on the lake shore, far away from his mother and from Camp Crystal Lake. He had survived for weeks that turned into months and years, hiding out in some abandoned cabins and surviving off canned foods and berries and any fish or small rodents he could catch. After what seemed like eternity of rote survival in the wilderness, after nights of dreaming of his mother, he had gotten back to Camp Crystal Lake, but found his mother gone, and the cabins vacated and condemned by the authorities. There he stayed, hiding out in the cabins and running into the woods whenever a Crystal Lake deputy would come to make his rounds and make sure no one was trespassing on the campgrounds. And it was there that he had seen them, counselors, and Steve Christie disturbing his home, turning it back into a place where teenagers, young people, happy, normal people, the ones who fit in, could go to make love and ruin his safe and peaceful hideout he had had for himself. He had run into the woods, terrified of them, still feral and out of his mind, but one night he heard his mother calling for him. Kill her, mommy! Kill her! Kill her! He had heard her cry. He was watching from the shadows as the young, pretty blonde woman had fought his crazed mother on the shore of the lake and decapitated her. The rage grew. She hadn't forgotten about him. His animalistic mind had thought she had been screaming his name, killing for him and seeking vengeance. And now the only rational position in his mind was to finish the job for her. To kill Alice and anyone who came back to his woods, to his lake. He managed to take his mother's head before the police started crawling all over the camp and built a crude shack in the woods with some spare supplies he had stolen, where he lay in wait, dormant, not bathing or grooming, growing even more into some kind of uncivilized animal, surviving in the woods, waiting until the time was right. Jason would hear his mother's voice calling to him as he would kneel down to her by her decomposing severed head in the back of that dilapidated shack. Kill her, Jason. Kill them all. Kill them all. Do you know what they did to me? What they did to you? They weren't watching you, Jason. They're very bad. They do very bad things with each other. Very bad, selfish, disgusting things. You must kill them. They can't hurt you. Kill for me, Jason. How could Jason let his mother's killer live knowing she had only been loving him so much and avenging him? He couldn't let her live. She had to die. He didn't remember tracking her down. He didn't remember climbing into her apartment through an open window with his mother's severed head. But he remembered her scream as she saw the head, sitting on the top shelf of the refrigerator where he had placed it on display, as a morbid reminder of what she had done. Her death happened in a wild blur. He had stopped her screams with one hand and held her as she struggled in his grasp like a fish on a hook. And then he had plunged the ice pick deep into her skull and into her brain. He didn't remember plunging it in, but he could remember the satisfaction from hearing her dying screams, and that he had to kill again and again. They all had to die, every last one of them. The counselors, selfish, careless teenagers, and all young people, they were all responsible. They would come back again and again to fulfill their selfish and abhorrent desires in his woods. It was what his mother wanted, and now he had to finish what she started. Jason was going back to Crystal Lake. Welcome to Crystal Lake. It was morning in Crystal Lake. The golden rays of the sun had just begun to peek over and paint the tops of the tall pine trees that surrounded the lake. An old weathered dock stuck out into the middle of the water next to a rickety sign that read Crystal Point. A beaver poked his head out of the water, scanning the surroundings for any sign of incoming danger, and then dashed back underneath the surface, seeing the two blonde women jogging down the trail near the lake shore. Seventeen-year-old Trish Jarvis used to hate the idea of living out in the middle of nowhere. She had begged her mom not to whisk her away to a town out in the country, out to Crystal Lake. 
and take her away from her school. But it was no use. She was firmly set on the idea. She had also hated the idea of being homeschooled, but that was her mother's idea as well. It's much safer than public school, her mother would say. You won't have any bad influences like the kids in public school. Over the last few years, she had gotten used to the peace and quiet of the country, so she didn't complain much about it. After all, she could wake up in the morning to the sounds of birds chirping in the trees, instead of brakes screeching and cars honking and pedestrians hollering for a taxi. And since they moved out to the country and her mother began homeschooling them, she did have so much more time to spend with her family. They were able to go on an early morning or even a late night jog around the lake without worrying about getting mugged. It was almost a picturesque scene. The shimmering lake could be seen through the tall trees from the porch of their two-story cabin and they had the quiet woods virtually to themselves except for a mostly vacant rental home on the opposite side of the heavily wooded clearing. Fallen pine boughs and dead leaves littered the grounds, and a twin set of mailboxes, one unused and rusted shut, marked the road that led into town. She had grown fond of it over the years. Besides, you could do anything you wanted out in the country. And yet her mother still worried, constantly worried, about every little thing, it was why they were out here in the middle of nowhere. Don't stay out too late. Don't go into the woods alone. Don't wear short skirts. Don't talk to strangers. She would say. What could happen out in the middle of the woods? There weren't any bears in this part of the country, and they didn't have anybody living around them. Their closest neighbor was several miles up the narrow dirt road leading into town. The only company they ever had was when a family would occasionally occupy the rental home next to them and they had never had any trouble with them. They were the only people Trish had ever actually talked to in this town. God, I'm wasting my life in Crystal Lake, she thought. She was only 17, but she would be graduating soon. After this summer, she would be in her last year of homeschool. What was she going to do with her life? Maybe she could go off to college somewhere or get a job in another town and rent an apartment for cheap. Maybe get a job as a waitress or a bank teller and save up enough money to take some classes. Maybe something easy like accounting or being a secretary. Then, once she had saved up enough money, she could go to something like nursing school and have a career for herself. She enjoyed the thought of getting to help people. And after all, her mother had worked as a nurse in the city for a short time. She knew one thing for sure. She didn't want to do it in Crystal Lake. It was nice and all and quiet, sure, but she had to get away. There was nobody she really connected to in this town. All of her friends were back home in the city. At this point, it was more about trying to make a living and getting away from this place and her family, but it seemed so horrible to think about things like that. It was just that her family was just starting to wear her. She saw them every day. All day. She loved them, of course, but my God, 24 hours a day with your family could really start to take a toll on you. You couldn't be cooped up with your family for too long or you start to go crazy. She never talked to anyone else except for them except maybe the clerk at the grocery store or the hairdresser sometimes, and when a family would rent the house next door, she would almost knock their door down trying to meet them. Maybe she was just getting cabin fever. Maybe she was just lonely. Maybe she just needed a break or a change of scene. She didn't know for sure, but the Crystal Lake scene was getting old. Her dad would have loved it out in the country, she thought as they kept jogging. He would have loved the fresh air and the atmosphere. They separated seven years ago, two years before they left for Crystal Lake. Trish always thought that it hurt her and her younger brother Tommy more than it hurt her mother. Their dad had always been there for them to get them out of any tough situations and taught them how to be adults and how to apply for jobs and how to fix cars and anything else they needed to know how to do. Even though her dad had fallen out of love with her mom, Trish still loved him more than anyone in the world. She had been the apple of her father's eye and she had known he was seeing someone else before her mom knew. It was so obvious in the way he would stay in his room for hours or by the telltale forced smiles and kisses or staying out all night at the office until 3 a.m. in the morning. He had always bought her anything she wanted and let her do anything she wanted, and her mother was always the strict one, always the one to say no. The one thing he wouldn't do for her was give her an explanation. What had happened, she had asked them. Why can't you guys work this out? Her mom had reminded her that you couldn't possibly ask for an explanation of why you didn't love someone. There weren't any words for that, and she had been right. She really didn't see her father that much anymore. Ever since they moved out here, she didn't really see anyone. She mostly spent her days with Tommy or with Mom. Of course, she loved them, but that didn't mean she wanted to always spend every moment with them. Her only saving grace was that she was 17, and that meant she could drive. But they only had one car. 
Her mother would reluctantly let her drive into town on occasion, but it was always just to the grocery store or the comic book store with Tommy. Still, it did allow her some freedom. But who could she visit? She didn't know anyone in this town, not even any kids from the high school. What was the use of a car without people to go see? She was probably just being dramatic. After all, she had her whole life to escape and see the world. It had only been six years in this town. It wasn't like she'd spent her whole life here, but still something had to give. Trish snapped out of her thoughts and realized that her and her mother had been jogging in silence for the last quarter of a mile. She remembered that her father had called only a few days ago. I talked to Dad, Trish said. How is he? Miss Jarvis asked hesitantly. He asked me to come out and see him. Did he tell you to take a number? Miss Jarvis said. No, but he asked about you. Did he? Well, on second thought, um, maybe we should go out and see him. Miss Jarvis said. I bet he could stand a visit. What do you think? Trish grinned slyly. I think you're just getting horny. Miss Jarvis blushed and rolled her eyes, and they went back to jogging in silence. Come on, Mom, Trish thought. It was a joke. You don't have to get so worked up. She stared out at the shimmering lake as they kept jogging down the trail. As she squinted through the trees, she thought she could see a dark figure in a small stand of trees on the opposite side of the lake. Or maybe not. As she slowed her jogging and squinted harder at the stand of trees in the distance, the figure vanished. God, Trish thought sheepishly. Who would be all the way out here in Crystal Lake? It was probably nothing, or, or a hunter, or just her imagination. Her mother was starting to wear on her, she thought. Pretty soon, she was going to start liking the isolation. But for now, she just wanted to have a little fun and meet someone new. What was so wrong with that? She was actually starting to hallucinate people in the woods. She was becoming her mother. Maybe it was that it was Friday the 13th tomorrow. People always said that bad things happen to you on Friday the 13th. But Friday the 13th was just another day out of the year, she thought. Just a silly superstition, right? Trish and Mrs. Jarvis stepped through the door of their wood frame two-story cabin to the sound of mass gunfire and digital explosions. Miss Jarvis's 12-year-old son, Tommy, sat at the computer desk in the living room. A grotesque rubber mask pulled over his face, his fingers moving rapidly across the keyboard as he blasted his way through a row of enemies. Miss Jarvis frowned. She would never understand why kids these days were so enraptured by video games. Tommy would sit at the desk, his eyes glued to the screen, playing computer games for hours on end. How could a computer game be so much fun? All there was to it was to fly around in some sort of craft and blow everything in your path up. It was nothing but mindless violence, but still it kept him occupied. After all, when they moved to the country, Tommy didn't have much to do, especially during the summer. He had begged for a new computer the Christmas before and the Christmas before that, but she didn't have the funds. He also wanted a computer game, something called Zaxxon, and she didn't have the money for that either. He already had a computer up in his room, but he claimed that it was too old and too outdated to play the games that he wanted to play. So on Christmas morning a few months ago, she scraped up enough money and she surprised him with a brand new computer and Zaxxon to go with it. Now, she almost regretted it, considering it was all he ever did besides make those horrid-looking masks. Not that he didn't do a good job on them, but they gave her the willies, especially when he'd leave them sitting on her dresser to give her a good scare. Tommy, would you turn it down? She called into the living room. Trish chuckled to herself and walked up the staircase to change out of her sweaty clothes. Tommy turned away from his game of Zaxxon and sighed, looking at her through the eye holes in his mask. But I got 98,000, he protested. Miss Jarvis shivered as she saw the hideous features of the mask on her son's head. It looked like something from the sci-fi movie she had seen when she was a teen. It came from outer space. It was a grayish color and the eyes were huge and oval shaped. It wasn't even a scariest mask. He had over a dozen upstairs, all ones that made her skin crawl. But they looked good, so realistic, she often wondered how he did it. He would sit up in his room with his kit with the door closed for hours working on them. How many robots is that? She asked, playing along. Thirty-five, Tommy replied, turning back to the screen just in time to watch his player die in a pixelated explosion. You lose, and big flashing letters flashed across the screen. Mrs. Jarvis crossed the front hall into the kitchen and reached for a rag on the counter, mopping her sweaty brow. This house was nothing like their apartment back in the city, she thought. 
Their apartment was squeezed into the back corner of a huge apartment complex, and from the inside you would have thought they lived in a normal one-story house in the suburbs. It was modern and comfortable. This house looked like a flashback to the early 1900s. It was a log cabin that looked like it was designed by Lincoln himself. All of the walls were made of wooden planks, and the railings that surrounded the front and the back porch were made of sturdy wooden logs. The inside wasn't much different than the outside. The ceiling was high and pointed and long, sturdy wooden beams stretched across from one wall to the other. The walls, too, were made of wood, and the rooms were adorned with Dutch doors and ancient oil paintings and wooden countertops. There were even an antique iron gas furnace in the dining room. Of course, it didn't work anymore. It was just a relic from the past. She didn't mind all of the antique furniture. It made it feel cozier. The inside of their apartment in the city felt like a doctor's office waiting room, but this house felt more like a home. Hey, Tommy, why don't you try killing some robots up in your room? Mrs. Jarvis called into the living room. I can't. I need a bypass patch cord, Tommy said, walking into the kitchen and peeling the mask off his face. The mask came off to reveal the young, naive face of a preteen boy. His shaggy brown hair was disheveled by the mask, and he reached into his pocket, pulling out a pair of wire-rimmed glasses and putting them on. Tommy sat down on a wooden bar stool as Mrs. Jarvis crossed the kitchen to the sink and began pouring herself a glass of water. Maybe you can get one in town. Church will drive you. Hey, while you're there, please get a haircut. Mrs. Jarvis said. Tommy groaned in response. Ah, oh, Mom! He sighed. Mrs. Jarvis took a sip from the glass of water and looked down at the rubber mask lying on the counter. That's a nice mask. Do I have to get a haircut? Tommy moaned, not even registering the compliment. Mrs. Jarvis laughed and changed the subject. You're getting really terrific in making those things. Thanks, I just customized it, Tommy said, admiring his work. Hey, where's Gordon? She asked him, looking around for their pet golden retriever. He went out, Tommy replied, not looking up from his mask. Mrs. Jarvis looked into the hall and saw the back door standing wide open. Oh, someone left the door open again. She quickly moved towards it and closed it. We're in the country, Tommy said. Mrs. Jarvis walked back towards the kitchen counter, her eyes wide with uneasiness. What if a psycho walks in? She immediately remembered last night, that news report about all those kids getting killed. She had meant to tell Tommy and Trish. She had wanted to tell them to be careful for the next few weeks until it all blew over. But she didn't want to frighten them, so she decided to just keep quiet. Just as her mind came back to reality, Trish came strolling into the kitchen, freshly changed into a white blouse and a comfortable-looking pair of shorts. He'd probably challenge him to a game of Zaxxon, Trish joked. She opened the refrigerator and grabbed a pitcher of lemonade and a glass from the cupboard. Hey, Mom! Did you hear anything about the place next door? Trish asked, pouring the lemonade into her glass. Uh-huh. It's been rented by some kids, Mrs. Jarvis said, looking out the window at the two-story rental house beside them. Great! Trish exclaimed. How many? Tommy asked. Six. Well, it would be nice to have some company around here, Trish said, sipping her lemonade. Finally, some people her age were renting that house. I could actually make some friends, Trish thought to herself. She had had lots of friends in the city, but now that her mother was homeschooling her out in the middle of nowhere, it was almost impossible to meet anyone. The only kinds of people who ever rented that old house were elderly couples. Maybe she'd meet a friend, or even better, a boy. This might be the escape she needed. None of them had any idea that the company they would soon receive would be more terrifying than any of them could ever imagine. Chapter 3 Country boy, country boy, sitting in the grass, along came a prairie dog and crawled right up his ask-me-no-more-questions. The 1973 gold Chevrolet Capri, crammed with six teenagers, flew down the narrow dirt road. Eighteen-year-old Sarah Williams sat quietly in the back seat and watched the trees fly by her window. As she listened to the rest of her friends chant some old folk song that she had never heard before. They had all been singing for the past quarter of a mile but it didn't bother her much. They all liked to cut up and have a good time, and she was used to it by now. Besides, they had a reason to be singing. The six of them had just graduated from their senior year at Springview High and felt like their young lives were just beginning. 
They had wanted to go to the beach for their big summer trip before they started college, but none of them had saved up enough money, so they all settled for a few days in the woods instead. After all, it would be much cheaper to rent a cabin in the woods, bring some drugs and booze, spend a few bucks in gas to drive about an hour outside of their town to Crystal Lake, and just relax in the great outdoors. Sarah glanced over at her best friend Samantha, a 17-year-old beautiful and vivacious brunette who was singing along with the two guys sitting up front. Sam's boyfriend, Paul, sat in the driver's seat. His trademark blue baseball cap pulled over his dark hair. Sarah's boyfriend, Doug, sat in the passenger seat. Sarah had been a little hesitant when Doug first asked her if she wanted to come out into the country with him and his friends for a graduation get-together. She'd lived in this area all of her life and had never even been in the woods. She also didn't know some of these people. Paul and Sam had been dating for several months now, but Sarah just wasn't all that close to him. The only time she had ever interacted with Paul while hanging out with Sam was when they wanted to screw around, which was usually whenever they were together. And then there was Ted, one of Paul's friends, who had brought along his friend Jimmy, and she hardly knew them at all. But surely they would all get to know each other a little bit and the tension would ease. Sarah stared out into the thick woods that lined the road. She had heard all sorts of horror stories, especially around this town. Stories of kids going off into the woods around Crystal Lake and never coming back again. She remembered from when she was a kid and her parents would tell her about a little boy who once drowned there in the lake. It was a tell they would always tell her to try to make sure she didn't swim off where she couldn't reach. It was one of those small town things. There were legends that got passed around and often got passed around so often that they became watered down versions of what actually happened. But from what she had heard, some stuff did happen at Crystal Lake. Maybe a boy did drown. Maybe some kids did go out in the woods and get involved in a really bad accident. But Sarah was sure that most of it was just talk to try to scare you. After all, if all these old people knew how many kids around here used the woods to have sex and smoke grass, she would understand why they would make these things up. Sarah knew all too well about how small-town people can be. Her parents were a prime example of conservative small-town narrow-mindedness. They couldn't stand her being with Doug and couldn't stand Sam. She had had so many long nights with them about it, even right before she decided to go on this trip. You shouldn't be going out in the woods for a weekend with those dope smokers. Sarah, you have a future. She had heard it all before. They were good friends. They just didn't know them like she did. And sure, they liked to party and get high every now and then, but who was she to judge? Who were they to judge? It wasn't a big deal. They had a really good time together. She wasn't that worried about her folks, though. They'd get over it even though she probably would never hear the end of it. She was more worried about being alone out in a cabin at Crystal Lake, but after all, she was with friends. And Doug told her that they would have some neighbors next door to the cabin they rented, a family with kids. It made her feel a bit safer that they wouldn't all be completely isolated, but she couldn't shake the knot forming in her gut as she stared out at the lonely wilderness on either side of the car. She hadn't seen a house or a store for miles. She wasn't necessarily a city girl by any means, but... She wasn't fit for the woods either. Maybe she could smoke some grass to ease her anxiety, but she always tended to pass on it. Sarah didn't really like doing any of that. Even at all the parties that Sam always dragged her along to, Sarah always passed on the weed and the booze. She didn't do that stuff, it just made her so uncomfortable. Sarah hated feeling out of control. It was part of the reason why she also hadn't had sex. That and her parents constantly lecturing her about it, Sarah, you need to save it for marriage. Good girls always save it for marriage. That's what she was really worried about, she thought. Not only her parents, but everyone else, too. Not that it really mattered, but Sam was always talking about her sexual encounters, and Sarah always never had anything to say. She made it so awkward. They would all be sitting around getting high and hooking up while she just sat there with Doug, not knowing how to make a move and being terrified to do anything about it. Sam had always said that it's okay to be a virgin. Save it for when you're ready. But Sarah still felt so self-conscious about it. Maybe it's because she really wanted to do it, but just didn't know how. She couldn't initiate. Well, she thought, maybe this weekend she was finally ready to do it with Doug. After all, they had been dating for three months, and it had gotten hot and heavy at one point. This weekend may finally be the chance to do it. It was now or never, because they were graduating and would likely be going off to different schools. As the thought of sex raced through her mind, she chewed her lip anxiously. Doug had always been understanding about the sex stuff and never pressured her, but she had also never been alone with him in a romantic way except for one other time. And now they definitely had the place and the time to be alone, out in the woods, at night. 
What would happen if everyone was out screwing and Sarah was left alone with him? What would happen then? Just do it when it feels right, she told herself. If it's not right, then Doug would understand. If she was just going to worry herself to death, if she thought about sex, she decided to shift her mindset to the scenery flying by the car window. Her mind began to drift away from her worries, and she began to hear bits and pieces of Jimmy and Ted's conversation behind her. You broke up with B.J. Betty? Ted asked, dumbfounded. Both he and Jimmy were crammed in the open hatchback with the luggage. Jimmy ran his hands anxiously through his sandy, wind-blown hair. So, so to speak, he said, sighing. And would you lighten up on her? She's all right. Ted chuckled, adjusting his sunglasses. I'll say she's all right, he said, grinning. You should have treated her right. That girl wanted to be treated right. I did, I did, I treated her right, Jimmy protested indignantly. That's what's driving me so crazy. Did I, Jimmy thought to himself. Maybe Ted was right. Maybe there was something he had done wrong. Why did he always have to screw it up every time a girl liked him? He'd only been dating this chick for a week and a half, and she totally blew him off. Same with the lass. Jimmy and Ted had been best friends since middle school, and Ted was always the guy that got all the girls. Who could blame the girls? He was one of the coolest guys in school, but more in that bad boy wannabe kind of deal. All the girls loved it. He was all right looking, decent head of hair, nice smile. Jimmy never understood how he did it, but that's how it was. Ted getting the girls, Jimmy's relationships never seeming to work out, and Jimmy crying to Ted for advice. This time, things weren't any different. I mean, first I would call her and she would take my calls, and then she would have something to do, and then she wouldn't even take my calls. Can you figure that? What the fuck happened? Jimmy exclaimed, running his hands through his hair again. Ted shook his head. Here, let me put it in the old computer. He rubbed his hands together and Jimmy rolled his eyes. Come on, I'm being serious about this. Hey, the computer don't lie, Ted said. Let's see. Ted held up both his hands, pretending to type on an imaginary keyboard. Jimmy let his head rest on the seat behind him, sighing with exasperation. Ted's computer had been a running joke throughout their friendship, but now Jimmy didn't find it very funny. Many times, Jimmy had sat and watched Ted bring up results on the computer, only for them to be one of two things, hurtful insults or a piece of advice that never worked out in the end. Jimmy watched painfully, waiting to hear the results. Ted finished typing and stifled a laugh. He buried his face in his hands. What? Jimmy asked. Ted glanced over at his friend with apologetic eyes, shaking his head. It says you're a dead fuck, he said, holding in his laughter. What? Jimmy asked in disbelief. A dead fuck? A lousy lay, Ted explained. You know? Ted held his arms out, his hand dangling suggestively. Oh, don't hold back, Doc. Just give it to me straight, Jimmy exclaimed sarcastically. Hey, I didn't say it. The computer did. Ted said defensively. Yeah, well, there's no computer, Jimmy retorted. Ah, and there's no Betty either, Ted said matter-of-factly. Jimmy sighed defeated. There was no winning with Ted. So I'm a dead fuck, he said miserably. Ted shrugged matter-of-factly. Jimmy flopped back on the headrest and buried his face in his hands. God, I'm horny. The Chevrolet Capri pulled over to the side of the road and came to a stop. Doug fished a map out of his back pocket and started scanning it carefully. Samantha leaned over the seat over Paul's shoulder, her eyes wide with concern. Where are we? We're lost, Paul admitted, forcing a weak smile. Sarah looked out the window and saw that they had come to a stop right beside an old, dilapidated cemetery. A weed-choked iron gate surrounded the perimeter of the cemetery, and all of the tombstones were weathered and faded. She felt a chill run down the length of her spine. She'd always hated cemeteries, ever since she was a kid. Just the fact that she was walking directly over dead bodies gave her goosebumps. She could read the name on one of the newer gravestones. It read, Pamela Voorhees, 1930-1979. Why did that name sound so familiar? The last name, Voorhees. 
She remembered Doug mentioning something about the name Voorhees when he was asking her to come to Crystal Lake with him. It was probably nothing. Still, she felt the knot forming in her stomach again, and another chill ran up her arm. Stop spooking yourself, Sarah, she told herself. Samantha turned her head and noticed the cemetery. Pretty creepy, Sam said. Yeah, Sarah said, her voice trailing off. Okay, okay, I think we keep going straight for two miles and then hang a right, Doug said, pointing at the map. I hope you're right, Paul said, and pulled onto the road. Sarah slowly watched the cemetery disappear from view. She couldn't take her eyes off of that one gravestone. It looked newer than the others. They must have died within the last few years. Voorhees. What was it about that name? Voorhees. Pamela Voorhees. She repeated the name in her mind, trying to remember why that name gave her such an awful feeling. What had Doug said about the name Voorhees? Oh well, she wasn't paying attention when he had said it, and she shouldn't be worried about it now. It was probably just another Crystal Lake legend that their parents had always talked about and always warned them about. It was part of why her folks had been so adamant about them not going up to Crystal Lake. They said something about a campground where bad things happened. But if anything did happen, it was years ago. All of those things were just exaggerations. She was just letting her imagination run wild. Nothing would go wrong if they were all out there together. Sarah was starting to feel like her life was just beginning. She had had her best friend, her boyfriend, and they were going to enjoy a peaceful weekend in the country and nothing, and nobody was going to stop them. There was nothing to be afraid of. Patty Cunningham let out an exhausted sigh. If someone had told her before she decided to go on a weekend camping trip for some peace and relaxation, that she would end up broken down on the side of the road and forced to hitchhike in unbearable heat covered in mosquito bites from head to toe, she never would have gone in the first place. Go to Crystal Lake, they said. Take some time off, they said. Take a vacation, they said. They had all told her it was just what she needed, and not to blame them. They were right. With her husband running off on her and getting laid off from her job, it had been a stressful two months, and finally, when she had almost reached her breaking point, her best friend Linda grabbed her by the shoulders and told her to take a vacation. But she had no idea that her car would stall. Of course, she wanted to blame Linda, but it wasn't her fault. Nobody could have predicted that she would have had to hitchhike all the way to Crystal Lake while carrying her suitcase and knapsack in 98-degree weather. And the worst part of it was she hadn't seen a single car since she started walking. No one lived out here. Ever since she left the town of Crystal Lake, she hadn't seen a single sign of civilization. It was hopeless. She would be forced to walk the next ten miles to the spot by Crystal Lake that she had mapped out back home. She looked both ways down the desolate road. There was no sign of life anywhere. I'm fucked, she thought miserably. She saw an old tree stump not too far from the side of the road, and she tossed her stuff down and sat. It could be worse, Patty thought to herself. She could have gotten into a wreck and be injured. She definitely didn't need to be hitchhiking down the road in the heat with a broken leg. It'll be all right. Someone has got to come by eventually, she thought. She was fortunate that she found some old Save the Trees picket signs in her trunk from her tree hugger days in college. They were bright and colorful and were sure to attract a passing motorist. She had all her things. There was food and a sleeping bag in her suitcase. She could even camp out under the stars if it came to it. Maybe this wouldn't be such a ruined vacation after all. Just then, her thought was confirmed when she saw the front end of a 1973 Chevy Capri coming toward her down the country road. She grabbed her brightest sign and sprang to her feet, holding up the sign and waving her arms frantically. It was her big chance. Patty's shoulders slumped as she watched the Chevy fly right by, and she let her arms fall to her side, defeated. You have got to be shitting me, Patty thought to herself. The one car that passes by is full of a bunch of damn kids, a bunch of spoiled teens. She had seen the smirk on the face of the dark-haired boy wearing sunglasses in the back. Damn kids, she thought sourly. Just as the car began to disappear around the corner, the dark-haired kid in the sunglasses leaned out of the open hatchback. Hey, honey, you got a sister? He yelled out to her. He let out a guffaw of laughter. She heard the rest of the teens cackle with laughter as well. Patty couldn't believe it. She was speechless. But then she remembered that during her protesting days in college, there were more than a few people that didn't take too kindly to them 
parading around with their rainbow colored signs. So her group had painted fuck you on the back of the signs in black spray paint. She knew it would come in handy. She flipped around the sign and gave him the middle finger for good measure. But he didn't see it. The car was far down the country road. What was this world coming to? A world where people just pay no attention to someone who needs help. A world where, where people drive right by a woman on the side of the road just wanting a ride. Of course, she had heard all the horror stories about murderous hitchhikers, so she kind of didn't blame them. But still, there was no need to say things like that. What kind of parents would raise a child like that? That little prick needed to have the shit beaten out of him. That's what was wrong with this generation. Nobody hit their kids anymore. They were raising goddamn nightmares. She knew she was overweight, and she knew she wasn't all that attractive, but these disrespectful bastards just didn't know when to keep their mouths shut. Was she like that when she was younger? Surely not. Was she an awful immature person who would have done something like that? No, no, it was different in her day. They would learn. It would come back to bite them in the ass. Maybe a few days from now, or maybe a few years. Patty threw her hands in the air and plopped back down on the tree stump, realizing that she hadn't eaten since she left home. Her stomach was grumbling loudly. She reached down into the side pocket of her suitcase and pulled out a ripe banana and peeled it, biting into the soft fruit. She was too busy munching loudly on her banana to hear the footsteps behind her, slow and steady at first, then growing quicker and agitated. Then, she heard the leaves crunching behind her, light footfalls. Someone was behind her. But Patty didn't have time to see who it was. A hand grabbed her by the hair in a fierce talon-like grip, and another hand shoved a hunting knife into the back of her neck. She vomited up a hideous mixture of blood and banana, horrified at the sight of the bloody tip of the knife protruding from the front of her throat. In the throes of death, Patty's right hand clenched, squeezing the banana into mush, and she felt life ebb quickly. Jason Voorhees stood over her lifeless corpse, once again feeling the boiling rage inside of him subside. He stared down the road at the Chevrolet Capri becoming tiny in the distance, and he clenched his fist. He had watched them drive by and heard their laughter, young teenage laughter. None of them deserved that happiness. They all deserved nothing short of unadulterated annihilation and pure loathing. This Friday the 13th weekend, they would all pay. For so long, he waited, waited for them to return so he could kill once again. And now it would all be worth it. He would be doing just what his mother had wanted to end the lives of the counselors and any other abhorrent teenagers who decided to come to his home, his hunting grounds. He hid out in that shack in the woods undetected by law enforcement, and anyone who did find his shack was easily dispatched. Then he saw them, walking through the woods in scantily clad clothing, laughing, fondling, and groping each other, counselors, the ones his mother had tried to kill, back on his land, at his camp in his woods. He couldn't let them get away with it. He couldn't let them get away with engaging in those filthy acts at his lake. They would all see why nobody returns to Crystal Lake to do disgusting and sick things to each other on his property, Jason's campgrounds. And he felt the rage return, and it burned even more intensely than the last time, threatening to consume him. Jason was back. The nightmare at Crystal Lake was far from over. The birds and the bees. Night had fallen, and the lights in the Jarvis house glowed brightly. The moon shimmered on the surface of the lake, and the waves softly crashed against the sandy shore, pushed by the cool night breeze. The symphony of all the nocturnal animals coming out to make their calls was in full swing. Mrs. Jarvis stared nervously out the kitchen window above the sink, looking out into the pitch-black darkness. She couldn't stop thinking of the news report. She couldn't stop thinking about the murders. Ten bodies, they had said on the news, and there were even more bodies that had been found across the lake. Of course, 
The lake was big and stretched across many miles, and although it was on the same lake, it was probably pretty far away. But not far enough, she thought. Not far enough to put her mind at ease. She was nearly missing the tomato she was trying to slice, and had almost nicked herself with the large butcher knife. Her knuckles were curled tightly around the handle. She kept getting distracted from looking down at the cutting board and glancing at the doors and the windows. She had been paranoid all night. The last three times she had peeked out the kitchen window, she could have sworn she saw something move. Was it just the way the tree branches were casting shadows, or just her imagination? Tommy and Trish had no idea that the last two days there had been a maniac running amok across Crystal Lake. But she just couldn't bring herself to tell them. Even though Tommy loved making those terrifying masks and played all those violent games, he could still get scared. She faintly remembered their apartment in the city getting robbed, and Tommy couldn't sleep for weeks afterwards. She had come home to the door jimmied open in a ransacked office and kitchen, and Tommy standing there frozen with terror, his eyes glassed over, almost in a trance. For the next two or three months, he would cry out in the middle of the night, prompting her to have to run in and rock him back to sleep. She couldn't imagine how he would react if she told him there had been a killer on the loose. After all, the killer was dead, wasn't he? The guy was dead. But somehow, her mind wouldn't let her believe it. She hadn't turned on the television all morning. She didn't want them to see anything about it, and it wouldn't do her any good to watch it either. She looked over at Tommy, who was setting the table for dinner. Should she tell him about it, she thought, just so he would be careful? She was about to open her mouth when Trish walked into the kitchen eyeing the casserole dish of tuna salad on the stove that Mrs. Jarvis was preparing. Ah, oh, Mom, I thought we were having pizza for dinner, Trish said. I thought so, too, but the refrigerator is full of leftovers, Mrs. Jarvis said, cleaning her hands with the dish rack. Trish frowned. You're not smiling. You aren't in the mood for tuna salad? Mrs. Jarvis asked. Well, Trish sighed, disappointed. She glanced over at Tommy, who walked over towards the counter to grab another plate. Mrs. Jarvis and her daughter gave each other a knowing look. They both began to sneak towards Tommy, who looked on with displeasure, shaking his head and backing away. Trish came up from behind him, and they sandwiched him in. I know what I'm in the mood for, Mrs. Jarvis said, grinning deviously. No, no, Tommy protested, but it was too late. They both wrapped their arms around him and pinned him in between the both of them. A Jarvis, Jarvis sandwich! Trish and her mother cried, mock laughing maniacally and squeezing the struggling Tommy as tight as they could. Wait, wait, I, I, I heard something at the door, Tommy exclaimed. Uh, oh no, I'm not falling for that, Mrs. Jarvis said, hugging him tighter as he wriggled free from her grasp. Tommy broke free and moved towards the door. No, I heard that too, Trish said. He was right. Something was scratching wildly on the door. Tommy swung open the door and was greeted by a large, shaggy golden retriever leaping up on him and licking the side of his face. Hey, boy! Hey, Gordon! Tommy greeted the excited family dog, tousling his silky fur. Where you been, Gordon? You been sneaking around? You got a girlfriend or something? Tommy cooed playfully as Gordon unfurled his tongue and pawed at him in response. Gordon hopped down and trotted happily into the kitchen, where Mrs. Jarvis and Trish both petted him affectionately. Gordon was a stray they had found a few months after moving to Crystal Lake. He was wandering around their property for about a week, and he eventually became the family pet. Mrs. Jarvis had gone and put up flyers around town, but nobody claimed him, so they gave him a name, and he had been with them ever since. Tommy began to close the front door when he got a glimpse of two headlights coming down the country road, cutting through the inky black darkness. A 1973 Chevrolet came to a stop in front of the rental house next door, and there was a loud clamor as the six teenagers piled out of the car. Hey, I think those kids that rented the house next door are here, Tommy said, stepping out onto the front porch and eyeing the two slender dark-haired girls that climbed out of the back. His eyes grew wide. He had been homeschooled for as long as he could remember, and he had never seen a girl so pretty. They were both gorgeous, especially the girl with the darkest hair. He felt a tingling sensation in his stomach. What was happening, he thought to himself. It was just a girl. Why did he feel so weird? She wasn't that attractive. Oh, who was he kidding? She was the most beautiful girl he had ever laid his eyes on. 
and she was going to be living next door to him for the next few days, maybe even for an entire week. Trish stepped out beside him, calling back inside to her mother. We're going to go say hi, Trish said and closed the door. Trish and Tommy climbed down the rickety porch steps and walked down the path towards the rental house. The rental house was a Victorian-style clapper, two-story bungalow with a balcony and a sprawling porch. A big, octagonal picture window overlooked the front yard. The two slender, dark-haired girls getting out of the back seat of the car noticed them and waved. Gordon came bounding up behind Trish and Tommy and leapt up on the prettier of the two girls, licking her enthusiastically. Oh, Samantha cried, giggling. Hey, boy. Gordon, bad dog, Trish exclaimed and swatted him away. Oh, he's all right, Sam said. I'm Samantha. Sam shook Trish's hand. Hi, I'm Trish and this is Tommy. We're the Jarvises. We live next door. Trish introduced herself amicably. The girl with the lighter hair extended her hand. I'm Sarah, she said, shaking Trish's hand. Nice to meet you both. Tommy stood frozen with fascination. The prettier of the two girls, Samantha, was wearing a low-cut top and her cleavage was almost too much to handle. He had never seen a pair of breasts before. He knew girls had them, but he had never actually seen this much of them before. His hands were beginning to sweat, and his heart was racing. Sam bent down to pet Gordon, and his eyes fell right down her blouse. What a handsome mutt you are, Samantha said, laughing, her breast practically falling out of her top. His name is Gordon, Trish said, noticing Tommy's blank expression. She followed his gaze to Samantha's well-endowed assets. Trish gave him a dirty look and swatted him, but honestly, she was checking out a few of the guys herself. Two of them were standing at the trunk, heaving suitcases out of the back and pulling them into a pile. One was really good-looking, and the other was decent, she decided. The good-looking one was tall and lanky with a head of thick black hair that reminded her of Elvis, wearing a pair of sunglasses. They both wore straight leg jeans that made the muscles in their legs show and wore stylish dress shirts and slick black hair. She saw some of them were carrying graduation caps and surmised they had all dressed up for the ceremony. Another suave-looking guy in a blue baseball cap called out to an attractive dark-haired guy to throw him a beer. The dark-haired guy tossed him a can of beer and carried the rest of the case into the house. The guy in the baseball cap popped the lid, took a swig, and cheered. Samantha giggled and rolled her eyes. That's Paul acting like an idiot, she said, and that's Jimmy and Ted. She pointed to the two guys standing at the trunk, unloading the luggage. Hey, Doug, come meet our neighbors. Sarah called to the dark-haired guy coming out of the house. It wasn't the guy with the baseball cap or the guy who looked like Elvis, but he was attractive too. He almost bore resemblance to a young Sean Cassidy. Trisha's hands were beginning to sweat as well. She wasn't keeping up with their names. She just smiled lightly and tried not to stare. She wanted to say something, anything. Nothing came out, but just more standing and smiling. Doug, as Sarah had called him, came running over to meet them, shaking Trisha's hand with a firm grasp. His wavy dark hair fell over his sparkling green eyes. This is my boyfriend, Doug, Sarah said, smiling. Trish felt a slight disappointment that he and Sarah were together, but she smiled anyway. I'm Trish, and this is my brother Tommy. You guys live around here? asked Sam. Yeah, right there. Trish said, pointing back towards the house. Cool. Looks like we're going to be neighbors for the next three days anyway, Doug said, smiling. He was gorgeous, Trish thought. He was tanned and muscular, and his teeth were perfectly straight. But who was she kidding? She certainly didn't have the body of Samantha or Sarah. Well, if you guys need anything, we're right next door, Trish said, figuring they would take the hint and offer an invitation. Sure thing, Samantha said with a cheerful grin tossing her jet-black hair behind her shoulders. She was drop-dead beautiful, thought Trish. There was no way she wasn't hooked up with one of these guys, if not two or three of them. Her perfect olive complexion and hourglass figure were to die for. Well, see you around, Trish said. Let's go back to the house, Tommy. She tugged him gently on the arm, but he was still mesmerized by Samantha. Trish yanked on his sleeve more firmly, and he finally succumbed, following her back to the house. As they climbed the porch steps to their house, Trish took one last glance back at the rental home. The guy that looked like Elvis was leaning against the porch railing, sipping a can of beer and talking to Paul. 
Samantha ran up beside Paul and pressed her body against his, and Paul lifted her up into her arms and spun her around. Samantha guffawed with laughter, swatting at him. Put me down, she cried playfully. Trish sighed, watching as the handsome guy in the cap set Samantha on the ground and kissed her passionately, his hand groping her buttocks. Trish smiled weakly and shook her head wistfully. For the longest time, she had been so lonely. Living out in the middle of the woods never brought her any friends, much less a boyfriend. The last boyfriend she had was in the sixth grade that she was forced to part with when her mother pulled them out of the city and dragged them out to the middle of nowhere in a hick town called Crystal Lake, away from civilization. She tried going to the local high school, but it had been a disaster. The whole school treated her like an outcast because she was from the city. They called her names, and she sat by herself at lunch. Much to her chagrin, Mrs. Jarvis pulled Trish out of that terrible influence and settled in at home where she had been homeschooled up until now. Now she almost wished she had just begged her mom to let her stay, that she could handle being bullied, but she had just gone along with it. She didn't like not having many friends. All she had were the ones that she kept in touch with back in the city, and her mother was in no way interested in moving back to the bustle of the city. She was dying to meet someone. She hoped that she could wait until she moved off to college to some prestigious university in a big city, but she didn't know if she could handle the cabin fever much longer. How much longer did she have before she would totally lose it? She was probably just being dramatic. After all, what was so wrong with going over and asking if they wanted to hang out? Why didn't anybody do that anymore? Why couldn't anyone just be honest and forthright with each other and explain your intentions clearly? Maybe she should just go over there and tell them all her family was driving her crazy and just come out right with it. But then, would they take her seriously or just rebuff her like the kids at school did? Well, there was only one way to find out. Just be nice, she thought, and be cool. Just go over and talk to them and let them get to know you. Maybe she could go over and visit them before they left, but she wasn't sure if her mother would be all too pleased at Trish going over to party with a bunch of teenagers she had never met before tonight. They were drinking and looked way too rowdy for Tracy Jarvis's standards. No, she would have to sneak over there when her mom went out jogging later or when she went to bed before the weekend was over. What would be the harm in that? It would be good to socialize. She may even meet a foxy guy and start something or just have a few drinks and maybe smoke a joint or two. My God, Trish thought. She imagined the look on her mother's face if she had ever said the word marijuana around her. She could hear her disapproving tone in her head. She hadn't tried grass before, but lots of her friends back home did it, and she didn't see the big deal. After all, she knew all about how marijuana was stigmatized in this country from reading books at the local library in town. She had read about how lots of anti-pot propaganda gave it a bad rep and how a campaign mostly steered by Ronald Reagan started the war on drugs, and now weed was becoming one of the most frequently used illicit substances, when in reality, it was a lot more comparable to alcohol than, say, heroin. It was one of the safest drugs, and she had always been eager to try it, but she worried about her mother smelling it on her if she were to come home in the middle of the night. She would have to sneak out, she thought, and take a quick shower or something. She wondered how long they were going to stay. Don't get your hopes up, she told herself. They could be gone tomorrow. It was just a rental house. She may as well just forget it. it had even happened, but she still felt a tinge of excitement as she stepped through the side door of the house just feet away from the huge figure bathed in black standing behind a tree. Jason tightened his grip on the brown leather handle of the hunting knife, the blade still coated with the blood from the fat hitchhiker. Jason hadn't intended on killing her, but still he felt no regret. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Jason walked around the side of the Jarvis house, seeing Mrs. Jarvis staring wearily out the kitchen window at the rental house. Jason followed her gaze to the group of teenagers, carrying luggage through the front door of the house, laughing and chatting, sounding so young and careless and joyous, it sickened him. Jason felt the rage swell, and he took a heavy breath, struggling to contain the white streaks of fury and rage that flashed before his eyes, desperate to quell the burning lust that was a powder keg within him, ready to ignite. They were all the same. Just look at them touching each other intimately and enjoying themselves while doing it. They were touching each other the same way that those two counselors who should have been watching him were touching each other. 
those two mindless teenagers who cared nothing about satisfying their selfish needs, heedless of the life that had been entrusted to them. They were all the same. Now he knew they had to die. They all had to die. Eventually, they all proved they were just as repugnant as the rest of them. He pictured his knife piercing the girl with the dark hair's soft flesh, the blade penetrating the flesh between her two ample breasts, penetrating her heart. He pictured the blade slicing through the boy's toned body, ripping through tendons and ligaments until he stopped screaming, hacking away at his remains until there was nothing left. The visions he would have were so vivid and salient that they made his mouth water and his heart race. Visions of blood, of screaming and entrails pouring out of wounds, and of eviscerated corpses. Every time he killed and saw the glaring red of the blood spilling out of their worthless bodies, it soothed the tightness in his chest and the pounding in his head. Everything felt right again, but then, when he saw them touching each other and enjoying themselves, everything got loud again, and he had to kill. There was no other way. He had no other options. The voice of his mother guided him, the real-life manifestation of the deep pain that he felt ever since he watched his mother die as she fought for her life was more than enough to satisfy him, but only for a short time. They all deserved punishment. His mother had been right. He had to finish what she had started 26 years ago. This Friday the 13th, they would all pay. Chapter 4 Samantha opened the door to the bedroom at the end of the hall and grinned at the side of the queen-size bed. Looks like Paul and I are going to be having a lot of fun here for the next few days. Samantha laughed mischievously and turned back to Sarah, who stood in the doorway smiling weakly. Sam threw her luggage onto the mattress, unzipped it and took out a large vanity purse and headed for the bathroom. I need to freshen up, she said, taking out her ponytail and letting her jet black hair fall down on her shoulders. Sarah sighed and followed her into the bathroom, leaning on the doorframe. Sam noticed Sarah's subtle uneasiness in the mirror. Hey, what's the matter with you? Sam asked, taking out a brush and combing it through her long, silky hair. Sarah sighed. I don't know how you do it, Sarah said. Do what? You know, Sarah said, gesturing to the bed. Sam laughed. Have sex? I don't know how you don't. You do it with everybody, Sarah said, more to herself. I do not, Sam protested, spraying a dab of perfume down her cleavage. I do it with Paul. Really? Sarah said, skeptical. Sarah had heard all the rumors at school about Sam's sexual escapades. She worried about her sometimes. What if she got a disease from some guy? What if she got pregnant? She would never forgive herself if she let her best friend ruin her life because she didn't say anything about her many lovers and sexual happenings. Come on, Sarah. You know how guys are. They lie about that all the time. They say that about every girl. They don't say anything about me, Sarah said. That's because you don't have a reputation, Sam replied. I mean, you and Doug have been dating for months, and you've barely kissed him. I have too, Sarah said indignantly. Look, Sarah, I got my reputation in the sixth grade. Don't you think it's time you and Doug... Sam gave Sarah a knowing look. I don't know, Sarah said, clearly uncomfortable about the subject. I mean... What does Paul think about you having sex with a bunch of guys? Sarah asked. Hey, Paul thinks I'm great in bed, so that's where I keep him. Seriously, though, you should try it. It's a lot of fun. Burns calories, too, Samantha said. Sarah sighed again, just wanting to change the subject. So, um, what are the sleeping arrangements? Well, Paul and I are taking this room, and you and Doug can take the room next door, Samantha said, applying some bright red lipstick. She noticed Sarah's displeased expression. Don't worry, they're bunk beds. Samantha rubbed her lips together and turned to Sarah. 
Hey, I don't mean to pressure you. If you don't want to do it, you don't want to do it. Sex is like skydiving. It can be scary at first, and you have to jump without thinking about it. Once you're in, you can't go back, but it's amazing, Samantha explained, leaning against the bathroom counter. Sarah smiled. Thanks, I just don't think Doug would want to do it with a girl like me. Oh, please, he really likes you. I see him look at you the way Paul looks at me. Trust me, he's a guy. He wants it bad. You think so? Sarah's face began to feel hot, and she blushed. Yep, he definitely does. But just let loose and have some fun this weekend, and don't worry about the sex stuff. If you aren't ready, then you aren't ready. She was right, Sarah thought to herself. She would have the time of her life out here. Her and Doug could finally get to have some alone time, and it wouldn't necessarily involve fucking. They could sit on the shore of the lake and talk or go for a hike. It was going to be an amazing weekend, and she needed to stop worrying so much. After all, what was there to worry about? Sex was a lot simpler than people often made it out to be. With anything, there are risks involved, and you should understand those risks and take some responsibility for your actions. Girls like Sam didn't really do that. But who was Sarah to judge? After all, Sam had a lot of sex, but it was at least with Paul and Paul only. She wasn't a homewrecker. There are a lot worse things you can be than someone who enjoys frequent sex. Even casual sex. Sarah hated the stigma against it. Maybe her subconscious mind was somehow buying into it. Maybe that's why she hadn't let Doug go there with her. Maybe it was because they just weren't right for each other. But she knew that wasn't it either. Doug was one of the sweetest people she had ever met. It had to be him. If she was going to do it this weekend, it had to be him. It was now or never, she thought. They would be graduating soon, and she didn't want Doug to be the one that got away. Life was too short to not take too many chances. Life was far too short. Mrs. Jarvis took a long, slow sip of her tea, staring out the window at the rental house. All of the lights were on, and she could hear faint music coming from within. There was no telling what they were all doing in there, Mrs. Jarvis thought to herself. But they are just kids. She did some wild things growing up herself, or at least things that were considered wild in her time. How long are you going to keep spying on those kids? Trish asked, curled up on the sofa with a book. Mrs. Jarvis chuckled. I just hope we're going to be able to get some sleep with them partying all night long. Surely they can't stay up much longer, Trish said. Mrs. Jarvis crossed the room and sat in the armchair. Well, I think I'm going to hit the sack, Trish said, standing and heading for the staircase. Good night, sweetie, Mrs. Jarvis said. Trish leaned down to hug her. Are we still on for tomorrow morning? Yep, once around the lake, Trish replied. All right, check on Tommy and make sure he's in bed. Good night, Mrs. Jarvis said as Trish disappeared up the staircase. Mrs. Jarvis shifted position in the armchair, looking down at the remote on the coffee table. Should she watch the news? She'd just end up spooking herself out of her mind, and Tommy and Trish usually could tell when something was bothering her. Then she'd have to tell them all about the murders, and she didn't want Tommy to be upset. Last time he was scared about something, he would come in around two in the morning and want to sleep with her in bed and she never got a wink of sleep those nights. She thought twice and picked up a magazine, leafing through it. Jason was watching her every move as she yawned, tossed the magazine onto the table, stood up, and headed for the staircase. <coughs> Tommy, are you brushing your teeth? Mrs. Jarvis called, rapping on the bathroom door. Yes! She heard Tommy reply through a mouthful of toothpaste. Okay, I'm going to come tuck you in in a few minutes, she said and walked down the hallway to her bedroom. Tommy spit into the sink, rinsed with a glass of water, and turned off the faucet. He walked out of the bathroom and into his room at the end of the hallway. Tommy's bedroom looked like every sci-fi aficionado's dream. Sci-fi and horror movie posters plastered all over the walls, a few high-tech game consoles next to a computer monitor and processing system on a sturdy desk, action figures lined up in rows on shelves, and about a dozen rubber masks hanging from the ceiling and about a dozen more displayed on a large wooden bookcase by the door. Tommy crossed the room to his bed, and as he climbed in and started to lay his head on the pillow, he caught a glimpse out the open bedroom window. A smile crept across his face as he realized he could see across the yard into the upstairs bedroom of the rental home. It was the tall, slender brunette of the group, and she was standing in front of a mirror brushing her long hair. Tommy felt his heart racing a hundred miles a minute, and his hands began to feel clammy. 
he moved closer to the window, and he cackled with excitement as the girl pulled off her shirt. What was happening? What was so exciting about this? It was just a girl. That was the thing. It was a girl, and for some reason, not comprehensible to his twelve-year-old mind, he was in love. He watched for about a minute, biting his nails in anticipation. Sam was with her, back to the window, watching the door as Paul walked in and they began to kiss. Tommy giggled impishly, struggling to control himself as the adrenaline and other hormones pumped through his system, and blood began to rush to his head and his extremities. He kept watching in silent fascination as Paul reached behind Sam's back and slowly undone her bra. It fell to the ground. Tommy thrashed around in pure delight, kicking his legs up in the air as if he were a wind-up toy, and someone had just wound him up and let him fly. He bounced up and down on the bed with joy and turned back to the window, his eyes wide. Then he heard his mother's footsteps down the hall. In a split second, Tommy dove down onto the bed in a sleeping position and began to make his best fake snoring sound. The bedroom door opened and Mrs. Jarvis crossed the room to the bed where Tommy was curled up under his covers, his eyes tightly shut. She smiled and leaned down to kiss his forehead. She gently tasseled his hair and turned to leave when she saw the cracked window. She went to close it, saw the view, and gasped. Mrs. Jarvis glanced back at Tommy, who was still snoring loud as ever with his eyes shut tight, and she shook her head, chuckling to herself. She sighed, closed the window, and shut the curtains. Nice try, Tommy, she thought to herself. She decided to give him the benefit of the doubt that he hadn't been spying on those kids and just left it alone. After all, she had been spying herself. She admittedly was anxious about all those teenagers. They'd probably be drinking, smoking, having their trash and beer bottles in the yard, and have the whole woods be smelling like dope the next few days. But hey, maybe they were good kids. Maybe Tommy could make some friends and stop being shut in his room making those scary masks, and Trish could meet some friends or maybe a boy. That thought made her even more anxious. It was hard for her to talk about those kinds of things with Trish. But at least she was a girl, and Mrs. Jarvis knew about women. But she didn't know what to say to Tommy, and she didn't feel like admonishing him now. How could she blame him for being curious at that age? Mrs. Jarvis headed for the door, turned out the lights, and left, closing the door behind her. Tommy opened one eye to make sure that she was gone, and sat up quickly in bed looking at the blocked view with disappointment. What was that girl's name again? The one with the black hair that fell around her shoulders. The one with the huge, um, chest. Sam, Tommy thought. That's her name, Sam. Tommy laid back down and shut his eyes, repeating her name over and over in his mind until he fell asleep. So where is this crystal point? Sarah asked, sitting down on the couch beside Doug. My buddy told me all about it. You just take the trail around the lake and it's about half a mile, Paul said, kissing Sam on the neck, who was curled up in his lap in the armchair. The rental house had a bungalow vibe. The main room had two sofas and an armchair facing a television set back in a polished mahogany cabinet, a grand piano, and a dozen paintings and knickknacks. The decor gave it a domestic feel, but it was obvious they were just placed there to make it feel like you weren't just staying in a rental and to allow you to suspend reality for at least a little while. In the corner was a turntable with stacks of vintage records adjacent to either side. The main room was divided into an apartment-sized kitchen complete with old-timey pots and pans, racks, and a dining room. It's supposed to be a lot of fun, Paul continued. He said there's an old tire swing, but he wasn't sure if it was there anymore. Wait, are we swimming? I didn't bring my bathing suit, Samantha said. You know what that means, Paul grinned, deviously nuzzling Sam's neck. Skinny dip! Samantha giggled flirtatiously, but stopped when she saw Sarah's eyes grow wide. Don't you think we shouldn't be skinny dipping when there's a family right next door? Sam said, swatting at Paul. They can join in, <laughs> Paul said, guffawing. Sam rolled her eyes as he kissed her neck playfully. Ted was sitting at the table playing a handheld video game when Jimmy walked into the kitchen, heading to the refrigerator. Have you called Betty? Ted asked. No, Ted, Jimmy sighed with exasperation, grabbing a beer from the bottom shelf. Come on, Jimmy, man, you gotta try to get her back. No, Ted, you know what? I don't, Jimmy retorted, moving towards the table. I've come to realize that you can have a good time without girls. 
Ted looked up from his game and wagged his finger like a scolding mother. That's a sin, you dead fuck. Jimmy pushed his finger away. I really don't want you to call me that anymore. Ted stood up and playfully punched Jimmy in the stomach. Oh, come on, Jimbo. Can't take a joke. He patted him on the shoulder. The computer don't lie. There is no computer, Jim said. Ah, ah, Ted grinned, shaking his head. Jim groaned. And there's no Betty either. Back in the main room, a fire crackled softly in the fireplace, and Paul took a poker and moved the logs around gently. He sat back in the armchair, cuddled up next to Sam. That family seemed nice, Doug said, putting his arm around Sarah. Yeah, that Trish girl was kind of hot, Paul remarked. Sam punched him in the arm. Hey, she exclaimed. What? I wouldn't mind her coming down to hang out with us, that's all. Maybe we can see if she wants to come with us to the lake tomorrow morning, Sarah chimed in, toying with a strand of her hair. We can invite her mother, won't that be nice, Paul joked. Sam hit him again. You are such a pig, she said. Sarah began to think about the idea of all of them skinny dipping. Maybe she could just sit on the dock and read a book or something, but she didn't want to be the only one not joining in. It wasn't that she was insecure about her body, or maybe it was. She had stared at her naked body in the mirror long and hard on several occasions, just to see if she was sexy or not. She really didn't have anything to compare it to, but she thought she looked okay. Only Doug had never seen it before. What if he didn't like it? What if Sam looked better than her? Surely Doug wasn't that shallow, but isn't that how all guys are? All they care about is how a girl looks? Hopefully Doug didn't find the idea too inviting either, and the two of them could go for a walk. She didn't know what she'd do if they all saw her naked. She hardly knew Paul, Jimmy, or Ted. She could completely freak out if anyone saw her so vulnerable like that. She just might die if that happened. She just might die. Stranger in the Woods It was the start of another early morning at Crystal Lake. Mrs. Jarvis and Trish had already gone on their morning jog on the path around the lake. The birds were singing and the sun was shining its pale yellow gleam down through the canopy, casting shadows on the path. The night had left traces of it all over in dewdrops on the ground, and the moon was barely visible behind the thin, wispy clouds. The six teenagers came to a fork in the trail and stopped. Great. Which do we take? Samantha asked Paul, her eyes wide with worry. Paul scanned the map. He held out in front of him. Uh, if I'm reading it right, we take the left, Paul said. He pointed his finger dramatically like an explorer, and the group laughed. They all embarked down the trail, listening to the morning birds singing in the trees and swatting at mosquitoes that were just beginning to come out and feel comfortable in the heat of the day. They were all showered and changed into more comfortable clothes, dressed for an afternoon on the lake shore. The air was just at the right temperature to go swimming, and they had all been stoked to have their little area of the lake all to themselves to do whatever they wanted without anyone watching. Sam and Paul led the way, with Sarah and Doug not far behind. Jimmy and Ted were the last of the group. Ted had a pair of expensive black headphones on. They were hooked up to an expensive new Walkman. Hey, Ted, Jimmy said, his hands in his pocket. Hey, Ted, he said louder, Ted's music drowning out Jimmy's voice. Ted still didn't hear him, and Jimmy started saying what was on his mind anyway. Ted, I think you're right. I, I think I'm going to give Betty a call when we get into town. No, no, calling Betty is definitely a dead fuck thing to do, Ted said. Forgetting his music was at the current volume that it was, his voice sounded abnormally louder as a result, and the group turned to stare at him awkwardly. Ted made a dumb face and then pulled off his headphones as the group continued walking down the trail. You wanted me to call her, Jimmy said. Sometimes a Ted Meister is wrong, Jimbo. I've been thinking. The first rule of love is never get rejected by the same girl twice. That's useless, Ted explained as Jimmy tried to take him seriously. You want to make a fool of yourself? Do it with someone new. I don't know anyone new. Jimmy protested. Well, sex is a great way to meet them, 
Ted said, and plugged his headphones back in. Just then they all heard the spinning of wheels coming down the trail behind them, and high-pitched laughing. They all whirled around except Ted, whose head was bobbing to the music coming through his headphones. Jimmy's eyes grew wide and he spun Ted around, whose jaw dropped and he let his headphones fall and dangle from his pocket. Two girls on bicycles came careening down to the trail and as they saw the sixteens, they came to a stop and both hopped off their vehicles. Wow, Jimmy muttered more to himself than anyone. Was he seeing double? No, there were two of them and they looked exactly alike. Twins. And they were drop-dead gorgeous. Long, slender legs accentuated by tight spandex running shorts. Their ample chest visible through a tank top and a sports bra. And long chestnut hair falling around their shoulders. Sorry, one of the girls said. We almost ran into you guys. Oh, that's okay, Paul said, cutting through the group and extending his hand. I'm Paul. He shook both of their hands as they smiled. Sam caught the one on the left winking at him and scowled. Ted, nice to meet ya, Ted introduced himself. Jimmy just stood there in awe, his mouth watering. Hi, I'm Tina and this is Terry, the girl on the left said with a pearly white smile. The girl on the right waved. Terry was slightly taller than Tina with darker, slightly longer hair. Still, it was nearly impossible to tell them apart, but none of the guys in the group seemed to care. Ah, uh, you, you girls live around here? Jimmy stuttered nervously. They both nodded. How much further is Crystal Point? Hey, Paul asked. That's where we're going, T Tina said. Yeah, it's a long walk from here, Terry said. We can take it, Ted said, flashing his millionaire smile. You want to join us? Paul asked. The twins looked at each other and smiled. Sure, they said in unison. Lead the way, Paul said, ushering them to the front. Jimmy felt his knees buckling. Twins, he said to Ted, who nodded in agreement, both of their eyes wide and grinning ear to ear. Two of them. Yep, and two for us. They followed the group eagerly, but Sarah stayed behind, pulling Doug off to the side. I think I'm going to head back to the car, she said. Are you sure? Doug asked. Yeah, I think I forgot something. I'll meet you guys there she said, and walked off down the trail. She was sure she left her book that she had planned to read lying on the seat, and she needed something to do down at the lake. God, they were going to be skinny dipping, and she just knew that Sam was going to try to make her jump in. She felt the nervous pit in her gut as she strolled down the trail to the car. Of course, all she had to do was just say no. She didn't feel like swimming anyway. Just tell them your stomach was upset. All she wanted to do was sit on the shore and relax in the summer weather and sunbathe. She didn't care that the others were skinny dipping, but she didn't want to do it. She didn't have to. There were people she didn't know, and they just invited some random strangers to swim with them. No way was she taking her clothes off in front of the double mint twins. It just wasn't going to happen. Suddenly, she stopped. A twig snapped. Somewhere in the woods on either side of her, she turned, slowing down and trying to listen. It was probably just a squirrel. She shot another wary glance at the winding trail behind her and kept walking. There, she heard it again. A rustle in the bushes. She turned again to look behind her and scan the dense underbrush. Someone was there. It was probably just Sam trying to scare her like she always did, or maybe Ted joking around. She stood for a moment, slowly backing away down the trail as she listened but the woods were all quiet except for the chirping of birds in the trees. Suddenly there was a sharp throbbing pain in her side, and she cried out as she felt the splintered end of the tree branch jam into her ribcage. She spun around and saw what she had backed into, the broken end of a log protruding onto the path. She had backed right into it. She laughed sheepishly. What was wrong with her? Why was she letting the skinny-dipping thing get to her? And the sex thing? Worrying about all this is making you go crazy, she told herself. Just relax. Don't do anything you aren't comfortable with doing. It's as simple as that. God, she thought. She could have backed off a cliff or fell off the trail somehow and hurt herself, all because she was hearing noises in the woods. Maybe it was because it was Friday the 13th tomorrow. She remembered what Sam had said on the way up. Friday the 13th. Looks like it won't be such bad luck after all, she had said and she was starting to think Sam was wrong. 
maybe there was something to this Friday the 13th thing because this weekend was turning out to be a disaster. She didn't even know two of these people and now there were two more random people, two gorgeous women, who could probably still dug away with one single glance and now they were all going skinny dipping without her. To make matters worse, she was now almost getting herself impelled and getting nervous over nothing. She couldn't win. She would either have to strip and dip or feel lousy that she was missing out, and it was all her own fault. Why had her parents sheltered her? You couldn't do that to your kids because eventually they would see the real world for what it truly was and wouldn't know how to handle it. It would be too overwhelming. You have to expose them gradually and eventually let them experience the world fully and immerse themselves in it and learn from it. You couldn't shelter them or else you risk having a child that is behind all of his or her peers. And now here she was in that exact situation. She had always been the mature one in school, as called by her teachers, but she was starting to realize that it was actually just emotional repression. All of the kids who were acting out were actually dealing with their emotions. Maybe not in healthy ways, but they were still dealing with them. All she did was push her emotions down, and that made her seem quiet and mature. In reality, she just wasn't connecting with anyone. She was just observing silently in her own little world. Her parents hadn't made it any better. They supported the notion that it was bad to want to take risk and live a little dangerously sometimes. How could she blame them? They had also been sheltered. It was 1984 and the internet was just now barely starting to come into the picture, so it was a little easier to expose yourself to information. But in the 40s, when her parents grew up, it was probably that much harder. Low education and ignorance was probably rampant. All human beings want to live a little eventually. You couldn't hold them back for very long or else they would have to break free or repress it until they hate themselves. This weekend had been a chance for her to live a little and leave all that shit behind her. But it was getting harder and harder to just let loose. Just calm down, she thought. Stop overthinking. Maybe she didn't have to take off her clothes to have a good time. These next few days could be fun and relaxing, and she just had to allow it to happen. Or else she was going to end up ruining everyone's mood by freaking out or scaring herself to death. What could go wrong? Cannonball! Paul yelled, pulling back on the tire swing and leaping on, jumping off and curling up his legs just as the tire started to swing back to the shore and landing in the water with a resounding splash. Crystal Point was a small sandy beach on the north side of the lake, marked by a huge boulder jutting out into the middle of the water. A weathered dock stuck out into the lake and a few old canoes were resting on the shore. A makeshift tire swing hung from the gnarled branch of an oak tree that hung over the shallow part of the lake. Tina was next, leaping onto the tire swing and catapulting off into the water with a huge splash. Terry came after her and then Sam, who both landed in the water as Paul held up imaginary signs, pretending to judge their dives. Sarah was lying on a towel on the dock beside Doug, and Jimmy and Ted were standing on the shore awkwardly, still in awe of the two gorgeous girls they now had at their disposal. "'Come on in!' Tina called to Ted and Jimmy. Jimmy laughed nervously. "'Uh, no, no thanks, we haven't got our suits.' Skinny dip, Paul shouted as he reached down into the water, pulled off his trunks, and threw them onto the shore. Sam squealed with excitement and took off her bikini top and bottoms, tossing them onto the shore. Tina and Terry both did the same. What the hell are we doing? Ted said, his face lighting up with excitement. He threw off his shirt and pulled down his pants and shorts simultaneously, running towards the wa water bearing it all. Paul and Sam both cheered as Ted dove into the water head first. Come on, Jim, Paul said. Jimmy couldn't believe he was about to do it. Fuck it, he thought. He unbuttoned his shirt and pulled down his pants and shorts, tossed them into a pile beside a stump and ran into the water. Doug looked at the group splashing and having a blast in the water and frowned. Hey, I'm going to take a quick dip, he said. He didn't give Sarah time to reply. He cannonballed into the water and exchanged a high five with Paul. Sarah sighed and sat up on the dock picking up the book she had brought and flipping to her bookmark. Suit yourself, she said glumly. Samantha Dog paddled through the murky water towards Sarah and raised the upper half of her body onto the dock. Come on, Sarah, strip and dip, Sam urged. No, Sarah said uneasily. Sarah, let's see what you got. Come on. Sam, I said no. 
Fine, then I'm going to stay under until you do, Sam said, mock angrily. She pinched her nose and disappeared under the surface of the water. Sarah turned away from her nonchalantly and shrugged. Fine, see you later. It was another one of Sam's stupid ploys to get Sarah to do something she was completely uncomfortable with doing. After a minute or two of being underwater, she would realize that she couldn't hold her breath that long and would be forced to come back to the surface. She was just going to have to stay under there all day because there was no way she was taking her clothes off, especially not in front of all these people she didn't even know. It was just a matter of time before Sam would come up to the surface, groan in annoyance, and swim back to her friends. But 30 seconds had already passed and then a minute. No sign of Sam. No splashing. Sarah turned around to the spot where Sam went under, and there was no sign of her. No bubbles were rising to the surface. She had disappeared. Sarah shook her head and laughed to herself. How much longer was she going to keep this up, Sarah thought. There was no way she could hold her breath for that long. Then another minute passed and Sarah bit her lip nervously. She turned back towards the water and scanned the surface for Sam. She was nowhere to be seen. She checked both sides of the dock for her friend, but she was gone. Did she swim back to the group? No, she didn't. Sarah counted for everyone except for Sam. Was she still underwater? What if she got stuck? What if her foot got caught in something and she was running out of air? Sam? Sarah called her eyes wide with worry. She couldn't hold her breath this long. Something was very wrong. Sam! Sam! Sarah screamed, beginning to panic. Just then, Sam's lifeless form came floating out from underneath the dock. Her eyes had rolled back in her head, and her tongue hung from the side of her mouth. Oh my god, Sarah thought. She's dead. Sam is dead. Just as Sarah began to lose her mind with terror, Samantha came to life and lunged out of the lake, grabbed Sarah by both of her shoulders, and pulled her off the pier into the water with a splash. Sam burst out laughing as Sarah thrashed around in the water. She finally regained her composure, finding her footing on the sandy bottom of the lake. She tossed her wet hair out of her eyes and splashed Sam angrily. You bitch! Sarah exclaimed as Samantha laughed hysterically. The anger didn't last long as Sarah began to laugh along with Sam, who splashed around with her playfully. The teens continued laughing and splashing each other for the next half an hour, not once seeing the man standing in the shelter of the trees just a few yards down the shoreline, watching them, feeling the intense hatred for their youth and their carelessness burn brighter with every laugh, with every shout and cry. He felt it growing stronger. It was Friday the 13th, a new dawn on Crystal Lake, a new nightmare. The massacre at Crystal Lake wasn't over. It continued tonight. Tonight, they would see what pain and suffering felt like. They would feel what the man in the tattered work suit watching them had felt when he drowned in the very lake they were enjoying. They hadn't been watching him. They only wanted to satisfy their own filthy, loathsome needs. It was the same suffering he felt when he watched his own mother, the only one who ever cared about him enough to kill for him, be murdered by one of them. Repulsive teenagers who only sought physical pleasure, and rescinded all other priorities. They had to be stopped. They all had to die before anyone else's life could be ruined. Ripped from him in an instant. They would all get what's coming to them. What they stole from Jason, they would return with their lives. Jason gripped the knife tighter. The thought of the bloody atonement filling him with immeasurable satisfaction. They would learn why Friday the 13th at Crystal Lake was a day to be feared. Chapter 5 Mom sure has been jumpy lately, Trish said to Tommy, sitting in the passenger seat, as she pulled the station wagon off the paved road onto the narrow dirt road that led to Crystal Lake. The old junkyard scrap of a car sputtered down the road, the sun shining down through the branches casting shadows that danced across the windshield. Yeah, I guess, Tommy said, petting Gordon who stuck his head between the two from the back seat. Trish wondered if it was a midlife crisis. She was getting to that age. The age where you look back on life and question every decision you had ever made. 
and wonder how you ever got to where you were and why you didn't take that one opportunity in college. That age scared the hell out of Trish. She wanted to go off to college and become a nurse, but with being homeschooled for a large part of her life, she feared that it would be too overwhelming being thrown into a huge university with thousands of new people to meet. Maybe she could attend one of those smaller two-year community colleges and take basic classes and then transfer to a larger four-year college to get her degree. Then she could come back home until she got a job and made enough money to move out and maybe find someone to settle down with, squeeze out a few kids, and make a life for herself. Was that the life that she wanted? She had no idea. All she knew is that she had to get out of this town. Trish broke out of her thoughts when she heard shouting and joyous cries coming through the open rear window and saw the teenager's car parked on the side of the road. The shouting was coming from the lake. Gordon began to bark excitedly, and as Trish slowed down, squinting to see the lake through the trees, Gordon suddenly bounded through the open car window and disappeared into the woods. "'Gordon, wait!' Tommy called. "'Oh no, Gordon!' Trish exclaimed, bringing the car to an abrupt halt. Before Trish could think of what to do next, Tommy jumped out of the passenger seat, not closing the door behind him, and ran off into the woods after the dog. "'Tommy!' Trish cried, and ran out of the car after him. Gordon bounded down the trail towards the lake, finally coming to a stop on the shore and barking excitedly at the throng of teenagers. "'Hey, look, it's Gordon!' Paul shouted. Tommy came next, stumbling down the hillside and stopped dead in his tracks beside Gordon. He looked out at the lake and his mouth dropped. The first thing he saw was the clothing littered all over the ground. Bras, panties, shirts, shorts, and shoes were scattered everywhere. He'd never heard of such a thing. Swimming naked? He thought that was only something people did in the movies. And then he saw Samantha come rising out of the water just enough to catch a glimpse of her breast, and he felt his knees turn to jelly and the tingling feeling in his stomach. He had the urge to look away and to shield his eyes, but his twelve-year-old boy mind wouldn't let him. Oh my God, Trish thought, as she came running down the hillside, the realization hitting her. She didn't even know anyone actually skinny dipped. She thought it was just a thing someone talked about doing to sound cool. She was more naive than she had ever thought. Before Tommy could try to say something or pretend like he hadn't seen anything, Trish grabbed him firmly by both shoulders and spun him around. Tommy, turn around right now! Tommy tried to twist back towards the lake, but she held him in place. Turn around, she ordered. Hey, Trish! Come on in, Trish, Paul called, gesturing her towards the water. She laughed nervously, trying to think of an excuse. No, I think I'm overdressed, she said. It was the best thing she could think of. She didn't want them to see her face glowing bright red. Bye! She began to push Tommy back towards the trail her other hand grabbing Gordon by the collar. "'Party tonight, Trish! Hope to see you there!' Paul yelled. "'Come on, Gordon. We're too young for this,' Tommy sighed, walking with Trish towards the trail. Trish couldn't stop blushing the entire walk back to the car. "'Some pack of patooties, huh?' Tommy said as they drove down the dirt road towards the house. Tommy, Trish said, flashing him a glare. She could just see the look on her mother's face when she told her that the kids next door had been skinny dipping and she caught Tommy looking. That was just it. She wasn't planning on telling her. She may have a firm talk with Tommy herself later tonight about how spying on people was wrong and maybe have the talk with him about girls. That's one of the reasons she wished her dad was still around. If she told Mrs. Jarvis about the whole ordeal, she would go ballistic. Mr. Jarvis would have calmly set Tommy down and gave him the old birds and the bees talk. Trish certainly wasn't good at relationships and the opposite sex herself. So what could she say? What advice could she possibly give? She hadn't been in a relationship since middle school, and all her mom would do was give Tommy an hour-long lecture and ground him from all of his video games. She remembered the glazed-over look in his eyes when they introduced themselves to those kids last night. Puberty was hitting him like a truck. Had she been that boy crazy when she hit puberty? She didn't think so. All she could remember was learning about her period and about things called tampons and why she would wake up covered in blood every now and then. 
and Trish was only 17. She was still going through the tail end of puberty as well. She barely knew anything about sex, only what she had managed to read about in magazines and from vague descriptions from her mom. She had no idea what to say to Tommy, so she just decided to keep quiet the rest of the ride home. What could she say? She hadn't even had a boyfriend since the fourth grade, and then it's not anything real. She really hadn't had a real relationship. There was nothing she could say to Tommy to get him to understand, but even she didn't understand it all that well. Plus, if she told her mom they had been skinny dipping, she didn't know how she would take it. She'd probably report them and get them kicked out by the landlord. And then, no party, and Trish wouldn't have even got to meet them all that well. It wouldn't hurt to go over and hang out for at least a little while. What was wrong with trying to be a normal teenager for once? Why couldn't her mother just lighten up? Maybe with Dad gone, she felt pressure to be the strict one and to be the one wearing the pants. Maybe her mom was just lonely and needed to get laid. It wouldn't kill Mom to get out and make some friends, Trish thought. She had been the one to opt to move to Crystal Lake, after all, but Trish figured she hadn't anticipated the townsfolk to be so aloof. It was like the land around them was cursed. People gave her funny looks when she mentioned that she lived out on the lake. It was almost like anyone who dared come out to the lake was some kind of lunatic. But of course, it made sense with all the stories she had heard. Awful stuff had happened out here, according to the locals. But then again, small towns always engage in hearsay and rumors that eventually get out of hand. Camp Blood, the locals would say. You actually live out by Camp Blood? Whatever had happened, if it had happened, had really spooked them and turned them into a very superstitious bunch. At least these kids renting the vacation home seemed fairly normal, and it was probably because they weren't from Crystal Lake. Trish was broken out of her thoughts for the second time by the car's engine jolting sputtering noisily and slowing to a stop. Another raucous clattering came from the engine, and then the car stalled. Great, what's next? Trish exclaimed. I'll take a look, Tommy said, climbing out of the car and walking around to the hood. One of the things their dad did manage to do is teach Tommy all about cars. At five, he was walking around talking about carburetors and fan belts, and by the time he was ten, he could replace a flat tire. Tommy popped open the hood and stuck his head into the engine compartment. Can you fix it? Trish asked after about a minute of silence. Tommy stuck his head from behind the open hood. I need a screwdriver, he said. There may be one in the trunk, she replied, handing him the keys. He walked around the trunk, unlocked it, and popped it open, scanning the cluttered interior. No, no screwdriver, Trish sighed. Oh, great, looks like we're walking. You guys need some help, said a voice. Trish turned her head to the passenger side window and gasped with fright as she saw a stranger leaning into the car. He was a tall, rugged man in his early twenties with a head of wavy black hair, a young, scrub-clean face, and wearing a flannel shirt, jeans, and hiking boots. He carried a big travel duffel bag and a rolled-up sleeping bag that was slung over his right shoulder. He looked like he could be on one of those survivalist shows. Hi, I'm Rob Dyer. Sorry, didn't mean to scare you, he said with a warm, apologetic expression. Trish stepped out of the car apprehensively and waited for him to walk around to her side. He extended his hand. Hello, I'm Trish Jarvis, and this is my brother Tommy, she said, hesitant about introducing herself to a random man who approached them in the woods, but he seemed friendly enough. What seems to be the problem, he asked. It won't start, Trish said, gesturing to the car. Rob pulled off his backpack, set it on the roof of the car, and rubbed his hands together. Let's see what I can do. Get in, give it a crank when I tell you. Trish nodded in response and climbed into the driver's seat. Rob bent down underneath the hood and reached a hand down behind the engine. I, I think the problem is the celluloid, but we don't have a screwdriver to fix it, Tommy said. Rob whipped out a bowie knife and gave Tommy a look. He placed it strategically between two wires, creating a shower of sparks. Try it now, he said. Trish twisted the key in the ignition, and the car roared to life. With a relieved sigh, she leaned her head out the window. You need a lift? Rob shrugged. Sure, why not? Uh, where are you headed? Back to the house. We live right down the road. You can have dinner with us, Trish said, smiling. Her mother probably wouldn't appreciate a random stranger joining in on their family meal, but after he saved them the good 15-minute walk in the summer heat, it would have been to the house, 
It was the least she could do. Sounds fantastic, Rob said and grabbed his backpack. He climbed into the passenger seat as Tommy slid into the back seat beside Gordon, and Trish started off down the road. I didn't think anyone lived this deep in the woods, Rob said. We do, Trish replied. What are you doing out here in our neck of the woods? Hunting for bear, he said. You can't be hunting for bear, Tommy said with a frown. Rob changed the subject hurriedly. Uh, uh, are there any kids around here? Vacationers, people like that? Rob asked. Yeah, a bunch of kids moved in yesterday right next door to us. How far is Crystal Lake from here? Rob asked. Oh, we live on the lake. Really? Great, that's where I'm headed. The trees cleared as the Jarvis house came into view, perched on a small slope. The rental house in view a few hundred yards away, a narrow dirt path between the two. Trish pulled the car to a stop in front of the house and parked. Here we are, Trish said. Thanks for the lift, Rob said. Are you going to come in? Trish asked. If her mother had a problem with it, she could get over it. Maybe she finally had a friend. No, I don't think I can, Rob replied, looking towards the lake. Oh, you've got to come in, Tommy chimed in from the back seat. There's something real neat I want to show you up in my room. As the three began to walk towards the house, Trish began to grow worried. Should she be taking this complete stranger into her house? She didn't know where he was from or what he was doing out here in the middle of nowhere. After all, he said he was hunting for bear and there weren't any bears in this part of the country. What could go wrong? He seemed like a nice guy and he looked like he needed a quick shower and some food. Her mother should be glad to do such a hospitable thing as helping him on his way. It was the least they could do for him starting up their car for them. Maybe he just didn't know that there weren't any bears in this part of the country. Yeah, that had to be it. Rob, Trish, and Tommy got out of the car and walked up to the front porch as Mrs. Jarvis opened the front door. Her eyebrows furrowed with confusion, and she looked to Trish with a who-the-hell-is-this look. Mom, this is Rob, she said, gesturing to Rob. Rob, this is my mother. Rob extended his hand and gave the best polite smile. Hi, uh, Rob Dyer, nice to meet you, Mrs. Jarvis, her mother said, shaking his hand nervously. Come on, Rob, you gotta see my room, Tommy exclaimed, dragging Rob into the house and up the staircase by the hand like a dog on a leash. Trish stepped into the house, closed the door, and as she turned around, she was greeted by the same look from her mother. Who's your friend? She asked before Trish could utter a word. He's a guy we picked up. He fixed our car. I thought he could have dinner with us, she answered. Mrs. Jarvis looked bewildered. Okay, well, I guess I'll start fixing it, she said, looking nervously towards the staircase and heading for the kitchen. Trish let out a deep breath. She took that surprisingly well. Maybe she was just in a good mood. Normally, she would have pulled her aside and gave her a stern talk and probably forced her guests to leave. Upstairs, Tommy pushed open the door to his room, and Rob's jaw dropped in astonishment at the assortment of masks hanging from the ceiling. The room was some amalgamation of sci-fi conventions and horror movie sets, complete with posters and memorabilia of all different forms. Rob toyed with the one of the action figures on the bookshelf, taking it all in as Tommy stood in the middle of the room, his hands on his hips, proud of his work. Cool, huh? he said. Amazing, Rob muttered, spinning one of his masks around on its string. Hold on, hold on, here's my latest mask, Tommy said, lifting up a large head made of foam. He put it on his head, and his hand operated a remote. It was a Planet of the Apes-esque monkey head replica, complete with an open mouth full of razor-sharp fangs. Each time Tommy pushed a varying order of buttons on the remote, the mask would move and contort to resemble realistic facial motions. The mechanisms rippled underneath the leathery layer of artificial skin. Rawr! Tommy made the best guttural monster sound he could. Wait, you made this? Rob asked, dumbfounded. Yeah, Tommy replied, taking off the mask. You're talented, kid, Rob said, studying each of the masks. It was better than anything he could have ever done. They all looked so realistic, so professional, like something right out of a Hollywood studio. Thanks, Tommy said. As Rob glanced out the window, he saw the rental house on the opposite side of the clearing, and the car sitting out front. It was perfect. 
He could stay here and keep an eye on those kids at the same time. He was looking for someone, and those kids would lead him straight to that someone that he had been hunting for the past four days. Tonight, Rob had business to attend to. Midnight Swim Nighttime had fallen over Crystal Lake. The moon set low in the sky, glowing like a beacon just above the top of the wall of pine trees that surrounded the lake, its reflection shimmering on the surface of the water. It seemed as though nothing could disturb the eerie peace of the slowly approaching darkness. The only other sounds were the chirping of crickets, the soft approach of thunder in the distance, and the faint music coming from inside the rental house. The teenagers' get-together was just kicking off. The guys had gone into town and picked up tons of food and beer while the girls stayed to spruce the place up a bit. The girls all showered and changed into party dresses and more comfortable attire from their time at the lake. And the guys were in their best shirts and slacks. Ted had searched through the stacks of vintage records and picked out a few selections for the music. Love is a Lie by Lion was blaring through the turntable. Jimmy popped the collar of his blue suede shirt and leaned against the doorframe, watching Doug and Sarah curled up on the sofa and Sam and Paul making out on the staircase, and sighed heavily. Tina and Terry were on the other sofa, whispering excitedly and giggling at him. Just ask one of them to dance, Jimmy urged himself. He watched nervously, trying and not succeeding to act nonchalant as he paced back and forth around the room checking his hair in the mirror as he walked by. Damn Ted and his bullshit, he thought. They had made a bet when they were out getting beer that he could get one of the twins in bed before Ted. Jimmy was starting to fear he might lose twenty bucks. Damn you, Ted. Damn you for putting this dead fuck thing in my head, he thought. Now he was having all kinds of doubts. What if she laughed in his face? What if everyone would get laid at this party tonight except for him? What if Ted was right? What if he actually was hopeless in bed and truly a dead fuck? He just needed a little confidence, he thought to himself, puffing out his chest suddenly. His dad had always told him as long as you were confident and being yourself, no girl could resist. Maybe it was finally time to start listening to someone else rather than Ted. After all, what the hell did Ted know? He wasn't even dating anyone. He never held down a girl for more than a few weeks at the most. He always claimed that he couldn't be wasting his time being tied down to one girl, that he was always on the move and on the lookout for new sex and for new experiences. Then again, Ted was not the guy to go to for love advice. How to get laid quick? Sure, but not for true advice on love and women. Jimmy eventually wanted something real, and Ted wouldn't know real if it hit him in the face. But now he didn't care about anything real and he was hornier than ever. He finally took a deep breath and walked casually over towards the couch. Would either of you care to dance? He asked the twins, extending his hand. Terry looked at Tina with a coy smile and then back at Jimmy. To this song? She asked, hearing the boisterous rock music coming through the turntable in the corner. This, this is good. Jimmy said. Terry hesitated. Sure, she said and took his hand. Jimmy led her to the center of the room and they both began moving to the beat. Terry couldn't help but snicker at his awkward but endearing dancing. He was honestly kind of cute, but as she glanced over at Doug and Sarah, she felt herself getting sick with envy. Doug could do so much better than her, she thought, yet here she was settling for Jimmy. Then again, the night was still young. If everyone would loosen up a little and maybe get a little hammered, then this party just may get more interesting. Maybe the boys would come to their senses and figure out that they were the only girls worth screwing tonight. God, that was real bitchy of me, Terry thought to herself. She couldn't help it. At Crystal Lake High, her and Tina were always the hottest and most popular girls in any party. And parties in Crystal Lake weren't that hard to come by if you knew just how boring of a town it truly was. At Crystal Lake High... Both of them had to swat guys off like flies drawn to flypaper. Everywhere they went, they were always being hit on, either by the football coach or the creepy guy that was always hanging out and asking for money down at the old gas station. 
and now the two hottest guys at the party were taken by a total sleaze and a flat-chested nobody. The only other two guys to fuck was Jimmy and his spastic dancing, and the total Elvis wannabe who had walked into the living room and was now drooling all over Tina. Come on, give the old teddy bear a kiss, Ted said into Tina's ear, and she pushed him away. He held up a teddy bear he had grabbed off the curio cabinet and held it up to her, kissing her with it, and then he tossed the teddy bear aside, brought his lips up to hers, and pressed hard. Tina turned her head as his wet lips made their way across her cheek and onto her neck. She managed to push him away, and a tight smile formed across her lips. I need another drink, she said, her eyes glaring at him. She gave Terry a glance, stood up, and walked into the kitchen as Ted slumped on the couch rejected. Terry kept dancing to the turntable with Jimmy, who was still thrashing wildly in an attempt to impress her, and it wasn't working all that well. Then again, he was sort of cute, and he wouldn't be the ugliest guy she had had sex with. Maybe I can pull that bimbo off of Paul and take him upstairs and show him what sex with a real woman is like, Terry thought. She hated to think things like that, but she couldn't help herself when Paul looked the way he did. His wavy dark hair and his tan skin was almost too much to bear. He was way hotter than any guys from Crystal Lake. I am such a bitch, she thought again. That was always how hard it had been her entire life. That's how they were known around Crystal Lake High. Tina was the slut. Terry was the bitch. At least Terry got along with her sister for the most part. Terry had always been a mother to Tina, even though she was only about five seconds older. She made sure that she was being safe, having sex responsibly, and not risking getting STDs or worse, getting pregnant. Their mom died when they were little, and so all they had was their dad, who just sat around the house for the better part of his day, knocking back bottles of scotch and cigars and cursing at them every chance he got. Sure, maybe she wouldn't be as much of a bitch if she didn't have to deal with all the anger inside at her asshole of a dad, but what could she do? Everybody dealt with their demons in their own way. She dealt with them with bitchiness, and Tina dealt with her frustration by fucking every guy she met. Just then, the loud rock music died, and Frank Sinatra's soft jazz rendition of Tangerine began to play. Hey, why'd you change it? Jimmy asked Paul, who was switching out the records at the turntable. Relax, Jimbo. Your girl's gonna love this one, Paul said, and walked over to Samantha, who wrapped her arms around his waist and gently swayed with him burying her head in his chest. Jimmy glanced awkwardly at Terry and laughed, offering her a slow dance. Why not, she said, and wrapped her arms around his neck as they began to slowly sway from side to side. Tina watched broodingly, staring at Paul and Samantha slow dancing by the turntable and frowned. I could have him falling all over me, Tina thought. Sam whispered something into Paul's ear and suddenly took off for the kitchen, leaving him alone. Now was her chance. That Selma Hayek wannabe is way over her head, she thought. What he needs is a woman, not a girl. Tina took a quick glance into the mirror on the wall, fixed her hair and checked her teeth, and walked over to Paul seductively, putting on her best sexy look. You like this stuff? she asked about the soft jazz, humming through the brass phone of the record player. Yeah, he said. You like slow dancing? she asked flirtatiously, pushing up closer to him. Samantha walked back into the room, holding a beer. She saw Tina and Paul by the record player, and her eyes narrowed. What did that bitch think she was doing, Sam thought, seeing the glazed look in her eye as she stared up at Paul. It was the same look she gave Paul whenever she wanted to get it on with him. Samantha made a wry face and hurried over, stepping in front of Tina and throwing her hands around Paul's neck dramatically. Kiss me, you fool! She exclaimed, a la olive oil. Paul yanked her into his arms. Certainly, he exclaimed, imitating Popeye, and kissed her playfully, resulting in loud, high-pitched laughter from Sam, who snuck Tina a dirty glare out of the corner of her eye. Tina gave her an equally nasty look back and sauntered over to Ted sitting on the couch. Want to dance? She asked reluctantly. Maybe seeing her with Ted would make Paul jealous, and he'd finally see what she could do for him. Ted jumped to his feet like a dog hearing his name. Let Teddy Bear show you how it's done, Ted said. And the night went on, everyone oblivious to the man in the hockey mask, right outside the window, watching them. <coughs> 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 
Trish and Rob stepped out of the front door and closed it, embracing the warm brush of the night breeze coming in from the lake and listening to the soft singing of crickets and owls hooting in the trees. Well, your mother's an amazing cook, Rob said, lifting his backpack higher on his shoulder. Yeah, since our dad's not around, she had to adapt. She used to hate it, Trish answered, walking down the path towards the road with him. So, it's just the three of you out here? Rob asked. Yeah, my parents are separated. You know, middle-aged crazy, Trish sighed. I kind of hope that they get back together. I hope so, too, Rob said sympathetically. There was a moment of awkward silence as his eyes met hers, and she felt herself blushing. Say something, Trish prodded herself. Don't just walk in silence. Um, looks like another rainy one, she said, staring up at the dark clouds that were beginning to cover the stars. Nice going, she thought, real smooth. Yeah, he replied, glancing at the sky. They both heard the low rumble of thunder approaching and stared out into the night. Trish glanced at him out of the corner of her eye and noticed his hard stare, as if his eyes were transfixed on something out there in the woods, watching them. What was his deal? There had to be something that he wasn't telling her. His gaze was always out of focus, as if his mind was constantly elsewhere, and at the dinner table, he had dodged their questions and kept glancing out the window and avoiding eye contact. Something was definitely bothering him, and she wanted to know what. Why did he have to be so alluring? It was something about the years that he had had on her. She had never had a thing for older men, but now she just couldn't help herself with him. She was definitely physically attracted to him. But then again, she also found him psychologically captivating too. He was stoic and mysterious. But she could tell there was probably a much softer side of him in the way that he looked at her. It was like he was trying to tell her something important, but never doing it. What was he hiding? She decided not to pry she glanced out at the night and then back at Rob. Listen, if it ever gets too bad out there, or you just need to take a shower, we're always at home, and if we're not, Tommy usually leaves the door open, Trish said. If anything happened out there, she wanted him to know that he had a place to come for help. Rob nodded in understanding. Just stay on the trail. It, it leads around the lake, Trish explained, pointing off down the path. Thanks, he said. Without warning, he leaned down and kissed her on the cheek, and after a soft brush of his hands on hers, he walked off into the night towards the lake. Trish watched him leave, feeling her heart flutter and the flesh of her cheeks turning beet red. He was definitely older than her, probably in his late twenties, but her parents had been ten years apart, and when did age become some kind of impossible barrier to overcome? As she walked back towards the house, she began to wonder about his body picturing him naked under those dirty clothes, imagining the feeling of his warm body on hers, moving with her, inside her. What are you doing, Trish? She thought. You picked this guy up on the road in your car, and now you were having fantasies about him? You're being ridiculous, she laughed at herself. She was actually fawning over a guy much older than her that she had just met who could be some kind of maniac. That's what happens, Mom, when you keep your daughter cooped up for so long. She gets so damn horny that she wants to have wild sex with every strange man that she runs into in the woods. But something about him was so mysterious and alluring. She also couldn't stop thinking about why he was out here. He had blatantly lied when he had told Tommy and her that he was hunting bear. At the dinner table, he had also changed his story and said that he was doing a survey of the lake's wildlife after Tommy hammered him about there being no bears at Crystal Lake. What in the world was he really doing out here? It wasn't often that she saw people camping here, especially with how the locals felt about the lake. Then again, Rob didn't seem like the woodsman type when it came down to it. He was carrying all the right equipment with his thick flannel shirt, jeans, and hiking boots, and his gigantic knapsack, and the knife and the leather sheath on his belt, but his personality didn't fit. He seemed like too much of a city boy. He was probably just out here for a vacation, but why the wild stories about bears? She didn't know, but she had an uneasy feeling about him. Trish walked back inside the house and closed the door. She went through the living room and into the kitchen where Mrs. Jarvis was at the kitchen sink, scrubbing a casserole dish clean. Well, he was nice, Mrs. Jarvis said, seeing Trish out of the corner of her eye. But promise me you won't bring home any more strangers. Trish smiled. I promise. But he did get the car fixed, she said, sitting on a bar stool. 
You did a nice thing, but he could have been a maniac, Mrs. Jarvis said. She turned to Trish, hesitated, and then said, I just want you and Tommy to be safe. I know, but Trish started to say, No, just listen, Mrs. Jarvis interrupted, her eyes filled with concern. There's something I haven't told you and Tommy because I didn't want you to be scared, but there's some bad stuff going on. What? Trish asked, her voice sounding worried. Mrs. Jarvis hesitated longer, deciding whether or not to tell her about the murders. Some kids got killed up near the camp, she finally said. Trish's eyes widened. The news said it was bad. They were killed by a psycho living in the woods. You see how unsafe it can be to just let someone into our home? Oh, I'm sorry, I had no idea. Did they catch him? Trish asked. He's dead. They killed him. But it just goes to show that you can't trust people nowadays. Some people are really sick, Mrs. Jarvis said. Had Trish heard her mother right? Killed? As in murdered? She shuddered down to the soles of her feet. Just be careful, all right, her mother said, interrupting her thoughts. Trish nodded after a pause. I will... How you doing with Terry? Ted asked Jimmy, who was leaning against the kitchen counter. Jimmy didn't answer, pretending to ignore him and staring sadly into his beer. Nowhere, huh? Ted said, shaking his head. She hates me, Ted, Jimmy said morosely. Look, Jimbo, you gotta warm her up first. I don't need any of your advice, Ted, Jimmy rebuffed. Look, just do what I do, Ted started to say. Jimmy watched as Ted stuck his hand in his pants, unzipped his zipper with the other, and stuck his pointer finger through the zipper of his jeans, wagging it at Jimmy. Now don't be such a dead fuck, Ted said, guffawing with laughter at his own joke. Jimmy slammed his hand on the counter. Look, Ted, I told you I didn't like that. Besides... You have the hot one of the two, Jimmy sighed with frustration. His eyes grew wide as Tina stepped into the room. Ted still had his hand in his pants, his finger poking through his open zipper, cracking up at his charade, not noticing Tina standing there with a wry look on her face. Jimmy swatted him and Ted turned to see Tina standing in the doorway. Ted laughed nervously. Uh, hiya, he said, waving with his hand that was poking through his zipper. He thinks that's funny. He thinks that's a funny thing he's doing, Jimmy said. Tina stifled a giggle, grabbed a beer from the counter, and walked back into the living room. Great, now you've ruined it for me with her, too, Jimmy sighed, walking back into the living room. Ted reached out and grabbed him, pulling him back. Hey, Jimbo, I'm trying to help you out, Ted protested, but Jimmy knocked his hand away and walked out of the room. Back in the main room, the party was livening up as Paul motioned everyone to all gather around. The teens gathered around the living room, Tina and Terry standing in the center of the misshapen circle they had formed. Paul punched a hole through the bottom of two cans of Budweiser with a corkscrew, fizz bubbling to his lips as he sipped it up. He handed one beer can to Tina and one to Terry. All right, the first one to chug wins, Paul said. You ready, girls? Tina and Terry both nodded, giggling with excitement, bringing the cans up to their lips. Okay, on three, said Paul. One, two, three, the group chanted. Tina and Terry both tilted their head back, guzzling beer as fast as they could, most of it ending up on the floor. The teenagers urged on both girls, laughing and cheering boisterously. After a minute of drinking and chaos, Tina finished and lifted her beer can in the air in victory. Terry fell back into a chair, defeated, laughing hysterically. The winner is Tina, Paul shouted as the group cheered exuberantly, all except for Samantha, who watched as Tina leapt into Paul's arms, hugging him for longer than she was comfortable with. What do I win? Tina said to Paul, biting her lip coyly. What do you want? Paul asked. How about a dance? Paul smiled. Samantha's jaw dropped. Jimbo, put on another record. Paul pointed to the turntable and pulled Tina close. 
Jimmy picked up a record and put it on the turntable. Stella by starlight poured into the room softly as Tina draped her arms around Paul's neck and they gently swayed back and forth, Paul's hands on her hips. Tina caught Sam giving Paul an icy stare. Oh, you don't mind, do you? Tina asked with a bitchy smirk. Samantha watched as she leaned her head on Paul's shoulder. Her arms were crossed tightly, her eyes staring daggers. Actually, I'm going to take a swim. It's getting a bit too close in here for me, Sam said coldly, and stormed out of the house, banging the front door closed after her. Sarah moved for the door, concerned. Sam, wait, Sarah called after her, but Doug grabbed her hand and pulled her back towards him. Sarah, Sarah, let's just dance, Doug said. I don't want to dance, Sarah protested. Let's just mind our own business, Doug said. I'll talk to Paul tonight, all right? Sarah sighed, not taking her eyes off the door. She turned back to Doug. All right, she gave in and leaned into him, still thinking about how angry Samantha looked. They never should have brought these strangers to this party. Really, Sam and Sarah had talked before the party, and it was actually only the guy's decision to bring them. The, the girls never got a say in it. Sarah had seen Tina making eyes at Doug the entire night, too. She knew it was a matter of time before something like this happened. But Doug was right. Just let Sam and Paul work this out on their own, she told herself. The teens had much bigger things to worry about. That bitch, Samantha thought nastily as she walked down the trail towards the lake. She just shows up at our party with her just as slutty sister and ruins everything. God damn it! Sam had warned Paul that she didn't have a good feeling about them, but he didn't listen. Men never listen. Sometimes their dick could really get in the way of them actually thinking sensibly. Why even invite total strangers? What can go wrong? Paul had said, and now she knew he had just been after the sex. She stopped and took a deep breath, the burning sensation in her chest slowly fading. That bitch, she thought again. That bitch, that bitch. She wanted to rip them apart with her bare hands. She wanted to hit her as hard as she could with one of those wine bottles on the wall. But that's how a guy would have done it, and she wasn't about to stoop down to that level. Girls didn't fight like that. They did it all in secret. God, she had been all over him. They almost had to mop up her drool. Wasn't there some kind of secret code for women? If there was, the first rule should be never go after a taken man. It just wasn't right. Shouldn't women look out for each other? Shouldn't women never go after another woman's man? I would never do anything like that, Sam said. Sure, she was promiscuous, but never a homewrecker or a cheater. It just wasn't right. Of course, Tina wasn't the only one to blame. Paul was just letting it happen. She wasn't really as hurt about Tina, but she was more hurt that Paul didn't stop her. Nobody tried to stop her. They just let her practically molest him in there. Paul didn't do a damn thing to stop her or reject her. He had a fucking girlfriend. Why didn't he tell her no? Was it that hard to resist someone's sexual advances for a guy? For her, it was easy. Whenever some creep hit on her at a party, all she did was tell him that she had a man and that was that. For some reason, guys just couldn't keep it in their pants. All she needed was a nice dip in the lake to just clear her head and cool off. She still felt disgusted seeing them all over each other. She was still sweating and shaking from almost punching that skank. Maybe Paul would come to his senses and join her. Samantha shivered as a cold breeze brushed her bare arm. It was getting colder by the minute. She continued down the winding trail, hugging her arms to her chest, still shaking her head in anger. She still pictured them pressed up against each other. That bitch, she thought again, repeating it over and over again in her head, until in some kind of strange therapeutic way, it made her feel better. She knew that something was up when they met the two of them on the trail earlier. Paul had that look in his eye, the same look that he had had when he had come on to her a hundred times before. He probably let her on, she thought. He was practically panting like a dog in heat over her. All the guys were. She even caught Doug staring at Tina's ass when they were swimming, but she didn't tell Sarah. Sam could take something like this happening. She was pissed, sure, but Sam had had guys cheat on her before. Sarah? Sarah had only ever dated Doug. She would have been devastated. That slut can take Paul, but if she so much as touches Doug and hurts her best friend, 
she would have hell to pay. Sam could make out the sign that read Crystal Point through the darkness and stepped onto the sandy shore. The lake looked eerily calm. A white mist hung over the surface of the water like an oppressive cloud. The night was quiet and still, all except for owls and crickets and the gentle lapping of the water onto the shore. She shivered, glancing around making sure nobody was watching and stripped down to her underwear and then nude. Just then a twig snapped. She whirled around towards the trail, covering her bare chest with her hands. Paul? No response. I know you're out there, Paul, she called into the darkness. She let her hands fall to her side, revealing her naked body to whoever was out there. Hey, Paul, this is what you're missing, she yelled bitterly. Still no answer. Just like men to just take everything for granted, she thought. Fine. Screw you, Paul, she cried and turned back towards the lake. She squinted, barely able to make out an inflatable yellow raft floating out in the middle of the lake. They must have forgotten it on the shore this afternoon, and it got swept out into the water. Samantha stuck her toe in the water, and after deciding that it was bearable, she dove into the water, paddling towards the raft. She grabbed hold of the rubber grips on the side of the raft and pulled her body up onto it, sprawling out on her stomach. How dare Paul be all over some white trash backwoods bitches when he can have all of this? That was the thing with men. When they're trying to get with you, they're sweet and kind and opening doors for you. When they actually get you to go out with them and be their girlfriend and fuck them, they don't want anything else to do with you. And they just want to move on to the next best thing. They were all disgusting. Maybe she'd get back at him and go screw around with Ted or Jimmy. They were kind of cute. Or maybe she would just grab a bottle of tequila and get shit-faced or smoke some of Ted's grass. Either way, Paul was going to have to do a lot of apologizing. He would probably be out here in no time, on his knees begging for forgiveness. Crack. Another twig snapping on shore caught her attention. She looked up towards the dock and thought she saw some bushes moving. Paul? Paul? She called. No answer. I know you're out there, Paul. Still no response. This is what Sam always did when she got pissed, and Paul would always eventually come find her and win her back. It was just a matter of time. Screw you, Paul, she called out into the darkness. Some fucking graduation, she thought miserably. She sprawled back onto the rubber raft, trying to ignore the cold water seeping through the bottom. And then she heard something else. Water splashing, like someone was coming through the water towards her. She didn't have time to look up to see who it was, because just as a huge splash of water came over her, a gigantic meaty hand clamped down on the back of her head, pinning her to the raft. Sam screamed as loud as she could, trying to fight against the hand on the nape of her neck, but it was too powerful. She twisted her head around underneath the monstrous hand, just enough to see the white goalie mask that the huge man leaning into the raft and pinning her down was wearing. There was a loud thunk and a hiss of air as something penetrated the bottom of the raft, and Sam felt a searing hot pain like nothing she had ever felt before in her abdomen. She felt cold still rip through her torso, and as she let out a guttural shriek, her life began to slip away. The tip of the hunting knife poked through the tender flesh of her back, crimson rivulets of blood cascading down her bare ass and pulling in the bottom of the raft around her, as her screaming and convulsing, came to a sudden stop. Chapter 6 The Hunt Begins As the thunder approached in the distance and as the lights from the rental house shone on the surface of the lake, another slow song hummed through the speakers of the gramophone. As Sarah and Doug pressed close to one another in one corner and Paul and Tina slow danced in the other, Ted and Jimmy sat on the staircase like sad puppy dogs, watching the lovers with dismay. That asshole, man, I'm gonna kill him! Ted said angrily, glaring at Paul pressing close against Tina. How did Paul manage to do it? 
He'd only known the twins for a few hours, and he already had them literally taking off their underwear for him. Actually, Ted, I want to talk to you for a second, Jimmy said. Not now, dead fuck, Ted said flippantly. That's what I want to talk to you about, he continued. I really don't... Do you believe this guy? Ted interrupted him. I had her. She was mine. Jimmy let out an annoyed sigh and leaned in close. Well, you know what, Ted? How about you run that through your little computer? Ted gave Jimmy a dirty glare as Jimmy smirked evilly and sauntered off into the kitchen. Ted watched him leave with narrowed eyes and then turned his attention to Terry, who was coming his way. Ted jumped to his feet. Hey, you want to dance? Terry scoffed, rolling her eyes. I'm just using the bathroom, Teddy Bear, she said mockingly, and pushed past him up the staircase. Ted watched her climb up the stairs in disbelief, watching her firm-ass flex in her spandex shorts. He bit his knuckles in frustration and plopped back down on the steps, defeated. God, I feel like an asshole, Paul thought, as Tina rested her head on his shoulder. But this girl was smoking hot. So was Sam, but... Sometimes Sam would just be in a weird mood and he'd have to go take a cold shower. He was sick of it. He wanted a simple girl that wouldn't ask questions or get upset over every little thing and would just have sex with him, and there didn't have to be anything weird about it. Not talk about their feelings or their relationship, just sex. He pictured what both of them looked like together, kissing him, kissing each other. It was a dream come true. He knew he was pissing Ted off, but he didn't care. There was something about this girl, something softer than Sam, that he couldn't put his finger on. Wait, what the hell am I doing, he thought. He loved Sam. He knew he did. He didn't feel the same about other girls that he did with Sam. Sure, other girls were hot, but there wasn't any emotional connection. He actually had something more with Sam. He didn't know what it was, but she wasn't just a quick lay. She was smart and funny and could be nice when she wanted to be. That's why he decided to go steady with her in the first place, because she was different from the other girls. He could throw it all away right now for some random sleaze from this hick town that he had only known for three hours, or commit himself to the one girl who he knew he wanted to spend the rest of his life with. No, fuck this, his mind screamed, but he still found himself pressing into her, smelling her perfume, her long flowing auburn hair soft against his skin, her ample breast pushed up against his chest, he couldn't tear his hands away from her hips. She was irresistible. Be strong, damn it, he told himself. This was some girl you just met. Sam is a girl you will marry. You can't do this. Paul pulled away from Tina, shaking his head. What's the matter? Tina asked, dumbfounded. I'm sorry, I can't go through with this, he said. And with that, he hurried out the door. Tina stood there in disbelief, throwing her hands in the air and falling back onto the armchair. Great, just great, she thought to herself. This whole night was ruined. Finally, she had a whole house of out-of-towners with incredibly sexy guys to fuck. She was so sick and tired of the same guys from her school. Most of them are hillbillies or delinquents who spent their time parked in their pickup trucks just outside of town getting wasted, and the few that she and Terry rotated around were the only ones worth anything, but even they were simple farm boys. Tina wanted something new and exciting. How thrilling it would have been to get to have sex with a city boy. She could tell all of her friends at school, and she'd be treated like a goddess. But Paul was too busy being a slave to that slut Sam, and Doug was with Sarah, and now all that was left was Jimmy and Ted. She took one look at Ted, who was holding a small teddy bear and pretending to dance with it, and sneered. What a total dweeb. She looked over at Jimmy, who came in from the kitchen and sat down on the couch. He was kind of cute in a boy-next-door type of way. Definitely wasn't her type, but then again, this weekend had planned to be about getting around and trying something new. It may not be thrilling, but it certainly could be new. What the hell? He would possibly be better in bed than Ted. Sensitive guys can be such a turn-on, but she hoped he wasn't a virgin. Tina stood up reluctantly and ambled nonchalantly over in front of Jimmy. Do you want to dance? Jimmy's eyes widened. D dance with me? Tina nodded, grinning coyly. Uh, sure, 
Jimmy stammered and jumped to his feet, pulling her into him. She wrapped her arms around his shoulders, gently swaying and back and forth to the music. Jimmy laughed nervously. I, uh, thought you wanted to be with Paul. Well, now I want to be with you, Tina said, brushing his lips with her fingers and looking into his eyes. Jimmy laughed again in disbelief, seeing the way she was looking at him. Well, I kind of feel bad. I mean, you and Paul were... Kinda, um, Jimmy continued, but Tina brought a finger to his lips. God, just shut up already. I'm horny as hell, Tina thought. Let's go upstairs, Jimmy, Tina grinned mischievously, running her hand through his hair. Jimmy didn't have time to react. She took him by the shirt collar and tugged him up the staircase. Jimmy gave Ted a look and followed her up the stairs like a kid following candy. Ted looked on in astonishment. Sam! Paul called into the pitch black darkness as he jogged down the trail towards the lake. He couldn't believe how stupid he had been. He had almost lost a sexy, intelligent bombshell of a girl for some girl that he had just met. A girl who he would probably never see again after they all went home back to their lives. He began to mentally prepare himself to face her, because when she was angry, she would throw, kick, hit, scream, and everything in between. Paul was surprised she hadn't gone totally nuts on Tina back at the house, but it was all that passive-aggressive shit that girls did, hating each other from a distance, and it was vicious. Guys just got it out in the open. If two guys are pissed at each other, they let everyone know. Girls sneak around and give fake compliments and sabotage and never go right at another girl unless she is pushed to her absolute limits. Most of the time, all of the fighting was done behind each other's backs. And when Sam was angry, really angry, there was nothing passive-aggressive about it. What was she even so goddamn angry about? Because he was dancing with another girl? He wouldn't have minded if she started dancing with Ted or Jimmy, as long as they didn't get too handsy. What was the big problem? Sam could be so obsessive sometimes. Was that the price of having that piece of ass? It really started to take a toll on him sometimes. At lots of parties and hangouts they had been to, Sam had done things like this before and ran off without speaking to anyone just because some girl was talking to him. She was crazy jealous. But at school, Paul had to constantly swat guys off of her like flies. So what about that? He never got upset about that, you know, every time that she interacted with another guy. What was the big deal? Everybody was just having a good time, and now she would probably be mad the rest of the night and totally ruin everything. They'd probably make up with sex, and then she would be fine again. It was really good fucking sex, too, and Paul didn't mind her blow up so much if it meant having that kind of sex. He figured this time wouldn't be any different. But as he approached the dark, quiet lake shore, he began to wonder if this was the best spot to get it on. He shivered in the frigid night air. Paul squinted through the layer of hazy mist hovering the surface of the lake. He could make out a rubber raft floating not too far out in the middle of the lake, and an arm was draped over the side. Samantha! Sam! he called. No response. Was she asleep? Sam! he called again. Still no response. Great. Was this his punishment? Having to swim all the way out to her in freezing cold water? That was just the kind of bitchy, passive-aggressive thing Sam would do. Fine, if that's the way she wants it. Paul stripped off his clothes down to his boxer shorts and dove into the water, every muscle in his body tightening in response to the cold. Knifing through the icy water, he raised his head and squinted his eyes, trying to see into the raft, but the thick fog obscured his vision. He stopped to catch his breath. Sam, he called, still no movement from the shape lying in the raft. He swam up to the raft and peeked over the side and the hair stood up on the back of his neck. It wasn't from the cold. It was from the side of Sam's corpse, her dead eyes gazing up at him, lying motionless in the bottom of the raft in a murky mixture of lake water and blood. Paul recoiled in shock, screaming and leaping away from the raft, thrashing around in disoriented terror, until he finally found enough composure to start swimming as fast as he could back towards the dock. He felt the wooden slats of the dock above him, and he felt the old jagged wood splintering his hands as he struggled to pull himself onto the dock. 
as he managed to heave his upper half onto the pier, he caught a glimpse of a shadowy figure through the wooden slats, coming down the dock towards him. In a split second, the long shaft of a spear gun was thrust out from underneath the pier, plunging into Paul's groin. Paul's entire body writhed in the throes of pain as the spear penetrated deep into his manhood, and a blood-curdling, agonizing scream erupted from the bottom of his soul. Before he knew it, he was lifted into the air. A huge figure withdrew from the darkness underneath the dock, and the two menacing eye holes of a hockey mask met Paul's pained stare. That was the last thing he saw as Jason pulled the trigger and the spear fired through Paul's pelvis and out through his lower back in a spray of blood, impaling him like a fish on a harpoon. Rob was jolted awake from a restless sleep by a chilling scream. He pulled himself out of his sleeping bag, threw on his flannel shirt, not bothering to button it, and scrambled for his machete in the sheath near the tent flap. He unsheathed the long, rusty blade, grabbed his flashlight, and ran outside the tent he had pitched in a small clearing. He glanced around, the beam of the flashlight bouncing around crazily as he tried to listen for another scream like the one he had just heard. It had come from the lake. Rob sprinted down the trail, running headlong into thick brush, slashing at branches in his way with the machete. Hello! Do you need help? Where are you? Rob bellowed, waving the flashlight frantically. He stopped for a moment to catch his breath and find his bearings. Pointing the flashlight around until he found the trail again, he kept moving down it, cutting aside any foliage. Hello! He called again loudly. He stopped to listen, but there wasn't an answer to his calls. Maybe he had just dreamt it. No, no, that couldn't be it. He wasn't even all the way asleep when he heard it. At least he didn't think he was. He had heard something. Hello, are you out there? Do you need help? He called again. Still no answer. He made his way through the dark woods listening, trying to hear anything other than his own panicked breathing and the light rainfall that had started to pour. Shining his flashlight in every direction, he couldn't see a thing except for trees in pitch black darkness. He had to save them. Someone could be in trouble. Someone could be fighting for their life. He couldn't let anyone die tonight. He had come too far not to seek the vengeance he came here for. Rob kept moving towards the lake, wincing as thorns slashed his arms and legs. Finally, he could see the moon glinting off the surface of the water behind some clouds for a brief second. Then he thought he saw the moonlight illuminating someone moving down the shore of the lake and disappearing into the shelter of the trees. Hello, he called. Is someone there? Then there was a huge crash of underbrush behind him, and Rob spun around to see a huge dark figure dash across the trail. The figure was headed in the direction of Rob's tent. Hey, hey, Rob yelled at the top of his lungs and gave chase, swiping a branch in half with the blade of his machete. He followed the sound of the crashing underbrush, waving his flashlight frantically in one hand and his machete in the other. Damn, he's fast, whoever he is, Rob thought, and just as he saw the tree root in front of him, he tripped on it and toppled over, sending his machete and flashlight flying. He felt a jab of pain shoot up his leg as his knee hit the ground hard, and he cried out in agony. Shit! Rob exclaimed, struggling to pull himself to his feet. He found the yellow beam of his flashlight and picked it up off the ground, and shone it around until he found his machete. Using a tree for support, he pulled up his pant leg, shining his flashlight on his leg. A small gash oozed blood just below his knee. Wincing at the throbbing pain shooting up his leg, he rolled back down his pants and started towards his tent. Whoever had just came barreling through here was long gone by now. It was probably just a deer but he could have sworn it had the shape and build of a man. 
Rob hobbled up the trail until he reached the clearing where his tent was and stopped short when he saw something that made his blood run cold. The back side of his tent was ripped to shreds, like someone had torn right through it. What the hell? Rob muttered, tightening his grip on his machete and approaching the entrance to the tent. He peered through the opening and froze in horror. Oh shit, he said. Someone had been inside his tent. His newspapers and magazines were strewn all over the place, and his rifle had been snapped in two like a twig. It had begun to rain and thunder was rumbling in the sky. Lightning flashed and dark clouds obscured the moon, making the night seem even darker and more ominous. So, have you ever done this before? Tina asked, as she and Jimmy both sat down on the edge of the bed in the upstairs bedroom. Jimmy ran his hand through his hair nervously and chuckled. Yeah, yeah, he stammered. Tina stood up, spun around to face him, and unbuttoned the first few buttons of her blouse, grinning at him seductively. "'I think you're pretty neat,' she said, and pounced on him, kissing him passionately. They both flopped down on the bed, hands wandering. Jimmy couldn't believe what was happening, but he only registered the shock for a split second. What came over him next was nothing short of pure ecstasy, as her hand slipped inside the front of his slacks. She straddled him and Jimmy arched his back with pleasure as she sat firmly on his crotch. In three seconds, she had her top and bra off and Jimmy was staring at her succulent, ample breast and they hung down over him as she kissed him again. Her tongue slid inside his mouth and met with his and his hands found her ass and began to slide off of her shorts. In the next twenty seconds, they were under the sheets, inside each other and moaning with intense pleasure. Terry stared with disgust across the room at Ted, who rifled messily through the contents of a small wicker cabinet, a joint hanging loosely from the corner of his mouth. Doug and the goody two-shoes were over on the couch, snuggling and whispering sweet nothings into each other's ears. It made her want to vomit. Tina was getting some, and she was downstairs with the biggest loser at this party. At least Jimmy was kind of cute. Maybe she was just too much of a bitch. This was what she got for it. Stuck downstairs with the rejects while her sister was upstairs screwing a pretty cute guy. If she would have given Jimmy a chance, maybe it would have been her getting laid. Maybe it was what she deserved. Was it the way she walked or talked? The way she carried herself? She knew that her mother would have said. Her mother always said that some guys were just intimidated by confident women. But maybe she really was just a bitch. What the hell is this? Ted asked aloud, pulling out a reel of film. It's film, Teddy. I think I saw a projector in one of the upstairs closets, Doug exclaimed. Oh, shit! Ted guffawed with laughter, stoned out of his mind. Let's see if it works. Ted tried to climb down the stool he was standing on and nearly toppled over the entire cabinet, sending the knickknacks crashing to the floor. He bellowed with boisterous laughter again cackling in a fit of cannabis-induced hysterics. Terry rolled her eyes. That's it, she thought. I can't take much more of this. Terry stood up and headed for the stairs, climbing them two at a time and strolling down the hallway, following the moans of passion. She rapped on the door where the moans were the loudest. Tina, Tina, I'm ready to go, Terry yelled. No answer, just further passionate moans in the throes of ecstasy. Tina, let's go! You go, a voice called from between moans. Terry frowned. I'm going to leave without you, she exclaimed. After a moment, Tina's voice came through again. Take an umbrella, she said in a spiteful tone. Terry leaned away from the door, her jaw hanging open. What a bitch, she thought, and to think, Terry was the one with the reputation for being a bitch. Fine, Terry responded and stormed down the hallway, downstairs and towards the foyer, where she grabbed a poncho hanging from the coat rack. She didn't care that it wasn't hers at this point. 
She had to get out of here before she blew up at everyone. Tina with a bloody nose would put a damper on a party, she thought nastily. Putting it on, she ignored Ted, calling her and asking her not to go, and left the house, banging the door shut behind her. Terry began to jog through the pouring rain towards her bike, the one leaning against the kickstand beside Tina's underneath an old overhanging tree. She wanted to kill her, just kill her with her bare hands. She had wanted to break down that door and kill her. But she knew she had to be the bigger sister and act like an adult. So here she was, leaving the party early, alone, and in the rain. She still couldn't believe it. How could she? Her own sister was letting her go home all alone, at night, in the rain, while she fucked some guy she just met. Of course, that was their goal, was to have sex with some new guys and have a fun time, but aren't sisters supposed to stick together, party together, leave together? Surely there's some sort of girl code that must be even stronger for sisters, twin sisters even stronger. One thing was for sure, she wasn't talking to Tina for a week. It was always how she got back at her, and she knew only then would Tina be begging for forgiveness. Every time Tina did something stupid like she always did, she would always come crawling to Terry to get her to fix her mistakes, or to forgive her. They were supposed to be in this together. Well, to hell with that, because her sister was a whore. Terry angrily snapped the kickstand back into place, and just before getting on her bike, she looked up at the brightly lit bedroom window. Slut! She screamed through the pouring rain. Terry began to hop onto her bike, when all of a sudden a huge meaty hand clamped down on her shoulder, and another hand plunged a spear into her back. Terry let out a scream that was drowned out by the rain and thunder, and stared down at the metal tip of the spear that protruded from her gut. Jason lifted her into the air. The spear impelled through her abdomen, and hurled on her like he was shoveling dirt into the side of the rental house. She hit with a dull thud and fell to the ground, quivering in the throes of death and feeling the warm blood flowing between her fingers as life drained from her body along with the rain that ran along the dirt path. Three down, five to go. Tommy, I'm going to towel off and then I'm going to strangle you, Mrs. Jarvis said, as she stepped inside the darkened cabin, shuddering from the rain she was soaked in. She had told him over and over not to leave the door unlocked. That psycho who murdered those kids at the old camp could just come waltzing right in. She sighed, closed and locked the front door, and trudged through the house into the kitchen. She grabbed a dish rag off the counter and mopped the rain from her face. What a perfect time to decide to go for a nighttime jog right before the bottom fell out, Mrs. Jarvis thought sarcastically. She poured herself a glass of water and glanced around, sipping it plaintively. She glanced around. Where were Trish and Tommy? They should be back from town by now. She had told Trish to take Tommy into town for a haircut before the storm started, and it looked like they were stuck right in the middle of it. She stared out the kitchen window at the rivulets of rain trickling down the glass and the lightning flashing across the sky. Thunder boomed overhead, rattling the walls of the old cabin. Trish, Tommy, anybody home? Where the hell are you? She called. She tried to squint through the dark interior of the cabin. Matter of fact, where the hell am I? She tried the light switch, but the cabin remained bathed in darkness. Trish? She called again no answer. There must be something wrong with the lights. She hoped they'd be all right out there in the rain at night. The dirt road leading to the house could get slippery, and that old hunk of junk Trish was driving wasn't going to be any help. They would have had to walk home today if not for that guy that Trish found on the side of the road. She shuddered to think about it. What was his name again? Rob, that's right. 
the stranger Trish had allowed to just come over into their house? What could have happened if she hadn't been home? Would he have taken the chance to rob them? Hurt her children? Try to rape Trish? She shouldn't have thought about it, and she scolded herself for thinking such awful things. But she couldn't help it. Ever since the news of those murders, she had been thinking the worst. Mrs. Jarvis tried the light in the living room, and it didn't work either. Storm must have blown the power out, she thought. She would have to go out to the fuse box and try to fix it. Those poor kids that were murdered, she thought. Some of them were probably right around Trisha's age. She heard on the news that only one girl survived, and she was so traumatized she was sent to a mental institution and was inconsolable. She was around Trisha's age. It was so bizarre. They moved away from the city to get away from awful things like murder and robbery, only to get to the country and some whack job goes on a killing spree. Well, at least he was dead and gone. Mrs. Jarvis finished the water and set the glass in the sink. Black. It was something hitting the side of the house. Mrs. Jarvis moved to the back door and peeked out, but the night and the rain obscured her vision. It was probably Gordon wanting to be let inside. Great, she thought. He was probably covered from nose to paw in mud. She opened the back door and stepped out onto the porch, the wood sagging under her feet. Gordon! Gordon! She called through the howling storm. Another thud came from around the corner of the house, and Mrs. Jarvis craned her neck to see, but it was to no avail. The rain was coming down too hard for her to see much of anything. She climbed down the porch steps and hurried out into the storm the rain stinging her face. Gordon, she called again. Come inside, Gordon. Here, boy. She ran around the side of the house and came to a screeching halt. There was someone lying on the ground in the mud. It was a girl, and she wasn't moving. Beside her was a bicycle lying on the ground. Mrs. Jarvis had little time to react. Just as she started to open her mouth to scream, she looked up right into the eye holes of a hockey mask and she saw the terrifyingly huge man wearing it. There was the flash of a blade, and the lightning illuminated the hulking figure towering over her. Her scream was cut short as abruptly as it had begun, as the machete made contact with Skull and bit deeply into her cranium with a sickening thud. She was dead before she hit the ground. One by one, the rain drummed down on the roof of the rental house, and the thunder cracked like a gunshot sounding off, drowning out Mrs. Jarvis's choked scream. I hope Samantha and Paul are all right, Sarah said, looking over her shoulder out the window. Doug wrapped his arm around her and pulled her closer on the sofa. I'm sure they're fine, Doug said. They probably made up and are shacked up somewhere. Ted had the projector and film screen set up in the living room. The reel of film he found was some kind of stag movie from the 30s. It was black and white and grainy and out of focus. The entire thing consisted mostly of a topless girl dancing around drunkenly, or sitting in a bathtub, or doing other mindless acts, but Ted found it hysterical. Then again, he was high, off of a messily rolled joint dangling from his fingertips. Sarah and Doug couldn't help but snicker as Ted leaned back in the armchair, guffawing with laughter uncontrollably, puffing on the joint. Is this what Ted always does? Sarah asked Doug. Pretty much, Doug said. So, uh, which bunk are you taking? Sarah hesitated. Oh, it doesn't matter, actually. I was thinking you could take the bottom bunk, she said, trying to put on her best sexy face. Why do you want the top bunk? Doug asked, confused. Sarah shook her head coyly. Doug's eyes widened with shock. Was she actually making a pass at him? Sarah never wanted to do anything outside of making out, and he understood it. After all, she was a virgin, and virgins were typically scared about their first time. It had been hard the past few months, though. Paul was his best friend, and he'd been getting pussy ever since middle school, and Doug had only had sex once. It was embarrassing. Paul and Sam pretty much had sex at every party they went to, and Sarah never wanted any part of it. What was a guy to do? 
He would often space out on dates with Sarah, not even hearing what she was saying, just because he was imagining what sex would be like with her. He'd have to fantasize, otherwise he'd go insane. But now Sarah was staring at him, her eyes sexually charged, and Doug grinned from ear to ear. Do you mean, Doug started to say, but Sarah put her finger to his lips. Just give me a few minutes, okay? She said, and stood to her feet. Good night, teddy bear, she said as she walked past Ted towards the stairs. Ted gave a wave and another cackle of stone laughter, and Sarah climbed the stairs to the second floor, leaving Doug in awe and disbelief. Chapter 7 Watch it! Tommy cried out as the sedan hit a pothole, splattering the side of the car with mud. Sorry, Tommy, I can barely see in this rain, Trish said, squinting through the storm coming down. Just slow down, the party's gonna go on all night, Tommy said, sucking on his lollipop the hairdresser had given him. You almost made me lose my lollipop. Trish flashed him a look, but he was right. She had thought about sneaking out after her mother had gone to bed and possibly going over to visit those kids and maybe have a drink. And the short, revealing blue dress that was belted at the waist, high-heeled boots, and subtle but effective makeup she was wearing didn't hide her intentions. She had had to wait for Mrs. Jarvis to go jogging so that she could put on the dress. Otherwise, she wouldn't hear the end of it. She could hear her voice. You shouldn't go over there in that dress. It's way too short. That's too much makeup. Couldn't she have some fun for once? She hated living out here in the middle of nowhere. She didn't have anyone to talk to, and it was driving her nuts. How did her mother stand it? How was she not losing her mind? She knew what else she would have said if she had asked her about going over to hang out at the rental house. Something about how staying out late with a bunch of hooligans, participating in drugs and other illicit activities, just wasn't healthy for a girl like Trish. But Trish would rather have something bad happen than just nothing at all. Like usual, isn't that how you grow as a person? How you become stronger? You have to experience tough times so you can learn and grow. So what if she went over there and got into some trouble? Did her mother not trust her to be able to get herself out of a tough situation? But then she thought about what her mother had told her about the murders, about that psycho that killed those people up at the old campgrounds. She would lose her mind if she woke up in the middle of the night and discovered Trish was missing. So maybe sneaking out wasn't the best idea. Going next door just to socialize wasn't some huge deal, though. Why did her mother have to worry so much about every little thing? Did her mother not want her to form relationships and be a teenager for once? Wasn't she a teenager herself once? Didn't she ever do anything bad or dangerous? Trish highly doubted it. Trish never even heard her mother swear except on rare occasions, and she definitely didn't drink or smoke. Trisha's friends back in the city wrote to her all the time about all the parties they had gone to and the drinking and smoking and late night games of spin the bottle, and it just killed her inside. Why couldn't she experience that stuff for once? Trish just had to break out somehow. Maybe tonight was the night. Maybe tonight she would go to that party. Maybe tonight she would get wasted or shack up with someone. Just maybe. Maybe she was just being dramatic again. Lots of people don't even get to go to parties or do drugs, but then again, if you have the chance, why not take it? Life was too short. She had to go to that party. She didn't want to end up a widow in a cabin in the middle of nowhere like Mom because she was scared of the world. Then she thought of Rob and how mysterious but somehow still attractive to her. She couldn't pinpoint it, but something about him drove her wild. Maybe it was his muscles or the curly black hair or his eyes, the ruggedness, she couldn't stop thinking about him. She also couldn't stop thinking about how he had lied when he had said he was hunting bear. There's no bear out here. So what in the world was he doing out here? She got another chill. What if... No. Trish, don't be stupid, she thought. But what if he was the guy who killed those kids? Didn't her mother say he was dead, though? Trish chuckled sheepishly to herself. Come on, Trish. Rob, a psychopath? A bloodthirsty lunatic? Get real. This isn't some cheesy horror flick that you paid a quarter to go see at the drive-in. Rob was a little mysterious, but he couldn't hurt anyone, could he? 
He did lie, however. What was he doing here in the woods? She didn't know, but hopefully she'd seen the last of it. Even though a tiny part of her that she wished would shut up wanted to see him again. Trish pulled into the driveway and drove down the winding path, stopping in front of the house. She glanced over and saw that the rental house lights were on. She sighed a breath of relief. Hopefully they'd stay up long enough for her to sneak past her mother. Tommy and Trish huddled close and ran through the rain in the puddles that were scattered around the front yard, scrambled up the porch steps and went into the house, letting the front door close behind them. Mom, we're home, Trish called. The house was pitch black and silent. The only sounds were the thunder and the rain falling on the roof. The living room and kitchen were empty. Where is she? Trish turned back to Tommy. Tommy shrugged cluelessly. I don't know, he said. Trish walked further into the house with Tommy behind her, looking for her mother, but she was nowhere to be seen. Mom! she called again. Trish tried the light switch, but the house remained dark. Shit, she thought. It must be the storm. Trish looked up the darkened staircase, seeing the rain pouring down through the window at the landing. Trish and Tommy climbed the staircase and looked into Mrs. Jarvis's bedroom. Trish's heart sank as she saw the empty room. She's not here, she said, her eyes growing wide with concern. Trish moved to the open bedroom window to close it, looking out at the rain, scanning for any sign of Mrs. Jarvis. Maybe she's going jogging, Tommy said. She's never gone this long, and in the rain? Trish said, brushing her wet blonde hair out of her face. I'm going to go down the path to look for her. Me too, Tommy said eagerly. No, you stay here in case she comes back. Trish ordered adamantly and moved for the door. I want to go, Tommy protested, but Trish whipped around firmly. Stay here and fix the lights, she snapped, and walked down the stairs into the living room. Trish felt a knot slowly forming in her gut. Surely there was nothing wrong, but still something told her otherwise. Her mother couldn't have gone into town if they had the only car, and she wouldn't be out jogging in the rain. Trish made a beeline for the flashlight that they kept hanging on the kitchen wall, grabbed a raincoat, and headed out the front door into the rain. Mom! She called through the whistling wind. Mom! She started jogging down the trail that they always went down, the one that went around the lake. Mom! She called again. It was useless. The storm was shrieking all around her, and it was impossible to hear much of anything. She shined the flashlight around frantically, searching for any sign of her mother. She caught the glimmer of the lake ahead through the trees and stopped. Where the hell was her mother? Trish slowed to a walk, pushing aside branches and stepping over fallen logs, the rain pelting her. As she rounded a corner of the trail, her flashlight caught a glimpse of something else, something yellow through the trees. She squinted through the rain, trying to make out what it was, but realized she had to get closer. Trish pulled aside the foliage and approached whatever it was. It was a tent, a big yellow tent in a small clearing. It must be Rob's doing, she thought. Trish curiously peeled open the flap of the tent and ducked down to see inside. What the hell? She thought as she saw the messy interior. Newspaper clippings were strewn all around the floor. There was a brightly lit lantern shining in the corner, and a broken rifle was lying in front of her. It had been snapped in two like a twig. She crawled further inside the tent and rifled through the newspaper articles. She picked one up and read it. The big, bold headline read, Crystal Lake Massacre. Just as she started to read the tiny print, Trish froze. There were footsteps outside, softly crunching over fallen leaves. Every muscle in her body tensed, and she let the newspaper fall from her hands. The footsteps grew louder and louder, and a man's hulking shadow fell over the tent. Trisha's eyes widened as she saw the shadow of a machete rise into the air above her head. <laughs> Jimmy and Tina were wrapped in sheets bathing in the afterglow of sex. Tina's head was lying on Jimmy's bare chest and his hand stroked her soft hair. Jimmy couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that he actually got laid before Ted did tonight and by a total babe. Fuck you, Ted. Fuck you and your goddamn computer. He did it. He had had sex and it had been good this time. That's what everyone was talking about. No wonder everyone was crazy about it. It was amazing. The feeling of being inside someone like that and your body moving in rhythm with theirs. 
It was electrifying. It was stupendous. It was amazing, like nothing he had ever felt before. The climax went even beyond that. It was as if every inch of his body was being touched with some kind of elixir that brought a pleasure too intense to describe, from the nape of his neck to the tips of his toes. He had felt it course through his veins and pump through his blood. How ironic was it, he thought as he lay there beside Tina. Ted was purportedly a ladies' man and was getting laid every weekend, or so he would say in the locker room at Pinehurst High. And now he was actually the one getting laid while Ted was downstairs alone getting high. Everybody else would be pairing off with someone at the end of this wild night, and Ted would have no one. It almost made Jimmy feel guilty, but after all, he felt it was what Ted deserved for that whole dead fuck bit and being so pretentious. Maybe that was why Ted hadn't won over either of the two twins. Maybe he just tried too hard. He probably didn't get laid nearly as often as he said he did, and of course, Jimmy understood why. The peer pressure of the other guys at school was strong. Guys were always wanting to know how far you had been with the girl, like it was a contest or something. It made it worse that it was a very rural school, and there wasn't exactly other options like dating someone from town or from a different district. If you hadn't banged someone from their school, it probably meant that you were a virgin. Of course, Jimmy knew there was more to life than that. It must just be a high school thing and a coming-of-age thing. People get sexually repressed themselves and bottle up those emotions and then project them onto others, like plenty of girls did at Pinehurst. The virgin shaming he had heard was even worse among the girls. Often it was the other girls in the locker room who would boast about going down on their boyfriends and then harass the girl who had nothing to say. It was a human thing. If you didn't follow certain social norms, you got ostracized for it. He had felt it himself in the boys' locker rooms. He mostly avoided all conversation about sex, but when the topic came up, he would lie and say that he had fucked some townie or something, just to get the guys off his back. He didn't know how Ted was able to keep his reputation up when, in reality, he wasn't all that charismatic and can try way too hard. He guessed it was Ted's sense of humor and laid-back attitude, but even then, when Teddy was laughing, it was usually a crude joke or a joke at someone's expense. In a sense... Jimmy knew it was just his defense mechanism. He knew it was just a way of coping with his own insecurities. But it had really started to get on his nerves tonight. But now it didn't seem to matter because he had done it. He had actually gotten laid tonight and he knew now Ted was too stoned to care. But in the morning, he relished at rubbing it in his face a little. He pictured them all down at breakfast and he could walk in sleepily with a half-naked Tina on his arm their after-sex complexions radiating off of them. But of course, what if Ted had been right? What if he was a dead fuck? He had to know. He felt awkward asking after they had just finished, but he just had to know. Jimmy hesitated and then spoke up. Hey, Tina? Mm-hmm, she replied tiredly. Am I... Am I a dead fuck? Jimmy stammered awkwardly. Tina laughed and then brought her head up to look at Jimmy. You know what? I think you were incredible. Jimmy let out an elated sigh. Really? Yeah, she said, laughing and kissing him passionately. Don't you move. I'll be right back, he said. This calls for a celebration. How about some wine? Jimmy remembered seeing the wine bottles in the kitchen. If he could find that corkscrew that Paul used for the beer drinking contest, he could pop one open, have a glass, and see if Ted was still up to let him know just how incredible he was. He was going to make Ted eat his words if it killed him. Sounds fine, she said with a sexy wink, as she watched him put on his boxer shorts and his shirt. She blew him a kiss as he walked to the door, picking up her panties, and stepped out into the hallway. Incredible? Was that what she said? He was incredible? Holy shit. I'm incredible. Jimmy sprawled out, shaking his head in disbelief, unable to stop smiling. He was incredible. He made his way to the stairs, a jubilancy glowing through him, swinging Tina's yellow lace panties on his index finger and whistling a cheerful tune. He came down the stairs into the now darkened living room where Ted was puffing on a joint alone in an armchair and laughing at the film on the projector screen. Jimmy casually sauntered over to the armchair and sat down on the edge of it, plopping Tina's panties on Ted's lap. Why don't you run those through your little computer, Teddy Bear? Jimmy said proudly. Ted was too stoned to be resentful. 
He laughed uncontrollably, throwing the pennies up in the air. Hey, congratulations, Jimbo, Ted said with a laugh, his eyes glowing red. Why don't we grab a bottle of wine and celebrate, Jimmy said, and then looked Ted dead in the eyes. She said I was incredible. Ted laughed hysterically again. Way to go, Jimbo! Jimmy strolled up into the dark kitchen, grabbed a bottle of wine off the wine rack, and strolled over to the sink. He began to rummage through the drawers, still whistling exuberantly. Ted's laughing and the humming from the video camera drowned out the faint sound of the back door, quietly creaking open. Hey, Ted, where's that corkscrew? The fancy corkscrew for the wine bottle? Jimmy called into the living room. No response, just more buzz laughter from Ted. Jimmy was oblivious to footsteps coming softly across the linoleum floor towards him. Ted, where the hell is the corkscrew? Jimmy called louder. All of a sudden, the missing corkscrew came out of the darkness at the back of the kitchen, and the blade was driven into Jimmy's hand with immense force, pinning it to the countertop. Jimmy let out a scream of excruciating pain, drowned out by Ted's cackling, and he looked up from his quivering, bleeding hand to see a huge man in a hockey mask and a grungy work suit. With his other hand, the mad killer reached into the kitchen drawer, withdrew a meat cleaver, and swung it into Jimmy's head, burying it right into the middle of his face. The cleaver sliced through Jimmy's nasal cavity and then into his skull with a sickening sound, but Jimmy felt nothing at all. Jimmy? She said, no answer. The room was empty as well. He probably just ran into the bathroom in the hall, she thought. Tina glanced around on the floor for the rest of her clothes, seeing her panties were missing. Jimmy probably had run off with them to mess with her or something. God, I hate lying, Tina thought as she lay there nude underneath the covers. Of course, he was really nervous and he needed encouragement. Truthfully, he had just been all right. She had slept with better guys and much, much worse. He was one of those guys that had it in him, that rough, raw masculinity that turned women on. It just needed some coaxing and some polishing. She shouldn't have gotten his hopes up, but she wasn't able to say it to his face, especially after the way his eyes lit up when she had told him he was incredible in bed. He was one of those guys that were probably pressured really hard by all the guys at school. He was likely always one of the quiet, shy guys, kind of smart and sensitive, one of the guys on the sideline standing up for the bullied kid always bagged on about how they never get laid, called gay, called homo, just totally shit all over just because they actually knew how to treat people with respect. If you're a guy, you're either a stud who fucks every girl or you're gay, pretty much. Tina hated the way guys pressured each other. So what if a guy wants to wait? So what if they're sensitive? She thought it was sweet when a guy was the nervous type. How awkward they could be was sometimes kind of endearing. And that's how it had been with Jimmy. To be honest, she really did like him. He was cute and he actually respected her. He had been so gentle and that was probably why he hadn't really turned her on because then again it took a lot to turn her on. It took very confident and masculine men to really turn her on. She had gone for Jimmy because at least she knew he wouldn't hurt her or want to do anything crazy or get upset if she couldn't get him to orgasm. Jimmy didn't try hard. He knew how to just be his natural self and not have to put on a front. He had been terrified and hadn't really tried to hide it, and that was attractive to her. It was guys like that that still managed to turn her on enough to at least sleep with them and give them a good night once in a while, because she knew that he was one of the guys that people just love to ignore and neglect. She had seen the longing look in his eyes when he watched Paul and Sam making out, and had been thinking about asking him to dance but not knowing how. He was so much nicer than any of her past boyfriends. She almost couldn't handle the good guy when she met one because she just wasn't used to it. It terrified her. This time, he had been so natural and so real with her, and all of that went away. After all, she had been horny, and what was the problem if she let him have his night for once? She didn't feel bad about lying to him, because honesty was not always the best thing for some people. She had seen the way Ted had been prodding him and belittling him all night and acting like a jerk, and it just made her feel sorry for him. After all, she'd be leaving tomorrow and they would all go back to their worlds and forget about it. She just hoped that he didn't catch feelings for her or anything. She really wasn't feeling the group at all. Tina had seen the looks Samantha had given her when she had danced with Paul. 
It was one dance. What the hell was her problem? If they both loved each other, she should trust him enough to let him have one dance. No wonder they probably had a very unhealthy relationship. She had stormed out of the house off of a dance that meant nothing. Just because you dance with someone at a party doesn't mean you love them. It's a party. She didn't have to get so worked up. But then again, with a foxy guy like Paul, she didn't blame her either. Where were they? She wondered. They had probably had a fight out there in the woods and gotten lost all because of a stupid little dance. Where was Jimmy? She glanced at the door worriedly. What was everyone doing? Tina slid out of bed, her bare feet touching the cold hardwood floor, and she moved to the window, squinting out through the oncoming rain. There was no sign of Jimmy outside, but she saw two bicycles sitting under the tree where she and Terry had left them. Wait, she thought. Didn't Terry leave? Why was her bike still down there? Tina frowned, confused. Maybe she had hooked up with Ted after all, Tina thought. She wouldn't have walked home in this storm. Tina turned back to the window and gasped in horror. A hockey mask was staring right back at her. It was a man standing outside on the ledge. And then two hands lunged forward, smashed through the bedroom window from outside, and grabbed her. Before Tina could scream, an immense force yanked her forward, and in a split second she was thrown through the broken shards of glass and was flying through the air. Tina plummeted through the air, landing hard on the top of the 73 Chevy. Her head hit the roof in an impossible way, her neck snapping in two, and her lifeless body rolled off onto the muddy ground. Trish let out a horrified scream as the machete slashed through the wall of the tent, coming five inches away from her. Trish crawled out on her hands and knees towards the tent entrance, but stopped when two legs suddenly blocked her way out. Trish looked up in a panic at the man towering above her, and she gasped when she saw who it was. It was Rob, soaking wet, caked with mud and blood, his eyes wide and frenzied and brandishing the machete high above his head. "'What the hell are you doing here?' he bellowed angrily. "'What are you trying to do, kill me?' Trish shrieked, her body relaxing. Rob lowered the machete and ducked inside the tent, suddenly becoming serious with her. "'Well, somebody is trying to kill me,' Rob said, looking precariously out into the darkness. He then zipped up the tent behind him and gave Trish a hard stare. "'What? Rob, what is all this?' she asked bewildered, gesturing to the newspapers strewn about. Trish, listen to me. I'm not hunting for bear out here, Rob said. I'm hunting someone. What? she asked, still not understanding. I'm looking for the man who killed my sister. His name is Jason Voorhees, Rob said. He held up a cutout photograph of his sister, a young pretty girl with blonde curly hair of about sixteen. His eyes began to well with tears. Trish furrowed her brow in confusion. Jason Voorhees? she asked. He's the maniac who's been killing kids up at Crystal Lake, Rob said. Trish immediately remembered what her mother had told her. Oh, but what about your sister? Trish asked, staring at the photograph of the young girl. Rob's stare became vacant as he looked to the side, reminiscing. My sister used to love kids. She wanted to work with them. She was up here at Crystal Lake the other night. Her name was Sandra, Rob went on, Trish listening intently. She was one of the ones murdered when Jason went on his killing spree. He had remembered warning his little sister Sandra about some horrible murders that had taken place years before at Camp Crystal Lake, and she hadn't listened. She had been part of Paul Holt's counselor training center and had insisted on going. He thought back to the phone call that had made his blood run cold. They found Sandra. Rob, she's dead, they had said. He had almost broken down at the thought of his kid sister gone, taken from the world so violently. He had gone up to the campgrounds that night and had identified her pale, mangled body as it lay on a still slab at the county coroner's office. 
The officers had said they had found her dead stabbed with the spear, and her boyfriend, Jeff, hung from a bloody bed sheets and impaled on a coat hook. Just casualties and a senseless bloodbath. Rob had tried to understand it, tried to put himself in the killer's mind, and tried to feel a sense of compassion. But the only thing he felt was a rage deep within him, in a voice that screamed at him, screamed at him to kill the bastard that did this to his little sister, and to seek justice for her. He had gone into town, into Crystal Lake, to ask the locals about how to get to the camp, and they hadn't been friendly. He had burst into the city hall, asking for the records for Jason Voorhees, and pouring through them, searching all of the resources that he could find on his childhood, his family, and anything else that he thought was important. But still, it wasn't enough. Knowing about his sister's killer and his sick, twisted mind was only causing the flame to burn brighter, so bright that it threatened to consume him. Jason Voorhees had to die. He had driven the four-hour drive back home and packed his things, and then to the hardware store to get several knives, a machete, a shotgun, some lanterns, and anything else that he might have needed for a weekend at Camp Blood. The locals weren't doing anything to stop his sister's killer, that was clear because the killings didn't stop after the training center. There had been more slaughtered bodies of innocent teens, just like Sandra, found on the opposite side of the lake just last night. Jason was still out there. He knew it. And the local forces didn't care. You should be out there finding this bastard, he had screamed in the sheriff's face after his sister died. He had just sat there and looked at him with a blank expression on his face. Jason Voorhees is a legend round here, he had said. A legend that we don't take kindly to. The camp is closed down and there is nobody out there, Mr. Dyer. People are dying, Rob had said. My sister is dead and still all he got were more excuses. The cops weren't going to do a thing until half their town was dead. And not even just people from their town, but people from all over the area that come to Crystal Lake. These murders had been going on for years, ever since back in 79, when he had read about Jason's mother's killing spree. It was as if the whole town knew what was going on, but was just complacent in it happening. How many more little kids had to die? She had only been 16. Oh God, Rob, I'm so sorry, Trish said, snapping him out of his thoughts. Yeah, she was a good kid, he said. And I've got to stop Jason before he kills anyone else. Trish reached out and touched him. But isn't that man dead? Rob shook his head. No, Jason is alive. Look, Rob said, picking up the newspapers and flipping to the front cover. Jason was a young boy who drowned in Crystal Lake. His mother went psycho and killed some counselors at the camp. She was killed by a survivor, but then the killing started again. And the locals said it had to be Jason, and they were right. Jason never drowned, Rob explained. This is Jason as a child, an artist's conception by a would-be victim. Rob pointed to a sketch of a young boy in a tattered shirt and cut-off jeans. He was missing his hair except in very sparse patches on his abnormally shaped head. And he was dirty, very physically deformed and grotesque in appearance. The caption read, Artist Depiction of Young Jason Voorhees. But the man who killed your sister is dead. My mom heard it on the news, Trish said. No, Trish. Jason's body disappeared from the morgue two days ago, Rob said his eyes huge and foreboding. Maybe it was stolen, Trish said. Rob scoffed. Trish, two people are missing from the morgue. Coincidence? Plus, I've seen him tonight. Someone was in my tent, Rob said. Jason is alive and I think you and your family are in grave danger. The color drained from Trish's face as she realized the horrifying truth. Oh God, she muttered. And then she realized something. Oh God, Tommy's back at the house by himself. They both exchanged horrified glances. Rob snatched up his machete and dashed out of the tent down the trail, Trish following close behind. Sarah stared at her body in the bathroom mirror and let out a long sigh. She was in nothing but a white bra and matching panties. She was slim enough and her breasts were of an alright size. Certainly not the size of Sam's, but decent enough, she decided. 
She felt the knot twisting tighter in her stomach, and her hands began to get sweaty. Was she actually about to do this to have sex? She was scared out of her mind. Could Doug tell? Would he be able to tell, and would it not be as great because of how scared she was? Would it hurt? What if she chickened out? Would he use a condom? A million questions were racing through her mind. She continued to survey herself, hoping Doug would like what he saw. She grabbed a white, fluffy robe off the hook on the door and slipped it on, tossing her hair behind her shoulders and giving herself another look. You got this, she consoled herself, feeling the knot screwing even tighter. God, this is terrifying. Even more terrifying than she thought it would be. Sam made it look so easy, but she had the looks to pull it off. Sam could have any guy she wanted. How she wished she was Sam sometimes, to be able to just manipulate any guy to do just about whatever she wanted, and to be able to be sexy and flirty. She just didn't have the same sexy olive complexion that Sam had, or the same hourglass figure. Her stomach stuck out a little bit, and she was lanky and awkward. Her tits weren't that big either, but she knew Doug, and he wasn't that shallow. She remembered what Sam had said about him and braced herself. She took one last look, checked to make sure she didn't have anything in her teeth, and strolled out into the hallway, seeing Doug coming up the stairs, his eyes lustful. "'You look amazing!' Doug said, wrapping his arms around her waist. Sarah felt her face growing hot as his arms caressed her, and she felt a tingling sensation rush from her head down to her toes. "'Um, thanks. Do you want to go to the bottom bunk?' "'No, I was thinking about a nice shower,' Doug said. Sarah hesitated, a small panic beginning to flutter in her heart. Sarah blocked out that thought. Just go with it, she told herself. Sure, she said seductively. They lip-locked in a passionate kiss, filled with a lust that they both didn't see coming, and backed away into the bathroom, closing the door behind them. Ted was officially starting to feel the after-effects of the weed hit him, and they hit him like a truck. The THC had settled into the rest of his body, and he was thoroughly zonked, glued to the armchair and staring with a glazed-over look in his eye at the projector screen. He couldn't actually believe Jimmy got laid before he did. You blew it, teddy bear, he thought to himself. You really fucking blew it. Both of the twins hated his guts, and there were no other girls left to fuck around with. Paul was probably getting action from Sam out at the lake. Doug and Sarah were upstairs getting it on, and Jimmy actually wasn't a dead fuck. He felt the bitter tinge of resentment towards himself. Why did he have to insult people, and why a guy like Jimmy? Just a nice, confused kid looking for love. And he was his friend, one of Ted's only friends, and he treated him like shit. Jimmy had never done anything wrong to him, and still, Ted found ways to pick on his lanky gait and general awkwardness. The truth was that it was how Ted dealt with all of his insecurities. But his baked mind couldn't think about that right now. All he could do was half-smile and stare dazedly at the screen. Maybe it was because deep down Ted hated himself sometimes, and everyone else saw it in his overly outgoing and macho persona. The girls at Crystal Lake High gave him the nickname Teddy Bear, and not as an affectionate pet name, but as a way to let other girls know he was coming and to get the hell out of Dodge. He was the same way at school. None of the girls actually liked him or fucked him. He just said that he got a lot of pussy to look good. Maybe he was just too forward. What the hell was he doing wrong? He was good looking, had great hair, smooth talking. He was doing everything right. He was doing every single thing right, everything that he read in all of the best dating books out there. Charm them, romance them, tell them how beautiful they are, and nothing worked. Still, he was rejected constantly. Jimmy could at least get a girl, and how? Jimmy was too much of a nice guy. Girls like total sleazes. They just do. It's that whole reverse psychology thing, where women like being treated like shit. It was sort of like a domination thing. If a woman feels insulted by a man, it turns her on and makes her want to please him even more. Ted read all about it in some news article about this guy who got all these chicks simply by telling them straight to their face how worthless they were. Ted didn't take it that far but he still followed all the other advice he had been given and didn't have any success with any of it. Maybe he didn't need to try so hard. Maybe he could just give up on women. There were so many that were just so emotional, so needy, and such bitches sometimes. Just look at what happened to Sam and Paul tonight, wherever the hell they are. Good thing he didn't have to deal with any of that. 
No angry, jealous girlfriends. No birthday and anniversary presents. Ted laughed as the girl on screen danced to a cheesy 30s bebop tune, her breast bouncing. He got to his feet and staggered clumsily up to the projector screen and pretended to talk to the girl on screen. Hey, don't you want to give Teddy Bear a kiss? He said, followed by another boisterous explosion of stone laughter. All of a sudden, the projector screen went blank and the camera stopped rolling. The music from the movie slowly died out and was replaced by a broken-up whirring sound. Ted frowned, and he turned to face the projector, shielding his eyes from the bright white light. It happened in a flash. A butcher knife from the kitchen came ripping through the projector screen and plunged into the base of Ted's skull. Blood splattered all across the blank screen as Ted was yanked back through the rip in the screen and into the air like a fish on a hook. Jason yanked the knife out of his head with a sickening squish and let his body crumple to the floor in a heap. He looked towards the stairs and started up, breathing laboriously, feeling the rage build again as he heard the running water and sounds of lovemaking. Chapter 8 The hot, steaming water sprayed down on the nude, love-making couple, ricocheting off of the glass shower walls and forming a pool at their feet. It was happening. It was actually happening, Sarah thought as Doug found his way inside of her. Everything was melting inside of her and mingling together to build a huge wave of pleasure and intense ecstasy that started deep in her pelvis and diffused into the rest of her body. She let out a deep moan of pleasure, the steaming hot water running down her back. Doug pressed her gently against the glass shower door, moving with her. How had she been scared of this? This was... This was fucking amazing, she thought, just the two of them alone with the steam. It was even better than Sam had described. She understood now why Sam slept around so much, but Sarah didn't want to have sex like Sam did. She was glad she waited until the time was right. And the time had been right. Sarah was so tired of being scared of saying no, of giving in to her fears and not allowing herself to enjoy things in life. Whether or not it was drugs or sex, she always heard her dad's voice in her mind, warning her that boys only wanted one thing. But after all, what did he know? He didn't understand. Doug was a good guy and waited until Sarah was ready. She felt everything relaxing inside of her. Finally, after all this time being so worried about everything, it all didn't matter. Nothing mattered except for her and Doug, and the hot steam that swirled around them. Doug moved his hips a bit faster and began to voice his pleasure too, until they both crescendoed with the climax of their lovemaking coming to an end. Doug pulled away, kissing Sarah tenderly. Sarah melted into him, her legs weak, still filling him inside of her. She kissed him harder, her hands finding every nook and cranny of his body, touching him, exploring him. Sarah finally pulled away and stared up at him, mesmerized. They both stood, wrapped in each other's arms for a few minutes, feeling the heat of the water and bathing in the steady flow of spray that misted them from the shower head. What had she been so afraid of? They used protection. It was with someone she loved, and she couldn't wait to do it again. Sarah kissed him again, climbed out of the shower, and wrapped herself in a towel. Sarah, I think I'm in heaven... Doug said through the running water. Sarah smiled at him, looking back over her shoulder. I think I'm in love. Doug kissed her again. I'll meet you in the bottom bunk, Sarah said with a wink, and left the room glowing radiantly. Doug looked up at the steam of the water flowing from the shower head, letting it wet his hair, and run down his back. He began to exuberantly sing Tangerine to himself. He couldn't believe they actually had sex. Was he dreaming? Sarah Williams actually just fucked him, 
Unbelievable. He remembered in seventh grade when she was known around school as the prude. She was quite a sight, too. Glasses, acne, braces, the works. She looked like a regular geek. But when she hit ninth grade, puberty hit her full force and the boys were noticing, including himself. On the first day of ninth grade, she came to school with her mousy brown hair curled and highlighted and in heels. Paul actually went for Sarah first, but when she wouldn't have sex, he went for Sam. Doug got the rebound, and sure, he was upset that she wouldn't fuck him. But there was something about Sarah that Doug really liked, something sensitive and really special, different than the other girls. He meant what he said to her on the trail today. He really did love her. It was a deeper love than anything he'd had with other girls, something more intimate. He could sit and have a deep conversation with Sarah just about life, family, their problems, their insecurities. It allowed for a much more intimate relationship, and it allowed for them to just have the best sex Doug had ever had. God, he loved those types of girls, the ones that don't give in to sex on the first date. The down-to-earth girls always ended up being the best sex, probably had something to do with all that sexual frustration. Sarah was one of those girls that you had to get to know them as people first, and deep down, that's what most everyone wants, at least Doug thought. Paul, deep down, loved those kinds of girls, but he suppressed it with his macho girl crazy attitude that always fucked him in the end, like tonight with Sam. Sam was that type of girl, but suppressed it with jealousy and bitchiness. They were deep down right for each other, but their egos usually led to big blowouts like tonight. Where the hell were those two? Hell, they were probably screwing their heads off in the woods. God, he loved her. He really did. She was smart and beautiful and liked to just chill out every once in a while and enjoy the silence and really talk about serious shit. Damn, when he told Paul that Sarah had actually let him have sex with her, imagine the look on his face. Yeah, there was something truly special about Sarah, and he was glad that he was her first time. He wanted it to be perfect, and it was. Doug had even thought about marrying her, even though Paul constantly told him never to get tied down to one chick. But Sarah was the type of girl you marry, Doug had said. After all, what was so wrong about settling down? He didn't have to ask Sarah just yet. They could wait until after school was over and when they both got steady jobs and were settled down in the house somewhere. They could move off to the city, have a few kids. He could go to school and study to be a doctor like he always wanted. Sarah could find her a part-time job and they'd be set for life. Doug was snapped out of his thoughts by the bathroom door creaking open and then closing. Hey, Sarah, did you change your mind? There was no response. A shadow fell over the glass shower door. The glass was blurred and Doug couldn't see out of it. Hop back in, Sarah, there's plenty of room. We could sing a duet, he joked. Still no response. The shadow grew larger. Who is that, Polly? Hey, Polly, is that you? Doug asked. Still no answer. The shadow moved closer to the shower door. Doug let the bar of soap slip from his hand. Whoops, drop my bar of soap, Polly, old buddy. Why don't you get in here and pick it up? <laughs> Doug teased, laughing. Then the shadow grew even larger, and Doug realized by the sheer size of whoever it was, it was not Paul. Doug reached for the sliding door when suddenly two hands punched through the frosted shower glass, shattering it to bits. Doug had no time to see who it was as the huge, callous, bloody hand clamped over his face, obscuring his sight. He slid back on the wet shower floor, trying to maintain his balance, just as the other hand grabbed the other side of his head and smashed it against the tile wall of the shower. Doug tried to scream, but it was muffled by the hand. Jason's thumbs and palm began to press down on either side of Doug's head, as Doug screamed in agony. His skull was beginning to cave in with a sickening, crunching sound as the powerful, vice-like grip of the mad killer broke through facial bones in Doug's nasal cavity. Warm blood began to cascade down his shoulders and pull at his feet. Through the agonizing pain of his face being smashed like mush, Doug tried to swing his fist frantically, but it was of no use. The hand slammed him back into the wall, put both hands on either side of Doug's head, and pulled him forward, slamming his throat down on the broken edge of the shower door, the glass impaling his neck and ending his life quickly. The blood dripped down the walls and swirled around before disappearing into the drain as Jason heard the soft humming of Sarah in the other room.
Sarah hit the off switch on the blow dryer and placed it on the dresser, giving her damp hair a good tassel. She tightened the towel around her nude body and looked at herself proudly in the mirror. You did it, she thought, your first time, and it went perfectly. What had she been so scared of? Would Doug have hurt you, she thought. Now she knew why Sam teased her all the time. That's what everyone was so scared of? It was great, it was fun, it was relaxing, and there was nothing scary about it. Sure, it hurt a little, but after a while it wouldn't hurt at all. Doug had been so gentle with her. He was such a great guy. He had asked her before they started doing it if she was comfortable, if she was ready, and really made sure she wanted to do it beforehand. I'm so lucky, Sarah thought. She couldn't wait to tell Sam and see the look on her face when she found out her best friend just had sex. Sam would be so proud of her, she thought. Sarah primped in the mirror, laughing out loud in jubilancy, feeling like a new person. She started to think about a future with Doug. After all, they had just graduated and some choices were going to have to be made. Where was she going to go? Her parents had started a college fund, but it wasn't much. She wanted to live with Doug now that they'd consummated their relationship, but she didn't think she'd be able to afford rent. Maybe if they both got jobs and had a crappy apartment for a while. But then school was expensive too, and then she didn't know what Doug was even planning after high school. He talked about doing construction, but she hated that it was so dangerous. Maybe they could go to college together if they got jobs as soon as one opened up back in their town, or maybe get a scholarship. She thought about talking to Doug about it, but then again, things were great, and she was totally worry-free. She didn't feel like getting into a serious conversation with him. She finished making up the bottom bunk and walked out into the hallway, stopping outside the closed bathroom door. "'I came to hear you sing,' Sarah said through the door. There was no response. She frowned. "'Doug?' she said. She pushed open the bathroom door and froze. Doug was slumped forward, halfway dangling out of the shower, a jagged shard of frosted glass impaling his throat. There was so much blood all over the shower walls, completely painting the inside of the shower and the floor in front of it. It was something out of one of her worst nightmares, and it was right in front of her. Sarah let out a blood-curdling scream, throwing her hands to her face as adrenaline trip-hammered through her system. Sam! Samantha, oh my god! She shrieked, hurtling herself down the hallway away from the horrible sight and careening down the stairs two at a time in a panic. She sprinted through the living room, saw the blood stain and ripped projector screen and screamed. Oh my god, Sam! Sam! Sam, somebody help me! <laughs> Sarah screamed again, throwing herself at the front door. It wouldn't budge. The back door was her only other option. Just as Sarah started to make a run for it, the front door imploded inwards, the wood splintering to give way for the blade of an axe as it lodged itself in Sarah's chest. Sarah was thrown backwards by the force of the blow, hitting the floor, the axe protruding from her chest. She stared incredulously at the blood blossoming, soaking the towel and pulling around her. And eventually, her body stopped trembling, and her panicked breathing came to a stop. Final showdown. Tommy swept the beam of the flashlight down the basement staircase, listening to the storm howling outside and his own heavy breathing. He hated going down into the basement, the smell, the sounds he heard while he was down there, the cobwebs, the rats you could hear scurrying in the wall. It terrified him. Tommy didn't like being scared, even though he could sit in his room for hours and design the most realistic and terrifying masks. It was just that his mask didn't scare him. They were just a manifestation of all his real-life fears, except he was in control. Sure, his 12-year-old mind didn't really grasp it, but still, he could manipulate the mask how he wanted and make it do exactly what he wanted, but he couldn't control what happened down in the cellar. 
He couldn't control the cockroaches running under his feet or the spider webs that brushed across his face. He couldn't control the shadows dancing around, and he couldn't control it if something was lurking in the dark down there waiting to jump out and eat him alive, watching his every move, smelling his fear, waiting to rip him apart limb by limb and devour him, a monster just like from those movies that he watches. Tommy hated not being in control. When they were robbed back in the city, Tommy hadn't been in control. Someone had violated the sanctity of their tiny studio apartment and taken what was rightfully theirs, and it terrified him. Tommy hated that feeling, the feeling of real, raw terror. All he had done when it had happened was hide in the bathroom closet and cry, and wait until someone came home. He hadn't even tried to stop the creep. He had no control in the situation. He was trapped in the horrifying plot and could not escape or change his destiny. When he made his mask, he felt like he was in control again. That's how they came out so detailed. It was amazing to be able to manipulate every single feature of the mask. The shading under the eyes, the wrinkles in the skin, the sickly yellow shades of rot on the fangs that protruded out from the gaping jaws, the white shimmer in the iris of its eye. He just did them for fun, mostly, but sometimes he would catch himself dreaming and fantasizing before he went to sleep at night about possibly being on the set of a big Hollywood movie, like Godzilla or Raiders of the Lost Ark, or working on the special effects. He wasn't ever scared of the movies that he watched, either. He was a huge fan of Indiana Jones and Godzilla, of course, but also Creature of the Black Lagoon, It Came from Beneath the Sea, and King Kong. The movies didn't scare him because, in a sense, he understood them. He had volume after volume of film encyclopedias that would explain in detail how films worked and how the special effects were set up to make it look so convincingly real. What he couldn't understand was the terror in the real world, what humans do to one another every day. That was the true horror. It was a paralyzing fear that gripped him. It had made him feel like someone was squeezing his heart so tightly that it would burst. It was the fear that had happened that day when the house had been burglarized. He remembered the utter panic of hearing the hinges snap on the front door and heavy footsteps coming down the hall. He couldn't think straight. His mind had screamed at him to get out of the house or to grab a baseball bat. But instead, his body had gone into full flight mode, and he found himself huddling down in the bathroom closet with the door locked. With that kind of fear, there was no reasoning. Reasoning wasn't even an option. He had just gone with his first primal instinct that came to him, to run, to hide, to bury himself down under blankets and never come out, and hope that the horror outside would go away. He could have scared the guy off, but fear overtook him. It made him question every time he laughed at a character in a monster movie making a stupid decision. When you were in a situation like that, you didn't think clearly. He wasn't in control. That's why he hated the basement. That's why he hated the outside world. It was too sporadic for him. He couldn't control it, like he could with his mask and with his monster movies. In Godzilla, he knew what would happen at the end. There were no surprises. But what was outside the cabin door of his family's home, there was no controlling it. Life sometimes just happened, and there wasn't a thing you could do to stop it. That was why he stayed engrossed in his films and his video games and his monster masks. It was a world of his own that he had created, and he could see everything coming. Life wasn't always that way. And now life was happening to him, and he didn't like it at all. The lights were out. Trish was out looking for Mom, and he was in the house all alone, he thought. He was staring precariously down the basement stairs, trying to steady the beam of the flashlight, and trying to muster up his courage. Tommy took a deep breath and stepped on the first step, the wood sagging and squeaking under his feet. The sour smell of mold reached his nostrils, and he grimaced at the sight of a rat moving through the beam of his flashlight, two beady little eyes glowing in the dark. He arched the flashlight around his head, illuminating the silvery sheen of cobwebs strung across the beams above him. He reached the bottom of the staircase and moved through the dark and cluttered cellar, trying not to notice the bugs and the spiders, trying to block out the sound of the rats squeaking in the fright and seeking shelter. He pushed open a small crawlspace door, squeezed through, and his flashlight beam came to rest on the fuse box. Every time the lights had gone out before during a storm, Trish and his mom always made him be the one to go down and fix it. Tommy do this, Tommy kill this spider, Tommy go fix the lights, Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. It was all they ever said, and it made sense to him. 
when his dad left, his mom had looked at him and told him with tearful eyes that he was the man of the house now, and it resonated with him. Of course, what did that mean? At first, it had meant nothing, just another stray comment from his mother, but now he had started to realize it was sort of his responsibility. Of course, his father had only been in a portion of his life, and he never really taught him how to be a true man. He only taught him how to fix a car and ride a bike and other typical boy stuff but never how to actually handle situations like a man, like the head of the household should do, and that scared him too. He hadn't been the man of the house when someone had broken in. He'd have to teach himself, but what did being the man of the house even mean? What would he have to do? It seemed like such an overwhelming responsibility to undertake and a huge burden for him to have to be under. Tommy didn't know what he would do in a really bad situation if one were to happen again. To be perfectly honest, they lived out in the country and nothing all that bad happened anyway. What could he do? How could he take up so, so much responsibility? Just like that. He was 12. He had no idea how to make someone feel better when they were crying or what to say to calm people down or what to do in these awful situations that life inevitably brought. And now he felt a tiny seed of raw terror in his gut as he proceeded towards the fuse box. Where was his mom? And where was Trish? Tommy flipped the breaker switch and let out a sigh of relief as he heard the lights flickering on throughout the house. Then a rustling sound came from a dark shadow of the room, and Tommy didn't even turn around to shine his flashlight in the direction. He scrambled back through the crawl space door, bolted up the staircase, and slammed the basement door shut, fastening the lock. He let out a sigh of relief just as he heard the front door bang open and the storm rumbling outside come rushing into the cabin. Tommy dashed into the foyer as he met Trish, frantically running into the kitchen to meet him. Rob came in shortly behind her, wielding a machete. Both of them were soaked from the rain and wide-eyed with fear. They slammed the cabin door shut and locked it. "'Tommy, thank God!' she said, hugging him tightly. Tommy could see the panic in her eyes. "'Trish, what's going on?' Tommy asked fearfully. "'Tommy, is Mom back yet?' "'No, not yet,' Tommy said." Trish gave Rob a look, her eyes wide with worry, and she made a beeline for the telephone in the kitchen. I'm going to call for help, Trish said, hurriedly rotating the dial. There was no dial tone when she put the receiver to her ear, and the color drained from her face. Rob, what's going on? Tommy asked, fear starting to take over. The storm must have blown the phone lines down, Rob said. I'm going to go next door. Jason could be killing them one by one, he thought. He had to stop him. What the trio didn't see was the hulking figure just outside the kitchen door, the broken phone box in his hand, ripped from the wall of the cabin like it was a toy. Trish slammed the phone down in frustration. I'm going with you. No, Rob said staunchly. It isn't safe. Trish stepped closer, looking him in the eyes. I'm going with you she said more resolutely. She turned to Tommy and grabbed him by the shoulders. She didn't want to tell him anything and didn't want to scare him anymore, so she did her best to convey the seriousness of the situation with her eyes. Tommy, stay here and lock the doors, okay? Hold the fort, Tommy, Rob said, and they both ran for the door, as Tommy stood there flabbergasted and scared out of his mind. He judged from their manic behavior that this was real and it was happening and he was galvanized into action, running frantically to make sure every door was locked. Trish stopped suddenly before they went out the front door and saw Gordon perched on the couch. She motioned him to follow. They had to get out of there, she thought. They had to somehow get everyone out of the rental house and into the car. But come to think of it, she didn't know where her keys were. She had been holding them when she had gone down the path looking for her mom, but that was the last time she had seen them. God, they were all trapped there with that maniac, my mother that had been talking about, she thought. The reality of the situation was dawning on her slowly as they followed the narrow, muddy path that led to the rental house. The rain came down like tiny bits of hell on the two of them, and lightning cracked across the sky like long, incandescent skeletal fingers as they approached the now-quiet vacation home. The lights were out and everything was still. There was no sign of life anymore. Trish began to feel a pang of dread in her gut as she huddled closely behind Rob. They both climbed down the porch stairs and stopped dead in their tracks. There was a huge gaping hole in the front door and shards of wood were lying all around the floor. 
Trish cowered behind Rob, feeling her heart begin to race. He's been here, Rob said, gripping his machete tighter. Gordon all of a sudden began to bark and snarl, baring his teeth like he was possessed. He was looking straight at the house, his hair standing up on end. What if he still is here? Trish asked hysterically. Here, take this, Rob said, holding out his machete. Trish shook her head, intimidated by the huge, razor-sharp blade. Take it! Trish reluctantly took the machete from his hand and held it out in front of her, like it was a venomous snake as Rob quietly pushed what was left of the front door open into the house. An eerie, oppressive silence had fallen over the once rambunctious and rowdy vacation home. It was far too quiet, and it was dark except for a bright white light coming from the main room and a loud mechanical whirring. Trish and Rob inched further into the house, seeing the still-running video camera and projector screen set up in the living room. The projector screen was ripped right through the middle and stained with red. Trish felt a chill run down her spine, and she and Rob exchanged looks. It was blood. She knew it. It was blood. This is happening, she thought. Gordon started to whimper, growling menacingly. Trish stroked him behind the ears, hushing him, trying to act like she wasn't scared shitless. She crept through the house behind Rob, gripping the handle of the machete so tightly her knuckles were turning white. I'm going to the basement to turn on the lights. Stay here with Gordon, Rob said. No, Trish protested. Stay here with Gordon, he demanded firmly. Trish sighed with compliance and handed him the flashlight. Here, she said. He shone the light into a small alcove at the end of the hall and walked further inside, the beam coming to rest on the half-open basement door. Trish could see the beads of sweat trickling down his forehead and his chest heaving. He was trying hard to mask his fear, but she could tell he was scared shitless as well. Rob whipped his bowie knife out of his pocket, held it out defensively, and tried to keep a steady hand on the wavering beam of light. He nudged open the door and shone the flashlight down into the musty, dark interior of the basement. Trish watched in fearful anticipation as he started down the basement steps eventually disappearing into the darkness. She felt another chill across her bare arm as she realized she was now alone in the hallway. Where the hell was Gordon? She tightened her grip on the machete, looking all around her for any sign of the dog. God, I know he's here, she thought, her mind racing and fluttering with panicked thoughts. That maniac was here. She just knew something was horribly wrong. It was so quiet in the rental house, a deathly still silence that unnerved her. And then she heard a whimpering. It was Gordon, and he was scared to death. Trish hurried back into the living room towards the sound just in time to see Gordon go sprinting up the staircase to the second floor, whining the whole way, his tail tucked between his legs. Gordon! Trish shouted in a strained whisper. Gordon! Then there was the sound of breaking glass in silence. Trish glanced at the basement stairs and then back at the upstairs hallway where Gordon had just vanished. She held the machete out in front of her, ready to strike, an inch towards the stairs. Her heart was about to burst through her chest, and her hands were clammy and trembling. Every hair on her body was standing on its end, and she felt the lump in her throat growing to the size of the one in her gut, screwing tighter and tighter, until it felt like someone was hitting her repeatedly in the stomach as hard as they possibly could. It's all a misunderstanding, she kept telling herself. His body was stolen. Jason's body was stolen, and that's why it's missing. Bodies get stolen all the time. Jason is dead. This was all some joke. She kept picturing all the teenagers jumping out of their hiding spots yelling surprise and laughing at their hilarious joke, hoping that her fantasy would come true. But this felt all too real. A voice in the back of her mind kept telling her Rob was right, and she was fighting desperately not to listen. She glanced at the bloody projector screen, trying to convince herself that it wasn't blood. Trish precariously began to climb the staircase, listening to every creak on the floorboards and watching every fleeting shadow. She reached the second floor hallway and pushed open one of the bedroom doors to reveal an empty room. Gordon! she yelled. Gordon! She saw another door that stood wide open, and when she looked inside, she gasped at the broken glass littering the floor. Gordon had broken through one of the windows in the bedroom. 
Trisha's blood ran cold. Something or someone spooked the shit out of him. Trish instantaneously felt everything in her body telling her to run and get the hell out of that house. Get out! Run! He's here! Jason is here! Her mind screamed at her. She started to move for the stairs and then she froze. From where she was standing, she could see straight into the open bathroom and she saw the red on the floor, the crimson red staining the tile. Trish didn't know why she didn't run. Something, some kind of primal animalistic curiosity was drawing her towards the slightly ajar bathroom door. She made her way towards the bathroom, pushed open the door, and her stomach sank into her feet at what she saw. It was Sarah, strung up from the bathroom ceiling light like a slab of meat, an axe protruding from her chest. Blood stained the white towel wrapped around her naked body and dribbled down her leg, pulling below her dangling feet. Doug's nude, blood-soaked corpse was propped up in the closet. What was left of his face was twisted in a frozen, soundless scream. A carving knife impelled through his throat. The room was flooded and the floor was covered in several inches of water mixed with the red of blood that swirled down the drain under Sarah's dangling corpse. Trish let out a horrible, piercing shriek that erupted from her throat, and she instinctively went careening in a blind panic down the staircase. Rob! Rob, he's here! Rob! She screamed, panic-stricken and inconsolably hysterical, bolting down the stairs and through the main room, almost tripping on the projector cables. She ran into the hallway and down the basement stairs where Rob met her coming the other way. Trish! Trish, what's the matter? Rob asked, frantically trying to calm her. She was incoherent at this point, a blubbery, sobbing mess. Rob, he's here. They're all dead. He's killed them all. I know it. Trish stammered hysterically, petrified beyond reality. Rob gave her one horrified look and grabbed her hand, pulling her up the stairs. Come on, let's get the hell out of here, he said. All of a sudden, there was the sound of splintering wood, and the rickety basement staircase gave way, sending Rob's left foot slamming through and wedging down in the beams below the steps. Shit, give me a hand, Rob exclaimed, trying in a desperate attempt to free his foot. Trish yanked on his leg with all of her strength, tears streaming down her face. His foot finally gave way and they started back up the stairs, when Rob suddenly went back down on an impulse. Wait, my knife, he said. Trish tried to stop him, sobbing with fear. No! She shrieked. It was too late. Rob was running back down into the darkened basement. No! No, Rob! Let's just go, Rob! Trish screamed. She scrambled down the steps just in time to see someone else was in the basement with them. For a split second, Trish saw him, illuminated by the moonlight filtering in through the basement window. She saw the huge man in the tattered work suit and goalie mask lunge at Rob and heave him into a row of shells, smashing it to bits. Rob cried out in pain as Trish screamed bloody murder. Trish, run! Run, Trish! Oh, God! Rob screamed. Do something! Trish's mind was yelling at her, but her body wouldn't let her. She was frozen, her body racked with unimaginable horror. All she could do was watch in helpless, paralyzing terror at the bottom of the stairs as Jason grabbed a gardening fork off of a shelf in a wild blur and began to hack at Rob mercilessly. Time seemed to slow down as Trish could see his monstrous arm slashing rapidly and violently and all the blood, and she heard Rob's cries of agony. She screamed and screamed over and over again until her throat was raw, trying to get Jason's attention, trying to make him stop, but he was savagely swinging at Rob again and again in an unstoppable rage. He's killing me! Trish, he's killing me! Run! Run! Rob bellowed in pain. Finally, Trish's instinct surged through her body and she spun around, scrambling up the staircase as fast as she could and stopping at the top to look back down. Rob's screams had stopped, and there was nothing but an unbearable silence. She began to hyperventilate, her mind racing. She couldn't just leave. She had to do something. She couldn't leave him down there to die. She mustered up every ounce of strength and courage in her and ran back down the basement steps, stopping dead in her tracks halfway down. Trish could barely make out Rob's mangled body on the floor in the moonlight. She saw the bright red blood flowing from the gaping wound in his head and let out a horrified sob. Rob! She whimpered, tears streaming down her face. A wave of nausea had begun to hit her at the sight of Rob's mutilated body 
and she held back her instinct to gag. Then she felt the terror and panic kick in. That maniac was still down there, and she realized it was such force that she slammed back up the staircase as fast as she could. Just as she reached the top, a filthy hand reached through the hole where Rob's leg had broken through and grabbed her by the ankle. Trish shrieked, looked down and saw two demented eyes staring at her through the eye holes of the mask. Suddenly, the machete wasn't a poisonous snake anymore, and she swung it as hard as she could, screaming bloody murder, satisfied at the sight of the rusty blade slashing into Jason's wrist and the bloody gashes opening in his disgusting, grimy flesh. Jason growled in pain and released his grip on her ankle, and Trish bolted up the stairs and slammed the basement door shut. Get the fuck out of here! Get Tommy and get the fuck out of here! Trisha's mind urged, and she ran through the house to the front door, yanking it open. She cupped her hands in her mouth in horror and disgust at what she saw. It was Tina, wet from the rain, sprawled on the doorstep. Her neck was twisted at such an unnatural angle, and her eyes were bugging out of her skull. Trish recoiled with shock and backed away into the living room, stumbling over the projector cables again the panic of the situation beginning to overtake her. She looked towards the basement door and heard him, thundering up the stairs, and with a look of sheer dread, her instinct snapped her back to reality. Trish sprinted for the kitchen in a panic, threw open the back door and screamed at the top of her lungs. It was Jimmy, crucified to the door frame. Four huge spikes nailed through his hands and feet, a huge gash in the middle of his face. She brought her hands to her face and screamed, hyperventilating, and then, looking frantically for a way out, she saw the kitchen window above the sink. Trish didn't have time to unlock it and open it. Jason was coming through the living room looking for her, smashing things in his path. She snatched up a chair from the table and hurled it at the glass, smashing it on impact. She dropped the chair, climbed up onto the counter, and threw the machete out onto the ground first. Then she dove through the window picked up the machete and started running through the pouring rain towards the Jarvis house, just as Jason grabbed at her over the sill. Jason growled in anger as he watched her run, screaming, but then felt the bubbling, seething rage that threatened to consume him subside as he heard her terrified screams. Scream, just like he screamed when no one would come to save him in the lake. Scream, just like his mother had screamed. Feel the terror that he felt. Feel the horror and helplessness. Feel the anguish that his mother felt about losing him. Feel the anger and heartbreak. He had watched her see Rob being murdered, just like he watched his mother be decapitated that night on the shore of the lake. She still had to die. Hearing her horrified screaming eased the rage within him, but it was back in a matter of seconds. Jason walked towards the back door and ripped Jimmy from the door frame the nails tearing through his hands, and his lifeless body was hurled several feet through the air like it was made of cardboard. He headed straight for the Jarvis house, with the insatiable lust to kill, driving him forward. Tommy heard the frantic hammering on the front door and the panic screaming, and ran to open it. Trish scrambled inside, slamming the front door and locking it. She was drenched in rain and hysterical, splattered with the flecks of Rob's blood still clutching the bloody machete in her trembling hand. Tommy, are all the doors locked? Yes, Tommy replied, his eyes wide. I need you to get me a hammer and nails right now, Trish ordered firmly, setting the machete down by the door. All of the color drained from Tommy's face when she saw just how terrified Trish was. Tommy, go get the hammer and nails now, she screamed frantically. They didn't have any time, her mind screamed. He would be here any minute. The key, she thought, no time. She didn't know where they were. She ran into the living room and began to make her rounds, locking every window and bolting every door. 
She saw the newspaper clippings and the artist sketch of young Jason Voorhees on the table and realized Tommy knew all about him. Tommy was in and out of the laundry room in two seconds, hurrying into the foyer with the hammer and nails. As she saw the look in his eyes, she knew that he had read the articles. Trish took a nail and began driving it into the front door, securing it to the frame, and then started with another. No way she was letting this old door hold Jason by itself. Trish could picture Jason being able to break through it like paper. She tried to focus on securing the door, but she kept seeing the blood and the bodies in Rob's lifeless form just lying there over and over in her head. It was throbbing in her head. This can't be happening, she thought, as she pounded in the last knell and backed away from the door, shaking with fear. Trish, Tommy started to say, the inevitable reality of the situation beginning to hit him in one overwhelming rush. Tommy, it's going to be okay. Just go make sure all the windows are locked, Trish said, trying her best to console him. But even she had a horrible feeling this would probably all be in vain. Jason had killed that entire group of kids and Rob. Trish knew they probably didn't stand a chance. He was going to come for both of them and kill them like he killed all the others. Trish didn't want to think that her own mother was dead and that soon they might be dead, but she knew the horrible truth all too well. Tommy didn't move. He was standing by the staircase watching the front door with huge eyes, ravaged with the horror of what he was realizing. They had to get out. They had to run to the main road. They had to get away. All of a sudden, they both leaped out of their skin as the huge picture window in the living room imploded inwards, and Rob's blood-soaked corpse came crashing down on the hardwood floor. The gardening fork was embedded in his skull. Trish screamed as Tommy just stood frozen in shock at the sight. Rob, Trish said, her eyes wet with tears. She bent down and shook him slightly, a tiny sliver of hope in her that he was still alive. But... He didn't budge. Then Trish heard another deafening crash, and she sprang to her feet to see a terrifying sight. Tommy had backed into the other huge window in the room, and Jason was now reaching through the shattered glass, his arms wrapped around Tommy's tiny form, and pulling him through the window. Trish! Trish, he's got me! Trish! Let me go! Tommy screamed at the top of his lungs. Trish screamed a battle cry, snatched up the hammer from the floor, and ran to the window. She looked at Jason dead and his hate-filled eyes through the holes of that hockey mask, and she began to swing the hammer at his head, delivering solid blows, but Jason didn't budge. It barely phased him. She was bashing him as hard as she could, but he didn't seem to feel a thing. She could smell the acrid body odor and his stinking hot breath through the mask. She saw his eyes again, and she caught the loathing, the hatred. She didn't have time to think about it, because he was reeling back to drag Tommy's comparatively tiny body through the glass. In a last frantic effort, Trish swung the other end of the hammer with all of her might at Jason's head, and the two claws of the hammer buried themselves in the side of Jason's neck, right under his left ear. Jason growled in pain, finally releasing his grip on Tommy and staggering back out into the night. Trish wrapped both of her arms around Tommy and pulled him safely into the house. With two hands, Jason ripped the hammer out and began stalking towards the front door. Trish saw him walking towards the door, and in a flash, she grabbed Tommy's hand and yanked him towards the staircase. Just as they stopped at the bottom of the stairs, the front door exploded inwards, and Jason came smashing through like a bull. He had just walked right through it. Tommy's jaw dropped as he saw the deranged killer who was now in the living room with them. He was unstoppable. They both watched in disbelief as Jason reared back and hurled the hammer at them. It whistled through the air and impelled itself in the doorframe right beside Trish's head. Then he advanced towards them, his hulking figure looming upon them, his crazed eyes boring into Trish's soul. Follow me up, Tommy screamed, running up the staircase with Trish not far behind. She followed Tommy frantically into his room. They heard Jason thundering up the steps after them and quickly closed the door, bolting it. Trish frantically searched for a way to barricade the door, and then she grabbed Tommy's tall wooden armoire that he used to shelve all of his masks and action figures, sliding it across the floor in front of the door. Tommy, help me, she said. The two of them managed to heave the enormous dresser in front of the door and backed away from it, 
crouching down and hugging each other tightly in the middle of the room, waiting to see what would happen. There were a few seconds of agonizing silence, and then the door began to rattle and quake violently. Tommy screamed, tears finding their way down his cheeks as Trish hugged him tighter, trying to keep him calm. She was starting to lose it as well, her heart racing, tears streaming down her face as her mind desperately attempted to figure out what to do. After a few more seconds of Jason shaking and banging on the door, it suddenly got quiet. It was another maddening silence. God, what is he doing? Trish wondered aloud, still holding the petrified and trembling Tommy tightly against her chest. She expected something, anything to happen, but nothing did. Everything was quiet. And then out of nowhere, there was the sound of splintering wood and an axe smashing through the door. Tommy screamed in fright, and Trish tried to cover his mouth with her hands, but it was no use. Jason knew exactly where they were. Jason swung the axe again, and all Trish and Tommy could do was watch in horror as the barrier keeping them inside and Jason outside was being destroyed. Seeing Jason start to reach his arm into the room, Trish knew she had to act fast. They were trapped like cage animals. He was going to kill them in this room. She had to knock the bastard out long enough for them to make a fucking run for it. It was their only chance of survival. It had to be something to incapacitate him. There was no going up against him with an axe. Trish scanned the room madly for a weapon. The knife replicas on Tommy's wall weren't sharp enough. There was a baseball bat in the corner, but it was made of foam. Oh, fuck, she thought. Then she turned her head towards Tommy's desk and her eyes lit up madly. Trish ran to the desk and lifted Tommy's computer monitor off the desk and heaved it into the air, carrying it across the room on her shoulder. Jason was shoving the dresser out of the way, reaching his head and arm into the room. He never saw it coming. Trish slammed the monitor down on his head with all of her strength and watched the sparks fly. Jason's body convulsed wildly as smoke began to fill the room. Trish ran back over to Tommy and shielded him from the sparks, putting up her own hands to deflect them from herself. The monitor crashed to the floor and Jason staggered back into the hallway with a dazed groan crashing to the floor like a fallen tree. Then it was silence again, and Trish and Tommy didn't dare move or make a sound, listening and waiting to see if he was really dead. Jason didn't get up. Smoke still lingered in the air. Trish stood to her feet, gestured for Tommy to stay, and inched towards the door, looking through the gaping hole in the bedroom door. Jason was lying motionless, but Trish could see his chest rising and falling, and his head still reeling from the blow. He was just unconscious. They didn't have much time. She motioned for Tommy to come to the door, and when he came, she grabbed him by the shoulders and looked him dead in the eyes. Tommy, I'm going to get him out of the house, and when I do, I want you to run like hell. Do you hear me? You run like hell, Trish said, clenching her teeth in a hushed whisper careful not to wake the unconscious killer, sprawled in the hallway just a foot away. He had to make a run for it. It was their only hope. Tommy was faster than her, and if he could make it to the nearest house, he could call the police and send them here. Tommy nodded in response, still shaking like a leaf. Trish quietly opened what was left of the door and stepped out into the hallway. She lifted her foot as quietly as she could and stepped over the hulking killer on the floor in front of her. She held her breath and stepped further over him, creeping around him to finally get to the other side, not daring to make any noise, exchanging tight glances with Tommy. Just as she passed him and started to move for the staircase, Jason shot upright, picked up the dropped axe, and swung it at Trish. Trish! Tommy cried. The axe embedded itself in the wall, nicking Trish's right shoulder in the process, tearing through the blue cotton dress and ripping her flesh. As Jason struggled to pry the axe from the wall, Trish shrieked and lurched forward down the hallway, grabbing hold of the banister for support as she looked incredulously at the blood beginning to flow from the gash on her arm. Jason gave up on the axe and started to head for Tommy, who backed away in fear, shaking his head, pleading. No! Tommy! Trish screamed. Chase me, you son of a bitch! She thought. Jason turned to Trish and then back to Tommy and then back to Trish, as if he were deciding who to go after first. No, Trish! Tommy yelled, but Trish kept urging him on. 
No! Trish screamed. Leave him alone! Jason complied. He charged at Trish with full force, and Trish screamed, rolling around and running down the staircase, hearing Tommy urging her on above her. Trish bolted for the front door, leaping through what was left of it, and ran out into the pouring rain. She spun around and saw Jason barreling out of the house towards her. That's right, chase me, you fucker, Trish thought. She had to get him away from the house so Tommy could get out of there. She ran as fast as she could down the muddy path, keeping as much distance as she could between them. Jason was hot on her trail. Trish looked over her shoulder to see Jason coming up on her, horrifyingly fast, barreling across the yard like a pro quarterback. She shrieked at the sight of the hockey mask right behind her and ran faster, almost slipping in the mud, making a mad dash towards the only place she knew to go, back down the path towards the rental house. She jumped over Tina's bloodied body lying on the porch, not even registering the sight, and scrambled into the house, not bothering to close the door. Jason was right behind her. She stopped at the foot of the stairs and turned around, seeing Jason standing there in the doorway, his huge form blocking out the light from the moon outside. His shoulders were heaving. He was fuming, his eyes glaring at her with that insatiable lust to kill, full of blazing fury that threatened to explode out of him at any moment. She bolted up the stairs, because it happened so fast. The next thing Trish knew, Jason was running at her again, and she screamed. Jason, just an arm's reach behind her, growling as she ran down the hallway, coming to the end and turning around to see the madman at the top of the stairs, those demented, unblinking eyes still staring at her. It was a standoff. Trish stared back, hyperventilating and sobbing, pleading with him. She wanted to try to evoke any kind of sympathy that she could out of this maniac, but she knew it was no use. He was an unstoppable monster, and there was nothing she could do. He kept staring her down, his eyes devoid of any empathetic response or emotion. She was trapped at the end of the hallway like a caged animal, awaiting slaughter. Shrinking back into the corner with fear, Trish backed away, shaking her head. God, please just leave us alone. Please don't hurt Tommy, she thought. Jason didn't flinch. He charged at her. Trish instinctively turned, looking for a place to run, and she saw the large picture window at the end of the hall. It was her only shot. With a scream and a quick split second to brace herself, she ran towards the window, made a flying leap, and threw herself at the glass. Fortunately, the glass smashed through on impact, and Trish went flying through the window and through the air, hitting the porch roof, smashing through the wooden balcony railing, and landing hard on her back in the mud. Jason leaned through the shattered window and looked down at Trish, lying on her back on the muddy ground, motionless. Trish struggled to breathe for a moment. The wind knocked out of her, squinting through the rain falling down on her face. She could barely see him staring down at her from the window, and she held her breath tightly, hoping he would think she was dead. The second she saw him disappear into the rental house, Trish slowly started to pull herself to her feet as fast as she could and started running back towards home. She could feel the pain in her right leg that was shooting all the way up towards her thigh, but she ignored it, the adrenaline rush completely blocking all other sensations out. She could see the blood on her arms from where the glass had cut her, but she didn't care. She had to get back to the house and try to get away. She saw the car sitting under the tree in its usual spot. Maybe Tommy wasn't too far ahead and she could catch up with him in the car. That is, if he made it out of the house. It probably wouldn't even work, but she had to try. The keys had to be hanging in the kitchen. Trish clambered up the front porch steps of their log cabin, dragging her pained ankle behind her, and hobbled into the front room, staring down at what was left of the front door. Tommy! She called into the quiet house. She heard his voice call out from upstairs. God damn it, Trish thought. Tommy, you were supposed to leave! Trish screamed hysterically through tears. What the hell was he doing up there? Suddenly, out of the corner of her eyes, she saw it. Jason coming through the front door behind her. She could hear his boots thudding softly across the floor, and she smelled him, that awful stench of sweat and filth, and heard the deep labored breathing. He was in the house. Trish froze, searching her surroundings for a weapon. Rob's machete was leaning against the wall by the door. 
She discreetly grabbed for the machete, and just as Jason reached out to grab her, Trish swung around, the machete blade slicing through the air and just missing his head, cutting into the door frame. Trish yanked the machete out of the wooden frame and backed into the dining room, Jason advancing menacingly towards her. His eyes were wide. He was angrier than ever. She swung the machete again and missed, smashing a picture frame on the wall. She swung again, and Jason jumped back to avoid the blade. Stay away from me, Trish screamed, swinging at him again. He reached for her arms outstretched. Trish swung, and this time she made contact. The blade sliced into his left hand, right between the knuckles of Jason's middle and ring finger. Jason growled in pain and yanked his arm back instinctively. He held up his hand staring with his head tilted psychotically at the blood spurting from the gaping wound that had almost split his hand in half. Trish looked on in horror, shock, and relief that she had actually hit him, but that soon faded. The wound hardly fazed him. He lunged at her again and Trish screamed, looping around the dining room table and running into the living room. Tommy, get the hell out of here! Trish screamed up the staircase and leaped back to avoid another grab from Jason. No! she screamed. She swung the machete and missed. Jason kept coming, completely unafraid of the razor-sharp blade slashing at him. You son of a bitch, I'll give you something to remember us by, Trish said through clenched teeth, her fear quickly bubbling up into anger. She reared back like a slugger and swung the machete like a baseball bat. The blade lodged deep in Jason's chest. He didn't flinch. Jason snarled with rage, and with a single swipe of his hand knocked Trish to the floor. She screamed as Jason lunged at her, climbing on top of her and pinning her to the floor. Trish hysterically began to fight with everything in her. She kicked, screamed, clawed, but to no avail. He was huge and he was too powerful. The stench of his body odor was making her gag. His hands were grabbing for her throat. He straddled her and she started punching him in his mask, hammering the tough plastic with all of the strength she had left in her. It was no use. It was not affecting him. He was going to kill her right there, right there on her own living room floor, leaving her bloody, mangled body there for Tommy to see and have that image of his sister ingrained in his brain forever. God, you bastard, just please spare Tommy. Please don't hurt him, she thought her life flashing through her eyes. Time seemed to slow down as she began to picture all the things he could do to her. Would he do other things to her, torture her, rape her? No, Trish thought in horror. She saw the look in his demented eyes and knew exactly what he was planning to do. He took both of his hands and wrapped them around Trish's throat, clamping down and strangling the life out of her. He was going to kill her plain and simple. Trish couldn't scream, and she felt her body going weak from the loss of oxygen. She clawed at his hands, tried to pry them free from her neck, but it was hopeless. And then, almost by godsend, a voice rang out loud and clear. Jason! Jason! The voice bellowed. It was inhuman, it was filled with anger, but still held the youthfulness of a child. It was Tommy's voice, Trish realized, but something was different. Jason! The voice continued, until finally Jason stopped strangling Trish and looked up at the staircase. Trish glanced up as well and saw her brother standing there, his head almost completely shaved. Tommy stared at Jason in the eyes, through the holes in the hockey mask. Jason, remember me? Tommy asked, walking closer to Jason, talking in a soothing, hypnotic voice. God, no, Tommy, Tommy, what the hell are you doing? Get the hell out! Out of here! Trish's mind screamed. Run! Save yourself! She tried to signal to him with her eyes to run and get the fuck out, but Tommy's eyes were transfixed on Jason. What was he doing? She scrunched up her face in bewilderment. Then she realized what he was doing and she was in awe. He looked like... He looked just like the artist's sketch in the newspaper of Jason as a little boy. It was almost as if he recreated the sketch to a T. He had put foundation on to make his face look deathly and pale, and made dark circles around his eyes. He had shaved his head, but not completely, leaving sparse patches of hair like in the photo. He had cut his jeans off at the knee like the shorts the little boy was wearing. It was almost like he was creating one of his masks or one of his action figures. He was young Jason Voorhees. 
Trish tried to say something, but Tommy gave her a knowing look. She knew exactly what he was doing. She saw Tommy's eyes flicker over towards the machete discarded on the rug, and Trisha's mind clicked into place. It was a distraction, and it was working. Jason was either confused or intrigued and was just kneeling motionless, cocking his head to the side like some kind of confused and curious animal, staring at Tommy, staring at what looked like himself as a child in a silent daze. Trish, this is your chance, her mind screamed. Jason rose to his feet and stared at Tommy almost in a trance. Jason, remember what you were, Jason, don't you remember? Tommy said, drawing Jason closer and closer until they were an arm's reach apart. It was working. My God, it was working, Trish thought excitedly. It was putting the bastard in some kind of trance. It was working. Trish had to act fast before Jason realized their plan. She quietly but quickly snatched the machete up from the floor and crept behind Jason, slowly bringing the machete back over her shoulder. She wasn't fast enough as he heard her quiet and furtive footsteps and spun around, snapping out of it and leering at her. Trish panicked as she saw the utter loathing in those eyes and swung the machete at his head with all of her might. Her panicking had caused her to miss her mark, but the machete grazed Jason's mask, knocking it off his head and sending it flying. What was under the mask made Trish recoil in pure, unadulterated repulsion and terror, and the machete fell from her hands onto the wooden floor. He didn't even look human. His features were distorted and grotesque. His skin was graying and decayed, covering it in oozing sores. It was ten times more horrifying than any of Tommy's masks. This wasn't made of rubber. This was all too real. He was a monster. Trish cupped her hands to her mouth in sheer shock and disgust and fell backwards onto the floor, scuttling backwards and shaking her head, pleading as Jason advanced towards her. All she could do was watch helplessly. His mouth opened, revealing a set of broken and rotting teeth. It was something out of a nightmare. What happened next, Trish didn't see coming. She heard Tommy's voice scream Jason's name with a fury that she didn't know Tommy had in him. When Jason turned to face Tommy, Tommy swung the machete at the side of Jason's head like a pro batter. This time, it didn't miss. It buried deep into the side of Jason's skull, slicing through his deformed flesh all the way up to the hilt and cutting through the side of his left eye. Blood squirted out and dribbled down Jason's cheek. Tommy stared on in shock as Trish stood with her hands at her face, crying hysterically and hyperventilating. They both watched in terror and hopeful anticipation as Jason fell to his knees and pitched forward, landing on the machete protruding from his eye and burying the blade deeper into his skull. The grotesque abnormalities of his face were twitching and moving around, and his body began convulsing. A white foam formed at his mouth as the machete was driven even deeper through his head and out at the base of his skull, dark blood and brain matter beginning to pull around him. Jason finally hit the floor, the machete going all the way through, and laid there motionless. Trish was inconsolable, and as she saw that he was finally dead, her body began to gradually stop trembling violently, and her hyperventilating had started to slow down. She stared at Tommy in disbelief with bloodshot eyes. Tommy was frozen in astonishment, a blank, emotionless expression on his face, trying to process what had just happened. It was over. It was all over. The initial shock of it slowly resolved into an overwhelming relief that washed over both of them. Trish sprang to her feet and ran to Tommy, embracing him. Tommy began to cry into Trish's arms, turning from a killer into a scared little boy trembling, all over with fright. She wanted to say something, ask him what came over him, ask him if he was okay, but she was barely able to speak. She just wanted to hold him and tell him everything would be all right. Jason was dead. He was dead and the nightmare was over. Then, without warning, Jason's hand came to life, grabbing Trisha's ankle. She let out a bone-chilling scream and yanked her foot away. What happened next was the ultimate shock. She watched as Tommy picked up the machete, and in a split second, his tiny body went into a frenzy. He lifted the machete into the air and brought it down on Jason's body. Again, and again, and again, and again. Tommy! 
Tommy! Trish screamed, trying to snap him out of it. But he was in some sort of trance. She didn't even recognize him. His face was contorted in an almost inhuman way. He was screaming madly. Die! 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 Trish had never seen anything like it before. She didn't want to believe it. God, Tommy, he's dead. Tommy, he's dead. She wanted to stop it, but she couldn't. The room began to spin. She fell to her knees, her body finally giving in to an exhaustion and sank down, down into oblivion, into nothingness, into the unconscious, into visions of blood and death and shades of red and white. Tommy kept hacking away at Jason, over and over, screaming, die, 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 die. Epilogue. Trisha's eyes fluttered open and she came to, realizing she was in the living room of the house. She looked down at her clothes, seeing the blood and mud caked all over her from head to toe. Then she remembered last night and, when she took a few seconds to process everything, she let out a sob. Jason was lying on the floor in front of her, his head nothing but a mass of bloody tissue. The machete still driven through his skull up to the hilt and transfixing his body to the floor. She could see bits of brain and gore through the rotting skin, and she grimaced. The house was quiet. Tommy was nowhere in sight. Trish looked over and saw Rob still lying there on the hardwood floor in a pool of blood and broken glass. It didn't faze her. After all she had seen, after seeing Doug and Sarah and Jimmy's mangled bodies and seeing her brother hack a madman to death, she had become totally drained of all of her emotions. She slowly pulled herself to her feet, wincing in agony as she dragged her limp ankle over to the window. Bright sunlight was flooding in through the two broken windows, and birds were chirping peacefully. Her eyes lit up as she saw the police cars coming down the winding country road. Tommy! Tommy! Let's get out of here! The police are here! Trish called, but there was no answer. She looked towards the stairs, no sign of Tommy. Tommy! She called again, still no answer. Trish stepped over Jason's unmoving body and began walking up the stairs. She got to the second floor and rounded the banister, going down to the last door on the right and pushing open what was left of Tommy's bedroom door. His room was empty. The smashed computer monitor was still on the floor. Trish stepped back, confused. Where the hell was he? The sirens outside were growing louder. Tommy! Trish started to say, when a noise caught her attention. It was the sound of running water. Then she saw the water flowing out from under the bathroom door. What the hell? She muttered, moving to the bathroom door and opening it. The bathroom was flooded. Water was up over Trish's ankles. She gasped in horror at what she saw. The bathtub was filled with blood. Her mother was lying there in the tub of blood, her eyes closed peacefully, motionless. Mom! Trish exclaimed in horror, rushing to the side of the bathtub and lifting her nude body out of the water. She cradled her lifeless mother in her arms, sobbing hysterically. All of a sudden, her mother came to life, grabbing Trish by the neck and squeezing. Trish tried to scream, but the hands were too strong. They were strangling her. She saw into her mother's eyes and they opened, revealing nothing but white. Her mother's mouth opened and a waterfall of blood erupted out. Trish recoiled, pushing her mother's hands away, finally, screaming again and again in pure terror. She sprang to her feet and ran for the bathroom door. Standing there in the bathroom doorway was Tommy, wearing the hockey mask, an axe in his hands. He swung it right at Trish's heart. Trish woke up screaming. Two hands pinned her back down to the bed and her eyes flashed open, a white light blinding her. Trisha's body relaxed as she realized she was safe. There was no dead mother, no Tommy with an axe, 
just a hospital room surrounded by police. She stopped screaming, seeing the concerned faces of the officers. Mrs. Jarvis, are you all right? Trish looked around the room, letting it sink in all at once, and she remembered all of it. Rob being murdered, that maniac chasing her and Tommy through the house, Tommy grabbing that machete and going absolutely batshit crazy. It all came back to her and hit her like a truck. She let out a small sob as she looked down and saw the gauze on her ankle, and the gauze wrapped around tightly on her upper arm where Jason had hit her with the axe. Yes, <clears throat> yeah, I'm okay. Where's my mother? Where's Tommy? Trish asked. She saw several pained expressions and her heart sank. Ma'am, your little brother is in the next room. He's fine. But your mother didn't make it, one officer said, stepping closer to the bed. Trish felt tears welling up and a lump forming in her throat. Is everybody dead? Yes. The only ones alive are you and the boy. Tommy did a real number on that guy, another officer remarked. Trish remembered seeing her brother kill the crazed maniac on their living room floor. She shuddered thinking about it. She'd never seen Tommy like that. It just wasn't him. That couldn't have been her brother. Is... is Tommy okay? He went crazy, Trish said. Under extreme duress, people can perform extraordinary behavior. Feats of strength. And that's what happened when your brother attacked that killer. It was normal for him to protect himself, the first officer explained. He'll be fine. What you need is some rest. Can I see him? Trish asked. Yes, we'll send him in, said the other officer with hesitation. The four policemen left the room, closing the door, and shortly after, Tommy came rushing into the room, his head still shaved completely, his clothes torn and rumpled. Tommy, Trish said with relief, embracing him. It's over. It's over. Trish didn't see the look on Tommy's face as he stared blankly at the wall behind her. His eyes were glassed over, his face drained of color, his eyes empty and soulless. Tommy could feel a white-hot intensity bubbling up within him, a rage, a burning rage that threatened to consume him. The End Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Friday the 13th, Part 4, the final chapter of the fan novelization by Landon Turner. Gotta say, I really enjoyed this fan novelization. Landon, you did a great job. From beginning to end, I think this was very well written, just as good as Simon Hawk, if I'm being honest. There were a couple, like, inconsistencies with the 80s and technology and stuff, but you know what? It's a book. It's fiction. And uh, I think you did a great job with it. I really enjoyed getting a deeper dive into the characters, a deeper dive into Jason, having certain scenes expanded on from the book, uh, questions that we had watching the movie uh, getting answered. Um, so yeah, all in all, I really enjoyed this book. I loved the beginning, the middle, the end. Uh, I love the way you handled the conclusion. You threw in the deleted scene. You threw in lots of stuff, and you did a great job with that, and I hope everybody who listened to this book enjoyed it as well. I will be doing an episode of the Out of Print Slashers podcast in the future, uh, where, where me and Sean Campbell will be discussing this book in greater detail. I've also given little mini-reviews on each chapter as I've narrated them. You can listen to the playlist version of this book if you're listening to the unabridged version right now. Uh, to get those little tidbits where I where I discuss each chapter a little bit and what I thought of each chapter individually. But yeah, overall, I thought that Landon did an amazing job on this book. I really enjoy Friday the 13th Part 4. It's one of my favorites. Um, it's one of the best in the entire series, and it really did deserve a novelization, and I'm glad that Landon Turner took the time to write this for us to enjoy, and I hope everybody that's listened to it has enjoyed it just as much as I have. Um... Uh, if anybody listening wants to write novelizations for Friday the 13th, 5, 6, 7, 8, 
uh, a novelization for Jason Goes to Hell, go for it, and I will narrate it on this channel. Uh, I would love to see more fan novelizations written uh, for the movies uh, that did not get direct uh, official novelizations uh, commissioned back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but yeah, I want to know what everybody else thought of this book. So all of you Slashaholics that uh, gave this book a listen, please let me know in the comment section what you thought. Uh, be sure to thank Landon Turner for writing this for us. Uh, he did a very great job. Uh, I'll be back very soon with more audiobook narrations, podcasts, and Slash Tracks episodes here on 80 Slasher Librarian Presents. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you soon.